introduction of the birth of tragedy this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche introduction friedrich nietzsche was born at Urken near lutzen in the prussian province of saxony on the fifteenth of october eighteen forty four at ten a m the day happened to be the anniversary of the birth of frederick william the fourth then king of prussia and the peal of the local church bells which was intended to celebrate this event was by a happy coincidence just time to greet my brother on his entrance into the world in eighteen forty one at the time when our father was tutor to the altenburg princesses theresa of saxe altenburg elizabeth grand duchess of oldenburg and alexandra grand duchess constantine of russia he had had the honour of being presented to his witty and pious sovereign the meeting seems to have impressed both parties very favourably for very shortly after it had taken place our father received his living at rurken by supreme command his joy may well be imagined therefore when a first son was born to him on his beloved and august patron's birthday and at the christening ceremony he spoke as follows thou blessed month of october for many years the most decisive events in my life have occurred within thy thirty-one days and now i celebrate the greatest and most glorious of them all by baptizing my little boy o blissful moment o exquisite festival o unspeakably holy duty in the lord's name i bless thee with all my heart i utter these words bring me this my beloved child that i may consecrate it unto the lord my son frederick william thus shalt thou be named on earth as a memento of my royal benefactor on whose birthday thou wast born our father was thirty-one years of age and our mother not quite nineteen when my brother was born our mother who was the daughter of a clergyman was good-looking and healthy and was one of a very large family of sons and daughters our maternal grandparents the rev uller and his wife in Poblis, were typically healthy people strength robustness lively dispositions and a cheerful outlook on life were among the qualities which every one was pleased to observe in them our grandfather uller was a bright clever man and quite the old style of comfortable country parson who thought it no sin to go hunting he scarcely had a day's illness in his life and would certainly not have met with his end as early as he did that is to say before his seventieth year if his careless disregard of all caution where his health was concerned had not led to his catching a severe and fatal cold in regard to our grandmother Eler, who died in her eighty-second year all that can be said is that if all german women were possessed of the health she enjoyed the german nation would excel all others from the standpoint of vitality she bore our grandfather eleven children gave each of them the breast for nearly the whole of its first year and reared them all it is said that the sight of these eleven children at ages varying from nineteen years to one month with their powerful build rosy cheeks beaming eyes and wealth of curly locks provoked the admiration of all visitors of course despite their extraordinary good health the life of this family was not by any means all sunshine each of the children was very spirited wilful and obstinate and it was therefore no simple matter to keep them in order moreover though they always showed the utmost respect and most implicit obedience to their parents even as middle-aged men and women misunderstandings between themselves were of constant occurrence our uller grandparents were fairly well-to-do for our grandmother hailed from a very old family who had been extensive landowners in the neighbourhood of zeitz for centuries and her father owned the baronial estate of Veilitz and a magnificent seat near zeitz and pacht when she married her father gave her carriages and horses a coachman a cook and a kitchen-maid which for the wife of a german minister was then and is still something quite exceptional as a result of the wars in the beginning of the nineteenth century however our great-grandfather lost the greater part of his property our father's family was also in fairly comfortable circumstances and likewise very large our grandfather dr nietzsche d d doctor of divinity and superintendent married twice and had in all twelve children of whom three died young our grandfather on this side whom i never knew must certainly have been a distinguished dignified very learned and reserved man his second wife our beloved grandmother was an active-minded intelligent 
an exceptionally good-natured woman the whole of our father's family which i only got to know when they were very advanced in years were remarkable for their great power of self-control their lively interest in intellectual matters and a strong sense of family unity which manifested itself both in their splendid readiness to help one another and in their very excellent relations with each other our father was the youngest son and thanks to his uncommonly lovable disposition together with other gifts which only tended to become more marked as he grew older he was quite the favourite of the family blessed with a thoroughly sound constitution as all averred who knew him at the convent school at rosleben at the university or later at the ducal court of altenburg he was tall and slender possessed an undoubted gift for poetry and real musical talent and was moreover a man of delicate sensibilities full of consideration for his whole family and distinguished in his manners my brother often refers to his polish descent and in later years he even instituted research work with the view of establishing it which met with partial success i know nothing definite concerning these investigations because a large number of valuable documents were unfortunately destroyed after his breakdown in turin the family tradition was that a certain polish nobleman nicky pronounced Nietzsche, had obtained the special favour of augustus the strong king of poland and had received the rank of earl from him when however stanislaus Lazyski, the pole became king our supposed ancestor became involved in a conspiracy in favour of the saxons and protestants he was sentenced to death but taking flight according to the evidence of the documents he was ultimately befriended by a certain earl of brule who gave him a small post in an obscure little provincial town occasionally our aged aunts would speak of our great-grandfather nietzsche who was said to have died in his ninety-first year and words always seemed to fail them when they attempted to describe his handsome appearance good breeding and vigour our ancestors both on the nietzsche and the uller side were very long-lived of the four pairs of great-grandparents one great-grandfather reached the age of ninety five great-grandmothers and fathers died between eighty-two and eighty-six years of age and two only failed to reach their seventieth year the sorrow which hung as a cloud over our branch of the family was our father's death as the result of a heavy fall at the age of thirty-eight one night upon leaving some friends whom he had accompanied home he was met at the door of the vicarage by our little dog the little animal must have got between his feet for he stumbled and fell backwards down seven stone steps on the paving stones of the vicarage courtyard as a result of this fall he was laid up with concussion of the brain and after a lingering illness which lasted eleven months he died on the thirtieth of july eighteen forty nine the early death of our beloved and highly gifted father spread gloom over the whole of our childhood in eighteen fifty our mother withdrew with us to naumburg on the sala where she took up her abode with our widowed grandmother nietzsche and there she brought us up with spartan severity and simplicity which besides being typical of the period was quite de rigueur in her family of course grandmama nietzsche helped somewhat to temper her daughter-in-law's severity and in this respect our uller grandparents who were less rigorous with us their eldest grandchildren than with their own children were also very influential grandfather uller was the first who seemed to have recognized the extraordinary talents of his eldest grandchild from his earliest childhood upwards my brother was always strong and healthy he often declared that he must have been taken for a peasant boy throughout his childhood and youth as he was so plump brown and rosy the thick fair hair which fell picturesquely over his shoulders tended somewhat to modify his robust appearance had he not possessed those wonderfully beautiful large and expressive eyes however and had he not been so very ceremonious in his manner neither his teachers nor his relatives would ever have noticed anything at all remarkable about the boy for he was both modest and reserved he received his early schooling at a preparatory school and later at a grammar school in naumburg in the autumn of eighteen fifty eight when he was fourteen years of age he entered the fort a school so famous for the scholars it has produced there too very severe discipline prevailed and much was exacted from the pupils with the view of inuring them to great mental and physical exertions thus if my brother seems to lay particular stress upon the value of rigorous training free from all sentimentality it should be remembered that he speaks from experience in this respect at forda he followed the regular school course and he did not enter a university until the comparatively late age of twenty 
his extraordinary gifts manifested themselves chiefly in his independent and private studies and artistic efforts as a boy his musical talent had already been so noticeable that he himself and other competent judges were doubtful as to whether he ought not perhaps to devote himself altogether to music it is however worth noting that everything he did in his later years whether in latin greek or german work bore the stamp of perfection subject of course to the limitation imposed upon him by his years his talents came very suddenly to the fore because he had allowed them to grow for such a long time in concealment his very first performance in philology executed while he was a student under Ritzkel, the famous philologist was also typical of him in this respect seeing that it was ordered to be printed for the Rheiniska museum of course this was done amid general and grave expressions of doubt for as dr Ritzkel often declared it was an unheard of occurrence for a student in his third term to prepare such an excellent treatise being a great lover of outdoor exercise such as swimming skating and walking he developed into a very sturdy lad rhoda gives the following description of him as a student with his healthy complexion his outward and inner cleanliness his austere chastity in his solemn aspect he was the image of that delightful youth described by aldalbert stifter though as a child he was always rather serious as a lad and a man he was ever inclined to see the humorous side of things while his whole being and everything he said or did was permeated by an extraordinary harmony he belonged to the very few who could control even a bad mood and conceal it from others all his friends are unanimous in their praise of his exceptional evenness of temper and behaviour and his warm hearty and pleasant laugh that seemed to come from the very depths of his benevolent and affectionate nature in him it might therefore be said nature had produced a being who in body and spirit was a harmonious whole his unusual intellect was fully in keeping with his uncommon bodily strength the only abnormal thing about him and something which we both inherited from our father was short-sightedness and this was very much aggravated in my brother's case even in his earliest school days owing to that indescribable anxiety to learn which always characterized him when one listens to accounts given by his friends and schoolfellows one is startled by the multiplicity of his studies even in his school days in the autumn of eighteen sixty four he began his university life in bonn and studied philology and theology at the end of six months he gave up the theology and in the autumn of eighteen sixty five followed his famous teacher Ritzkel to the university of leipzig there he became an ardent philologist and diligently sought to acquire a masterly grasp of this branch of knowledge but in this respect it would be unfair to forget that the school of forte with its staff of excellent teachers scholars that would have adorned the chairs of any university had already afforded the best of preparatory trainings to any one intending to take up philology as a study more particularly as it gave all pupils ample scope to indulge any individual tastes they might have for any particular branch of ancient history the last important latin thesis which my brother wrote for the landis school forte dealt with the megarian poet theognis and it was in the role of a lecturer on this very subject that on the eighteenth january eighteen sixty six he made his first appearance in public before the philological society he had helped to found in leipzig the paper he read disclosed his investigations on the subject of theognis the moralist and aristocrat who as is well known described and dismissed the plebeians of his time in terms of the heartiest contempt the aristocratic ideal which was always so dear to my brother thus revealed itself for the first time moreover curiously enough it was precisely this scientific thesis which was the cause of Ritzkel's recognition of my brother and fondness for him the whole of his leipzig days proved of the utmost importance to my brother's career there he was plunged into the very midst of a torrent of intellectual influences which found an impressionable medium in the fiery youth and to which he eagerly made himself accessible he did not however forget to discriminate among them but tested and criticised the currents of thought he encountered and selected accordingly it is certainly of great importance to ascertain what those influences precisely were to which he yielded and how long they maintained their sway over him and it is likewise necessary to discover exactly when the matured mind threw off these fetters in order to work out its own salvation the influences that exercised power over him in those days may be described in the three following terms hellenism schopenhauer wagner his love of hellenism certainly led him to philology but as a matter of fact what concerned him most was to obtain a wide view of things in general 
and this he hoped to derive from that science philology in itself with his splendid method and thorough way of going to work served him only as a means to an end if hellenism was the first strong influence which already in florida obtained a sway over my brother in the winter of eighteen sixty five to sixty six a completely new and therefore somewhat subversive influence was introduced into his life with schopenhauer's philosophy when he reached leipzig in the autumn of eighteen sixty five he was very downcast for the experiences that had befallen him during his one year of student life in bonn had deeply depressed him he had sought at first to adapt himself to his surroundings there with the hope of ultimately elevating them to his lofty views on things but both these efforts proved vain and now he had come to leipzig with the purpose of framing his own manner of life it can easily be imagined how the first reading of schopenhauer's the world as will and idea worked upon this man still stinging from the bitterest experiences and disappointments he writes here i saw a mirror in which i espied the world life and my own nature depicted with frightful grandeur as my brother from his very earliest childhood had always missed both the parent and the educator through our father's untimely death he began to regard schopenhauer with almost filial love and respect he did not venerate him quite as other men did schopenhauer's personality was what attracted and enchanted him from the first he was never blind to the faults in his master's system and in proof of this we have only to refer to an essay he wrote in the autumn of eighteen sixty seven which actually contains a criticism of schopenhauer's philosophy now in the autumn of eighteen sixty five to these two influences hellenism and schopenhauer a third influence was added one which was to prove the strongest ever exercised over my brother and it began with his personal introduction to richard wagner he was introduced to wagner by the latter's sister frau professor brockhaus and his description of their first meeting contained in a letter to erwin rhoda is really most affecting for years that is to say from the time bulow's arrangement of tristan and isolde for the pianoforte had appeared he had already been a passionate admirer of wagner's music but now that the artist himself entered upon the scene of his life with the whole fascinating strength of his strong will my brother felt that he was in the presence of a being whom he of all modern men resembled most in regard to force of character again in the case of richard wagner my brother from the first laid the utmost stress upon the man's personality and could only regard his works and views as an expression of the artist's whole being despite the fact that he by no means understood every one of those works at that time my brother was the first who ever manifested such enthusiastic affection for schopenhauer and wagner and he was also the first of that numerous band of young followers who ultimately inscribed the two great names upon their banner whether schopenhauer and wagner ever really corresponded to the glorified pictures my brother painted of them both in his letters and other writings is a question which we can no longer answer in the affirmative perhaps what he saw in them was only what he himself wished to be some day the amount of work my brother succeeded in accomplishing during his student days really seems almost incredible when we examine his record for the years eighteen sixty five to sixty seven we can scarcely believe it refers to only two years industry for at a guess no one would hesitate to suggest four years at least but in those days as he himself declares he still possessed the constitution of a bear he knew neither what headaches nor indigestion meant and despite his short sight his eyes were able to endure the greatest strain without giving him the smallest trouble that is why regardless of seriously interrupting his studies he was so glad at the thought of becoming a soldier in the forthcoming autumn of eighteen sixty seven for he was particularly anxious to discover some means of employing his bodily strength he discharged his duties as a soldier with the utmost mental and physical freshness was the crack rider among the recruits of his year and was sincerely sorry when owing to an accident he was compelled to leave the colours before the completion of his service as a result of this accident he had his first dangerous illness while mounting his horse one day the beast which was an uncommonly restive one suddenly reared and causing him to strike his chest sharply against the pommel of the saddle threw him to the ground my brother then made a second attempt to mount and succeeded this time notwithstanding the fact that he had severely sprained and torn two muscles in his chest and had seriously bruised the adjacent ribs for a whole day he did his utmost to pay no heed to the injury and to overcome the pain it caused him but in the end he only swooned and a dangerously acute inflammation of the injured tissues was the result 
ultimately he was obliged to consult the famous specialist professor volkmann in halle who quickly put him right in october eighteen sixty eight my brother returned to his studies in leipzig with double joy these were his plans to get his doctor's degree as soon as possible to proceed to paris italy and greece make a lengthy stay in each place and then to return to leipzig in order to settle there as a private docent all these plans were however suddenly frustrated owing to his premature call to the university of bale where he was invited to assume the duties of professor some of the philological essays he had written in his student days and which were published by the Vyniska museum had attracted the attention of the educational board at bale rotscher wilhelm vischer as representing this body appealed to ritzkel for fuller information now ritzkel who had early recognized my brother's extraordinary talents must have written a letter of such enthusiastic praise nietzsche is a genius he can do whatever he chooses to put his mind to that one of the more cautious members of the council is said to have observed if the proposed candidate be really such a genius then it were better did we not appoint him for in any case he would only stay a short time at the little university of bale my brother ultimately accepted the appointment and in view of his published philological works he was immediately granted the doctor's degree by the university of leipzig he was twenty-four years and six months old when he took up his position as professor in bale and it was with a heavy heart that he proceeded there for he knew the golden period of untrammelled activity must cease he was however inspired by the deep wish of being able to transfer to his pupil some of that schopenhauerian earnestness which is stamped on the brow of the sublime man i should like to be something more than a mere trainer of capable philologists the present generation of teachers the care of the growing broods all this is in my mind if we must live let us at least do so in such wise that others may bless our life once we have been peacefully delivered from its toils when i look back upon that month of may eighteen sixty nine and ask both of friends and of myself what the figure of this youthful university professor of four-and-twenty meant to the world at that time the reply is naturally in the first place that he was one of ritzkel's best pupils secondly that he was an exceptionally capable exponent of classical antiquity with a brilliant career before him and thirdly that he was a passionate adorer of wagner and schopenhauer but no one has any idea of my brother's independent attitude to the science he had selected to his teachers and to his ideas and he deceived both himself and us when he passed as a disciple who really shared all the views of his respected master on the twenty eighth may eighteen sixty nine my brother delivered his inaugural address at bale university and it is said to have deeply impressed the authorities the subject of the address was homer and classical philology musing deeply the worthy counsellors and professors walked homeward what had they just heard a young scholar discussing the very justification of his own science in a cool and philosophically critical spirit a man able to impart so much artistic grammar to his subject that the once stale and arid study of philology suddenly struck them and they were certainly not impressionable men as the messenger of the gods and just as the muses descended upon the dull and tormented be ocean peasants so philology comes into a world full of gloomy colours and pictures full of the deepest most incurable woes and speaks to men comfortingly of the beautiful and brilliant godlike figure of a distant blue and happy fairyland we have indeed got hold of a rare bird herr ratscher said one of these gentlemen to his companion and the latter hardly agreed for my brother's appointment had been chiefly his doing even in leipzig it was reported that jakob burckhardt had said nietzsche is as much an artist as a scholar privy councillor ritzkel told me of this himself and then he added with a smile i always said so he can make his scientific discourses as palpitatingly interesting as a french novelist his novels homer and classical philology my brother's inaugural address at the university was by no means the first literary attempt he had made for we have already seen that he had had papers published by the Rhineska museum still this particular discourse is important seeing that it practically contains the programme of many other subsequent essays i must however emphasize this fact here that neither homer and classical philology nor the birth of tragedy represents a beginning in my brother's career it is really surprising to see how very soon he actually began grappling with the questions which were to prove the problems of his life if a beginning to his intellectual development be sought at all then it must be traced to the years eighteen sixty five to sixty seven in leipzig 
the birth of tragedy his maiden attempt at book writing with which he began his twenty-eighth year is the last link of a long chain of developments and the first fruit that was a long time coming to maturity nietzsche's was a polyphonic nature in which the most different and apparently most antagonistic talents had come together philosophy art and science in the form of philology then each certainly possessed a part of them the most wonderful feature perhaps it might even be called the real nietzschean feature of this versatile creature was the fact that no eternal strife resulted from the juxtaposition of these inimical traits that not one of them strove to dislodge or to get the upper hand of the others when nietzsche announced the musical career in order to devote himself to philology and gave himself up to the most strenuous study he did not find it essential completely to suppress his other tendencies as before he continued both to compose and derive pleasure from music and even studied counterpoint somewhat seriously moreover during his years at leipzig when he consciously gave himself up to philological research he began to engross himself in schopenhauer and was thereby won by philosophy for ever everything that could find room took up its abode in him and these juxtaposed factors far from interfering with one another's existence were rather mutually fertilizing and stimulating all those who have read the first volume of the biography with attention must have been struck with the perfect way in which the various impulses in his nature combined in the end to form one general torrent and how this flowed with ever greater force in the direction of a single goal thus science art and philosophy developed and became ever more closely related in him until in the birth of tragedy they brought forth a centaur that is to say a work which would have been an impossible achievement to a man with only a single special talent this polyphony of different talents all coming to utterance together and producing the richest and boldest of harmonies is the fundamental feature not only of nietzsche's early days but of his whole development it is once again the artist philosopher and man of science who as one man in later years after many wanderings recantations and revulsions of feelings produces that other and rarer centaur of highest rank zarathustra the birth of tragedy requires perhaps a little explaining more particularly as we have now ceased to use either schopenhauerian or wagnerian terms of expression and it was for this reason that five years after its appearance my brother wrote an introduction to it in which he very plainly expresses his doubts concerning the views it contains and the manner in which they are presented the kernel of its thought he always recognized as perfectly correct and all he deplored in later days was that he had spoiled the grand problem of hellenism as he understood it by adulterating it with ingredients taken from the world of most modern ideas as time went on he grew ever more and more anxious to define the deep meaning of this book with greater precision and clearness a very good elucidation of its aims which unfortunately was never published appears among his notes of the year eighteen eighty six and is as follows concerning the birth of tragedy a book consisting of mere experiences relating to pleasurable and unpleasurable aesthetic states with a metaphysico artistic background at the same time the confession of a romanticist the sufferer feels the deepest longing for beauty he begets it finally a product of youth full of youthful courage and melancholy fundamental psychological experiences the word apollonian stands for that state of rapt repose in the presence of a visionary world in the presence of the world of beautiful appearance designed as a deliverance from becoming the word dionysus on the other hand stands for strenuous becoming grown self-conscious in the form of the rampant voluptuousness of the creator who is also perfectly conscious of the violent anger of the destroyer the antagonism of these two attitudes and the desires that underlie them the first named would have the vision it conjures up eternal in its light man must be quiescent apathetic peaceful healed and on friendly terms with himself and all existence the second strives after creation after the voluptuousness of wilful creation that is constructing and destroying creation felt and explained as an instinct would be merely the unremitting inventive action of a dissatisfied being overflowing with wealth and living at high tension and high pressure of a god who would overcome the sorrows of existence by means only of continual changes and transformations appearance as a transient and momentary deliverance the world as an apparent sequence of godlike visions and deliverances this metaphysico artistic attitude is opposed to schopenhauer's one-sided view which values art not from the artist's standpoint but from the spectator's because it brings salvation and deliverance by means of the joy produced by unreal as opposed to the existing or the real 
the experience only of him who is suffering and is in despair owing to himself and everything existing deliverance in the form and its eternity just as plato may have pictured it save that he rejoiced in a complete subordination of all to excitable sensibilities even in the idea itself to this is opposed the second point of view art regarded as a phenomenon of the artist above all of the musician the torture of being obliged to create as a dionysian instinct tragic art rich in both attitudes represents the reconciliation of apollo and dionysus appearance is given the greatest importance by dionysus and yet it will be denied and cheerfully denied this is directed against schopenhauer's teaching of resignation as the tragic attitude towards the world against wagner's theory that music is a means and drama an end a desire for tragic myth for religion and even pessimistic religion as for a forcing frame in which certain plants flourish mistrust of science although its ephemerally soothing optimism be strongly felt the serenity of the theoretical man deep antagonism to christianity why the degeneration of the germanic spirit is ascribed to its influence any justification of the world can only be an aesthetic one profound suspicions about morality it is part and parcel of the world of appearance the happiness of existence is only possible as the happiness derived from appearance being is a fiction invented by those who suffer from becoming happiness in becoming is possible only in the annihilation of the real of the existing of the beautifully visionary in the pessimistic dissipation of illusions with the annihilation of the most beautiful phenomena in the world of appearance the dionysian happiness reaches its zenith the birth of tragedy is really only a portion of a much greater work on hellenism which my brother had always had in view from the time of his student days but even the portion it represents was originally designed upon a much larger scale than the present one the reason probably being that nietzsche desired only to be of service to wagner when a certain portion of the projected work on hellenism was ready and had received the title greek cheerfulness my brother happened to call upon wagner at tribschen in april eighteen seventy one and found him very low-spirited in regard to the mission of his life my brother was very anxious to take some decisive step to help him in laying the plans of his great work on greece aside he selected a small portion from the already completed manuscript a portion dealing with one distinct side of hellenism to wit its tragic art he then associated wagner's music with it and the name dionysus and thus took the first step towards that world historical view through which we have since grown accustomed to regard wagner from the dates of the various notes relating to it the birth of tragedy must have been written between the autumn of eighteen sixty nine and november eighteen seventy one a period during which a mass of aesthetic questions and answers was fermenting in nietzsche's mind it was first published in january eighteen seventy two by e w fritsch in leipzig under the title the birth of tragedy out of the spirit of music later on the title was changed to the birth of tragedy or hellenism and pessimism elizabeth Furster nietzsche weimar september nineteen o five end of introduction preface of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain preface an attempt at self-criticism one whatever may lie at the bottom of this doubtful book must be a question of the first rank and attractiveness moreover a deeply personal question in proof thereof observe the time in which it originated in spite of which it originated the exciting period of the franco-german war of eighteen seventy to seventy one while the thunder of the battle of worth rolled over europe the ruminator and riddle lover who had to be the parent of this book sat somewhere in a nook of the alps lost in riddles and ruminations consequently very much concerned and unconcerned at the same time and wrote down his meditations on the greeks the kernel of the curious and almost inaccessible book to which this belated prologue or epilogue is to be devoted a few weeks later and he found himself under the walls of metz still wrestling with the notes of interrogation 
he had set down concerning the alleged cheerfulness of the greeks and of greek art till at last in that month of deep suspense when peace was debated at versailles he too attained to peace with himself and slowly recovering from a disease brought home from the field made up his mind definitely regarding the birth of tragedy from the spirit of music from music music and tragedy greeks and tragic music greeks and the artwork of pessimism a race of men well fashioned beautiful envied life inspiring like no other race hitherto the greeks indeed the greeks were in need of tragedy yea of art wherefore greek art we can thus guess where the great note of interrogation concerning the value of existence had been set is pessimism necessarily the sign of decline of decay of failure of exhausted and weakened instincts as was the case with the indians as is to all appearance the case with us modern men and europeans is there a pessimism of strength an intellectual predilection for what is hard awful evil problematical in existence owing to well-being to exuberant health to fullness of existence is there perhaps suffering in overfulness itself a seductive fortitude with the keenest of glances which yearns for the terrible as for the enemy the worthy enemy with whom it may try its strength from whom it is willing to learn what fear is what means tragic myth to the greeks of the best strongest bravest era and the prodigious phenomenon of the dionysian and that which was born thereof tragedy and again that of which tragedy died the socratism of morality the dialectics contentedness and cheerfulness of the theoretical man indeed might not this very socratism be a sign of decline of weariness of disease of anarchically disintegrating instincts and the hellenic cheerfulness of the later hellenism merely a glowing sunset the epicurean will counter to pessimism merely a precaution of the sufferer and science itself our science i viewed as a symptom of life what really signifies all science whither were still whence all science well is scientism perhaps only fear and evasion of pessimism a subtle defence against truth morally speaking something like falsehood and cowardice and unmorally speaking an artifice o oh, socrates socrates was this perhaps thy secret o oh, mysterious ironist was this perhaps thine irony two what i then laid hands on something terrible and dangerous a problem with horns not necessarily a bull itself but at all events a new problem i should say to-day it was the problem of science itself science conceived for the first time as problematic as questionable but the book in which my youthful ardour and suspicion then discharged themselves what an impossible book must needs grow out of a task so disagreeable to youth constructed of naught but precocious unripened self-experiences all of which lay close to the threshold of the communicable based on the groundwork of art for the problem of science cannot be discerned on the groundwork of science a book perhaps for artists with collateral analytical and retrospective aptitudes that is an exceptional kind of artists 
for whom one must seek and does not even care to seek full of psychological innovations and artist's secrets with an artist's metaphysics in the background a work of youth full of youth's metal and youth's melancholy independent defiantly self-sufficient even when it seems to bow to some authority and self-veneration in short a firstling work even in every bad sense of the term in spite of its senile problem affected with every fault of youth above all with youth's prolixity and youth's storm and stress on the other hand in view of the success it had especially with the great artist to whom it addressed itself as it were in a dual log richard wagner a demonstrated book i mean a book which at any rate sufficed for the best of its time on this account if for no other reason it should be treated with some consideration and reserve yet i shall not altogether conceal how disagreeable it now appears to me how after sixteen years it stands a total stranger before me before an eye which is more mature and a hundred times more fastidious but which has by no means grown colder nor lost any of its interest in that self-same task essayed for the first time by this daring book to view science through the optics of the artist and art moreover through the optics of life three i say again to-day it is an impossible book to me i call it badly written heavy painful image angling and image entangling maudlin sugared at times even to feminism uneven in tempo void of the will to logical cleanliness very convinced and therefore rising above the necessity of demonstration distrustful even of the propriety of demonstration as being a book for initiates as music for those who are baptized with the name of music who are united from the beginning of things by common ties of rare experiences in art as a countersign for blood relations in artibus a haughty and fantastic book which from the very first withdraws even more from the profanum vulgus of the culture than from the people but which also as its effect has shown and still shows knows very well how to seek fellow enthusiasts and lure them to new byways and dancing grounds here at any rate thus much was acknowledged with curiosity as well as with aversion a strange voice spoke the disciple of a still unknown god who for the time being had hidden himself under the hood of the scholar under the german's gravity and disinclination for dialectics even under the bad manners of the wagnerian here was a spirit with strange and still nameless needs a memory bristling with questions experiences and obscurities beside which stood the name dionysus like one more note of interrogation here spoke people said to themselves with misgivings something like a mystic an almost menadic soul which undecided whether it should disclose or conceal itself stammers with an effort and capriciously as in a strange tongue it should have sung this new soul and not spoken what a pity that i did not dare to say what i then had to say as a poet i could have done so perhaps or at least as a philologist for even at the present day well nigh everything in this domain remains to be discovered and disinterred by the philologist above all the problem that here there is a problem before us and that so long as we have no answer to the question what is dionysian the greeks are now as ever wholly unknown and inconceivable for i what is dionysian in this book may be found an answer a knowing one speaks here the votary and disciple of his god perhaps i should now speak more guardedly and less eloquently of a psychological question so difficult as the origin of tragedy among the greeks 
a fundamental question is the relation of the greek to pain his degree of sensibility did this relation remain constant or did it veer about the question whether his ever-increasing longing for beauty for festivals gaieties new cults did really grow out of want privation melancholy pain for suppose even this to be true and pericles or thucydides intimates as much in the great funeral speech whence then the opposite longing which appeared first in the order of time the longing for the ugly the good resolute desire of the old hellene for pessimism for tragic myth for the picture of all that is terrible evil enigmatical destructive fatal at the basis of existence whence then must tragedy have sprung perhaps from joy from strength from exuberant health from overfulness and what then physiologically speaking is the meaning of that madness out of which comic as well as tragic art has grown the dionysian madness what perhaps madness is not necessarily the symptom of degeneration of decline of belated culture perhaps there are a question for alienists neuroses of health of folk youth and youthfulness what does that synthesis of god and goat in the satyr point to what self-experience what stress made the greek think of the dionysian reveller and primitive man as a satyr and as regards the origin of the tragic chorus perhaps there were endemic ecstasies in the eras when the greek body bloomed and the greek soul brimmed over with life visions and hallucinations which took hold of entire communities entire cult assemblies what if the greeks in the very wealth of their youth had the will to be tragic and were pessimists what if it was madness itself to use a word of plato's which brought the greatest blessings upon hellas and what if on the other hand and conversely at the very time of their dissolution and weakness the greeks became always more optimistic more superficial more histrionic also more ardent for logic and the logicizing of the world consequently at the same time more cheerful and more scientific ay despite all modern ideas and prejudices of the democratic taste may not the triumph of optimism the common sense that has gained the upper hand the practical and theoretical utilitarianism like democracy itself with which it is synchronous be symptomatic of declining vigour of approaching age of physiological weariness and not at all pessimism was epicurus an optimist because a sufferer we see it is a whole bundle of weighty questions which this book has taken upon itself let us not fail to add its weightiest question viewed through the optics of life what is the meaning of morality five already in the foreword to richard wagner art and not morality is set down as the properly metaphysical activities of man in the book itself the piquant proposition recurs time and again that the existence of the world is justified only as an aesthetic phenomenon indeed the entire book recognizes only an artist thought and artist afterthought behind all occurrences a god if you will but certainly only an altogether thoughtless and unmoral artist god who in construction as in destruction in good as in evil desires to become conscious of his own equable joy and sovereign glory who in creating worlds frees himself from the anguish of fullness and overfulness from the suffering of the contradictions concentrated within him the world that is the redemption of god attained at every moment as the perpetually changing perpetually new vision of the most suffering most antithetical most contradictory being who contrives to redeem himself only in appearance this entire 
artist metaphysics call it arbitrary idle fantastic if you will the point is that it already betrays a spirit which is determined some day at all hazards to make a stand against the moral interpretation and significance of life here perhaps for the first time a pessimism beyond good and evil announces itself here that perverseness of disposition obtains expression and formulation against which schopenhauer never grew tired of hurling beforehand his angriest implications and thunderbolts a philosophy which dares to put derogatorily put morality itself in the world of phenomena and not only among phenomena in the sense of the idealistic terminus technicus but among the illusions as appearance semblance error interpretation accommodation art perhaps the depth of this anti-moral tendency may be best estimated from the guarded and hostile silence with which christianity is treated throughout this book christianity as being the most extravagant burlesque of the moral theme to which mankind has hitherto been obliged to listen in fact to the purely aesthetic world interpretation and justification taught in this book there is no greater antithesis than the christian dogma which is only and will be only moral and which with its absolute standards for instance its truthfulness of god relegates that is disowns convicts condemns art all art to the realm of falsehood behind such a mode of thought and valuation which if at all genuine must be hostile to art i always experienced what was hostile to life the wrathful vindictive counter-will to life itself for all life rests on appearance art illusion optics necessity of perspective and error from the very first christianity was essentially and thoroughly the nausea and surfeit of life for life which only disguised concealed and decked itself out under the belief in another or better life the hatred of the world the curse on the affections the fear of beauty and sensuality another world invented for the purpose of slandering this world the more at bottom a longing for nothingness for the end for rest for the sabbath of sabbaths all this as also the unconditional will of christianity to recognize only moral values has always appeared to me as the most dangerous and ominous of all possible forms of a will to perish at the least as the symptom of a most fatal disease of profoundest weariness despondency exhaustion impoverishment of life for before the tribunal of morality especially christian that is unconditional morality life must constantly and inevitably be the loser because life is something essentially unmoral indeed oppressed with the weight of contempt and the everlasting no life must finally be regarded as unworthy of desire as in itself unworthy morality itself what may not morality be a will to disown life a secret instinct for annihilation a principle of decay of depreciation of slander a beginning of the end and consequently the danger of dangers it was against morality therefore that my instinct as an intercessory instinct for life turned in this questionable book inventing for itself a fundamental counter dogma and counter valuation of life purely artistic purely anti-christian what should i call it as a philologist a man of words i baptized it not without some liberty for who could be sure of the proper name of the antichrist with the name of a greek god i called it dionysian six you see which problem i ventured to touch upon in this early work how i now regret that i had not then the courage or immodesty to allow myself in all respects the use of an individual language for such individual contemplations and ventures in the field of thought that i laboured to express in kantian 
and schopenhauerian formulae strange and new valuations which ran fundamentally counter to the spirit of kant and schopenhauer as well as to their taste what forsooth were schopenhauer's views on tragedy what gives he says in welt aus villa und verstellung to four ninety five to all tragedy that singular swing towards elevation is the awakening of the knowledge that the world that life cannot satisfy us thoroughly and consequently is not worthy of our attachment in this consists the tragic spirit it therefore leads to resignation oh how differently dionysus spoke to me oh how far from me then was just this entire resignationism but there is something far worse in this book which i now regret even more than having obscured and spoiled dionysian anticipations with schopenhauerian formulae to wit that in general i spoiled the grand hellenic problem as it had opened up before me by the admixture of the most modern things that i entertained hopes where nothing was to be hoped for where everything pointed all too clearly to an approaching end that on the basis of our latter-day german music i began to fable about the spirit of teutonism as if it were on the point of discovering and returning to itself i at the very time that the german spirit which not so very long before had had the will to the lordship over europe the strength to lead and govern europe testamentarily and conclusively resigned and under the pompous pretence of empire founding effected its transition to mediocritization democracy and modern ideas in very fact i have since learned to regard the spirit of teutonism as something to be despaired of and unsparingly treated as also our present german music which is romanticism through and through and the most ungrecian of all possible forms of art and moreover a first-rate nerve destroyer doubly dangerous for a people given to drinking and revering the unclear as a virtue namely in its twofold capacity of an intoxicating and stupefying narcotic of course apart from all precipitate hopes and faulty applications to matters specially modern with which i then spoiled my first book the great dionysian note of interrogation as set down therein continues standing on and on even with reference to music how must we conceive of a music which is no longer of romantic origin like the german but of dionysian seven but my dear sir if your book is not romanticism what in the world is can the deep hatred of the present of reality and modern ideas be pushed farther than has been done in your artist metaphysics which would rather believe in nothing or in the devil than in the now does not a radical base of wrath and annihilateth pleasure growl on beneath all your contrapuntal vocal art an oral seduction a mad determination to oppose all that now is a will which is not so very far removed from practical nihilism and which seems to say rather let nothing be true than that you should be in the right than that your truth should prevail hear yourself my dear sir pessimist and art deifier with ever so unlocked ears a single select passage of your own book that not ineloquent dragon-slayer passage which may sound insidiously rat-charming to young ears and hearts what is not that the true blue romanticist confession of eighteen thirty under the mask of the pessimism of eighteen fifty after which of course the usual romanticist finale at once strikes up rupture collapse return and prostration before an old belief before the old god what is not your pessimist book itself a piece of anti-hellenism and romanticism something equally intoxicating and befogging and narcotic at all events i a piece of music of german music but listen let us imagine a rising generation with this undauntedness of vision 
with this heroic impulse towards the prodigious let us imagine the bold step of these dragon slayers the proud daring with which they turn their backs on all the effeminate doctrines of optimism in order to live resolutely in the whole and in the full would it not be necessary for the tragic man of this culture with his self-discipline to earnestness and terror to desire a new art the art of metaphysical comfort tragedy as the helena belonging to him and that he should exclaim with faust und solet ich nicht sensuchtigster gewalt ins leben sehen die existe gestalt would it not be necessary no thrice no ye young romanticists it would not be necessary but it is very probable that things may end thus that ye may end thus namely comforted as it is written in spite of all self-discipline to earnestness and terror metaphysically comforted in short as romanticists are wont to end as christians no ye should first of all learn the art of earthly comfort ye should learn to laugh my young friends if ye are at all determined to remain pessimists if so ye will perhaps as laughing ones eventually send all metaphysical comfortism to the devil and metaphysics first of all or to say it in the language of that dionysian ogre called zarathustra lift up your hearts my brethren high higher and do not forget your legs lift up also your legs ye good dancers and better still if ye stand also on your heads this crown of the laughter this rose garland crown i myself have put on this crown i myself have consecrated my laughter no one else have i found to-day strong enough for this zarathustra the dancer zarathustra the light one who beckoneth with his pinions one ready for flight beckoning unto all birds ready and prepared a blissfully light-spirited one zarathustra the soothsayer zarathustra the sooth laugher no impatient one no absolute one one who loveth leaps and side leaps i myself have put on this crown this crown of the laughter this rose garland crown to you my brethren do i cast this crown laughing have i consecrated ye higher men learn i pray you to laugh thus spake zarathustra seventy three seventeen eighteen and twenty sils maria oberengarden august eighteen eighty six and shall not i by mightiest desire in living shape that soul fair form acquire swanwick translation of faust end of preface chapter one of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one and forward to richard wagner in order to keep at a distance all the possible scruples excitements and misunderstandings to which the thoughts gathered in this essay will give occasion considering the peculiar character of our aesthetic publicity and to be able also to write the introductory remarks with the same contemplative delight the impress of which as the petrifaction of good and elevating hours it bears on every page i form a conception of the moment when you my highly honoured friend will receive this essay how you say after an evening walk in the winter snow will behold the unbound prometheus on the title page read my name and be forthwith convinced that whatever this essay may contain the author has something earnest and impressive to say and moreover that in all his meditations he communed with you as with one present and could thus write only what befitted your presence you will thus remember that it was at the same time as your magnificent dissertation on beethoven originated viz amidst the horrors and sublimities of the war which had just then broken out that i collected myself for these thoughts but those persons would err to whom this collection suggests no more perhaps than the antithesis of patriotic excitement and aesthetic revelry 
of gallant earnestness and sportive delight upon a real perusal of this essay such readers will rather to their surprise discover how earnest is the german problem we have to deal with which we properly place as a vortex and turning point in the very midst of german hopes perhaps however this same class of readers will be shocked at seeing an aesthetic problem taken so seriously especially if they can recognize in art no more than a merry diversion a readily dispensable court jester to the earnestness of existence as if no one were aware of the real meaning of this confrontation with the earnestness of existence these earnest ones may be informed that i am convinced that art is the highest task and the properly metaphysical activity of this life as it is understood by the man to whom as my sublime protagonist on this path i would now dedicate this essay basel end of the year eighteen seventy one the birth of tragedy one we shall have gained much for the science of aesthetics when once we have perceived not only by logical inference but by the immediate certainty of intuition that the continuous development of art is bound up with the duplexity of the apollonian and the dionysian in like manner as procreation is dependent on the duality of the sexes involving perpetual conflicts with only periodically intervening reconciliations these names we borrow from the greeks who disclose to the intelligent observer the profound mysteries of their view of art not indeed in concepts but in the impressively clear figures of their world of deities it is in connection with apollo and dionysus the two art deities of the greeks that we learn that there existed in the grecian world a wide antithesis in origin and aims between the art of the shaper the apollonian and the non-plastic art of music that of dionysus both these so heterogeneous tendencies run parallel to each other for the most part openly at variance and continually inciting each other to new and more powerful births to perpetuate in them the strife of this antithesis which is but seemingly bridged over by their mutual term art till at last by a metaphysical miracle of the hellenic will they appear paired with each other and through this pairing eventually generate the equally dionysian and apollonian artwork of attic tragedy in order to bring these two tendencies within closer range let us conceive them first of all as the separate art worlds of dreamland and drunkenness between which physiological phenomena a contrast may be observed analogous to that existing between the apollonian and the dionysian in dreams according to the conception of lucretius the glorious divine figures first appeared to the souls of men in dreams the great shaper beheld the charming corporeal structure of superhuman beings and the hellenic poet if consulted on the mysteries of poetic inspiration would likewise have suggested dreams and would have offered an explanation resembling that of hans Sachs in the meister singers mein frunde das grad ist dichter's werk das er sein traumen daut und merk glaub mir des menschen warster van wird him im trauma aufgathen all de kunst und poeterei ist nix aus war traum deterei the beauteous appearance of the dream worlds in the production of which every man is a perfect artist is the presupposition of all plastic art and in fact as we shall see of an important half of poetry also 
we take delight in the immediate apprehension of form all forms speak to us there is nothing indifferent nothing superfluous but together with the highest life of this dream reality we also have glimmering through it the sensation of its appearance such at least is my experience as to the frequency i normality of which i could adduce many proofs as also the sayings of the poets indeed the man of philosophic turn has a foreboding that underneath this reality in which we live and have our being another and altogether different reality lies concealed and that therefore it is also an appearance and schopenhauer actually designates the gift of occasionally regarding men and things as mere phantoms and dream pictures as the criterion of philosophical ability accordingly the man susceptible to art stands in the same relation to the reality of dreams as the philosopher to the reality of existence he is a close and willing observer for from these pictures he reads the meaning of life and by these processes he trains himself for life and it is perhaps not only the agreeable and friendly pictures that he realizes in himself with such perfect understanding the earnest the trouble the dreary the gloomy the sudden checks the tricks of fortune the uneasy presentiments in short the whole divine comedy of life and the inferno also pass before him not merely like pictures on the wall for he too lives and suffers in these scenes and yet not without that fleeting sensation of appearance and perhaps many a one will like myself recollect having sometimes called out cheeringly and not without success amid the dangers and terrors of dream life it is a dream i will dream on i have likewise been told of persons capable of continuing the causality of one and the same dream for three and even more successive nights all of which facts clearly testify that our innermost being the common substratum of all of us experiences our dreams with deep joy and cheerful acquiescence this cheerful acquiescence in the dream experience has likewise been embodied by the greeks in their apollo for apollo as the god of all shaping energies is also the soothsaying god he who as the etymology of the name indicates is the shining one the deity of light also rules over the fair appearance of the inner world of fantasies the higher truth the perfection of these states in contrast to the only partially intelligible everyday world i the deep consciousness of nature healing and helping in sleep and dream is at the same time the symbolical analogue of the faculty of soothsaying and in general of the arts through which life is made possible and worth living but also that delicate line which the dream picture must not overstep lest it act pathologically in which case appearance being reality pure and simple would impose upon us must not be wanting in the picture of apollo that measured limitation that freedom from the wilder emotions that philosophical calmness of the sculptor god his eye must be sun-like according to his origin even when it is angry and looks displeased the sacredness of his beauteous appearance is still there and so we might apply to apollo in an eccentric sense what schopenhauer says of the man wrapped in the veil of maya welt aus villa und verstellung one page four sixteen just as in a stormy sea unbounded in every direction rising and falling with howling mountainous waves a sailor sits in a boat and trusts in his frail bark so in the midst of a world of sorrows the individual sits quietly supported by and trusting in his principium individuationis indeed we might say of apollo that in him the unshaken faith in this principium and the quiet sitting of the man wrapped therein have received their sublimest expression and we might even designate apollo as the glorious divine image of the principium individuationis 
from out of the gestures and looks of which all the joy and wisdom of appearance together with its beauty speak to us in the same work schopenhauer has described to us the stupendous awe which seizes upon man when of a sudden he is at a loss to account for the cognitive forms of a phenomenon in that the principle of reason in some one of its manifestations seems to admit of an exception add to this awe the blissful ecstasy which rises from the innermost depths of man eye of nature at this same collapse of the principium in the wid du ationis and we shall gain an insight into the being of the dionysian which is brought within closest ken perhaps by the analogy of drunkenness it is either under the influence of the narcotic draught of which the hymns of all primitive men and peoples tell us or by the powerful approach of spring penetrating all nature with joy that those dionysian emotions awake in the augmentation of which the subjective vanishes to complete self-forgetfulness so also in the german middle ages singing and dancing crowds ever increasing in number were borne from place to place under this same dionysian power in these st john's and st vitus's dancers we again perceive the bacchi courses of the greeks with their previous history in asia minor as far back as babylon and the orgiastic Sasia there are some who from lack of experience or obtuseness will turn away from such phenomena as folk diseases with a smile of contempt or pity prompted by the consciousness of their own health of course the poor wretches do not divine what a cadaverous looking and ghastly aspect this very health of theirs presents when the glowing life of the dionysian revellers rushes past them under the charm of the dionysian not only is the covenant between man and man again established but also a strange hostile or subjugated nature again celebrates her reconciliation with her lost son man of her own accord earth proffers her gifts and peacefully the beasts of prey approach from the desert and the rocks the chariot of dionysus is bedecked with flowers and garlands panthers and tigers pass beneath his yoke change beethoven's jubilee song into a painting and if your imagination be equal to the occasion when the awestruck millions sink into the dust you will then be able to approach the dionysian now as the slave a free man now all the stubborn hostile barriers which necessity caprice or shameless fashion has set up between man and man are broken down now at the evangel of cosmic harmony each one feels himself not only united reconciled blended with his neighbour but as one with him as if the veil of maya has been torn and were now merely fluttering in tatters before the mysterious primordial unity in song and in dance man exhibits himself as a member of a higher community he has forgotten how to walk and speak and is on the point of taking a dancing flight into the air his gestures bespeak enchantment even as the animals now talk and as the earth yields milk and honey so also something supernatural sounds forth from him he feels himself a god he himself now walks about enchanted and elated even as the gods whom he saw walking about in his dreams man is no longer an artist he has become a work of art the artistic power of all nature here reveals itself in the tremors of drunkenness to the highest gratification of the primordial unity the noblest clay the costliest marble namely man is here kneaded and cut and the chisel strokes of the dionysian world artist are accompanied with the cry of the eleusinian mysteries er sturz nider melonen anest du den chauffeur belt my friend just this is poet's task his dreams to read and to unmask trust me illusions truths thrice sealed in dream to man will be revealed all verse craft and poetization is but sooth dream interpretation compare world and will as idea line four fifty five following translated by haldane and kemp to bow in the dust o millions thy maker mortal 
dust divine compare schiller's hymn to joy and beethoven ninth symphony end of chapter one chapter two of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two thus far we have considered the apollonian and his antithesis the dionysian as artistic powers which burst forth from nature herself without the mediation of the human artist and in which her art impulses are satisfied in the most immediate and direct way first as the pictorial world of dreams the perfection of which has no connection whatever with the intellectual height or artistic culture of the unit man and again as drunken reality which likewise does not heed the unit man but even seeks to destroy the individual and redeem him by a mystic feeling of oneness anent these immediate art states of nature every artist is either an imitator to wit either an apollonian an artist in dreams or a dionysian an artist in ecstasies or finally as for instance in greek tragedy an artist in both dreams and ecstasies so we may perhaps picture him as in his dionysian drunkenness and mystical self-abnegation lonesome and apart from the revelling choruses he sinks down and how now through apollonian dream inspiration his own state that is his oneness with the primal source of the universe reveals itself to him in a symbolical dream picture after these general premisings and contrastings let us now approach the greeks in order to learn in what degree and to what height these art impulses of nature were developed in them whereby we shall be enabled to understand and appreciate more deeply the relation of the greek artist to his archetypes or according to the aristotelian expression the imitation of nature in spite of all the dream literature and the numerous dream anecdotes of the greeks we can speak only conjecturally though with a fair degree of certainty of their dreams considering the incredibly precise and unerring plastic power of their eyes as also their manifest and sincere delight in colours we can hardly refrain to the shame of every one born later from assuming for their very dreams a logical causality of lines and contours colours and groups a sequence of scenes resembling their best reliefs the perfection of which would certainly justify us if a comparison were possible in designating the dreaming greeks as homers and homer as a dreaming greek in a deeper sense than when modern man in respect of his dreams ventures to compare himself with shakespeare on the other hand we should not have to speak conjecturally if asked to disclose the immense gap which separated the dionysian greek from the dionysian barbarian from all quarters of the ancient world to say nothing of the modern from rome as far as babylon we can prove the existence of dionysian festivals the type of which bears at best the same relation to the greek festivals as the bearded satyr who borrowed his name and attributes from the goat does to dionysus himself in nearly every instance the centre of these festivals lay in extravagant sexual licentiousness the waves of which overwhelmed all family life and its venerable traditions the very wildest beasts of nature were let loose here including that detestable mixture of lust and cruelty which has always seemed to me the genuine witch's draught for some time however it would seem that the greeks were perfectly secure and guarded against the feverish agitations of these festivals the knowledge of which entered greece by all the channels of land and sea by the figure of apollo himself rising here 
in full pride who could not have held out the gorgon's head to a more dangerous power than this grotesquely uncouth dionysian it is in doric art that this majestically rejecting attitude of apollo perpetuated itself this opposition became more precarious and even impossible when from out of the deepest root of the hellenic nature similar impulses finally broke forth and made way for themselves the delphic god by a seasonably effected reconciliation was now contented with taking the destructive arms from the hands of his powerful antagonist this reconciliation marks the most important moment in the history of the greek cult wherever we turn our eyes we may observe the revolutions resulting from this event it was the reconciliation of two antagonists with the sharp demarcation of the boundary lines to be thenceforth observed by each and with periodical transmission of testimonials in reality the chasm was not bridged over but if we observe how under the pressure of this conclusion of peace the dionysian power manifested itself we shall now recognize in the dionysian orgies of the greeks as compared with the babylonian Sasia, and their retrogression of man to the tiger and the ape the significance of festivals of world redemption and days of transfiguration not till then does nature attain her artistic jubilee not till then does the rupture of the principium individuationis become an artistic phenomenon that horrible witch's draught of sensuality and cruelty was here powerless only the curious blending and duality in the emotions of the dionysian revellers reminds one of it just as medicines remind one of deadly poisons that phenomenon to wit that pains beget joy that jubilation rings painful sounds out of the breast from the highest joy sounds the cry of horror or the yearning wail over an irretrievable loss in these greek festivals a sentimental trait as it were breaks forth from nature as if she must sigh over her dismemberment into individuals the song and pantomime of such duly minded revellers was something new and unheard of in the homeric grecian world and the dionysian music in particular excited awe and horror if music as it would seem was previously known as an apollonian art it was strictly speaking only as the wave beat of rhythm the formative power of which was developed to the representation of apollonian conditions the music of apollo was doric architectonics in tones but in merely suggested tones such as those of the cythera the very element which forms the essence of dionysian music and hence of music in general is carefully excluded as unapollonian namely the thrilling power of the tone the uniform stream of the mellows and the thoroughly incomparable world of harmony in the dionysian dithyram man is incited to the highest exaltation of all his symbolic faculties something never before experienced struggles for utterance the annihilation of the veil of maya oneness as genius of the rays eye of nature the essence of nature is now to be expressed symbolically a new world of symbols is required for once the entire symbolism of the body not only the symbolism of the lips face and speech but the whole pantomime of dancing which sets all the members into rhythmical motion thereupon the other symbolic powers those of music and rhythmics dynamics and harmony suddenly become impetuous to comprehend this collective discharge of all the symbolic powers a man must have already attained that height of self-abnegation which wills to express itself symbolically through these powers the dithyrambic votary of dionysus is therefore understood only by those like himself with what astonishment must the apollonian greek have beheld him with an astonishment which was all the greater the more it was mingled with the shuddering suspicion that all this was in reality not so very foreign to him yea that like unto a veil 
is apollonian consciousness only hid this dionysian world from his view end of chapter two chapter three of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three in order to comprehend this we must take down the artistic structure of the apollonian culture as it were stone by stone till we behold the foundations on which it rests here we observe first of all the glorious olympian figures of the gods standing on the gables of this structure whose deeds represented in far shining reliefs adorn its friezes though apollo stands among them as an individual deity side by side with others and without claim to priority of rank we must not suffer this fact to mislead us the same impulse which embodied itself in apollo has in general given birth to this whole olympian world and in this sense we may regard apollo as the father thereof what was the enormous need from which proceeded such an illustrious group of olympian beings whosoever with another religion in his heart approaches these olympians and seeks among them for moral elevation even for sanctity for incorporeal spiritualization for sympathetic looks of love will soon be obliged to turn his back on them discouraged and disappointed here nothing suggests asceticism spirituality or duty here only an exuberant even triumphant life speaks to us in which everything existing is deified whether good or bad and so the spectator will perhaps stand quite bewildered before this fantastic exuberance of life and ask himself what magic potion these madly merry men could have used for enjoying life so that wherever they turned their eyes helena the ideal image of their own existence floating in sweet sensuality smiled upon them but to this spectator already turning backwards we must call out depart not hence but hear rather what greek folk wisdom says of this same life which with such inexplicable cheerfulness spreads out before thee there is an ancient story that king midas hunted in the forest a long time for the wise selenus the companion of dionysus without capturing him when at last he fell into his hands the king asked what was best of all and most desirable for man fixed and immovable the demon remained silent till at last forced by the king he broke out with shrill laughter into these words o oh, wretched race of a day children of chance and misery why do ye compel me to say to you what it were most expedient for you not to hear what is best of all is for ever beyond your reach not to be born not to be to be nothing the second best for you however is soon to die how is the olympian world of deities related to this folk wisdom even as the rapturous vision of the tortured martyr to his sufferings now the olympian magic mountain opens as it were to our view and shows to us its roots the greek knew and felt the terrors and horrors of existence to be able to live at all he had to interpose the shining green birth of the olympian world between himself and them the excessive distrust of the titanic powers of nature the moira throning inexorably over all knowledge the vulture of the great philanthropist prometheus the terrible fate of the wise oedipus the family curse of the atridae which drove orestes to matricide in short that entire philosophy of the sylvan god with its mythical exemplars which wrought the ruin of the melancholy etruscans was again and again surmounted anew by the greeks through the artistic middle world 
of the olympians or at least veiled and withdrawn from sight to be able to live the greeks had from direst necessity to create these gods which process we may perhaps picture to ourselves in this manner that out of the original titan thearchy of terror the olympian thearchy of joy was evolved by slow transitions through the apollonian impulse to beauty even as roses break forth from thorny bushes how else could this so sensitive people so vehement in its desires so singularly qualified for sufferings have endured existence if it had not been exhibited to them in their gods surrounded with a higher glory the same impulse which calls art into being as the complement and consummation of existence seducing to a continuation of life caused also the olympian world to arise in which the hellenic will held up before itself a transfiguring mirror thus do the gods justify the life of man in that they themselves live it the only satisfactory theodicy existence under the bright sunshine of such gods is regarded as that which is desirable in itself and the real grief of the homeric men has reference to parting from it especially to early parting so that we might now say of them with a reversion of the silenian wisdom that to die early is worst of all for them the second worst is some day to die at all if once the lamentation is heard it will ring out again of the short-lived achilles of the leaf-like change and vicissitude of the human race of the decay of the heroic age it is not unworthy of the greatest hero to long for a continuation of life i even as a day labourer so vehemently does the will at the apollonian stage of development long for this existence so completely at one does the homeric man feel himself with it that the very lamentation becomes its song of praise here we must observe that this harmony which is so eagerly contemplated by modern man in fact this oneness of man with nature to express which schiller introduced the technical term naive is by no means such a simple naturally resulting and as it were inevitable condition which must be found at the gate of every culture leading to a paradise of man this could be believed only by an age which sought to picture to itself rousseau's emile also as an artist and imagined it had found in homer such an artist emile reared at nature's bosom wherever we meet with the naive in art it behooves us to recognize the highest effect of the apollonian culture which in the first place has always to overthrow some titanic empire and slay monsters and which through powerful dazzling representations and pleasurable illusions must have triumphed over a terrible depth of world contemplation and a most keen susceptibility to suffering but how seldom is the naive that complete absorption in the beauty of appearance attained and hence how inexpressibly sublime is homer who as unit being bears the same relation to this apollonian folk culture as the unit dream artist does to the dream faculty of the people and of nature in general the homeric naivete can be comprehended only as the complete triumph of the apollonian illusion it is the same kind of illusion as nature so frequently employs to compass her ends the true goal is veiled by a phantasm we stretch out our hands for the latter while nature attains the former through our illusion in the greeks the will desired to contemplate itself in the transfiguration of the genius and the world of art in order to glorify themselves its creatures had to feel themselves worthy of glory they had to behold themselves again in a higher sphere without this consummate world of contemplation acting as an imperative or reproach such is the sphere of beauty in which as in a mirror they saw their images the olympians with this mirroring of beauty the hellenic will combated its talent correlative to the artistic for suffering and for the wisdom of suffering and as a monument of its victory homer the naive artist stands before us End of chapter 3
chapter four of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four concerning this naive artist the analogy of dreams will enlighten us to some extent when we realize to ourselves the dreamer as in the midst of the illusion of the dream world and without disturbing it he calls out to himself it is a dream i will dream on when we must thence infer a deep inner joy in dream contemplation when on the other hand to be at all able to dream with this inner joy in contemplation we must have completely forgotten the day and its terrible obtrusiveness we may under the direction of the dream reading apollo interpret all these phenomena to ourselves somewhat as follows though it is certain that of the two halves of life the waking and the dreaming the former appeals to us as by far the more preferred important excellent and worthy of being lived indeed as that which alone is lived yet with reference to that mysterious ground of our being of which we are the phenomenon i should paradoxical as it may seem be inclined to maintain the very opposite estimate of the value of dream life for the more clearly i perceive in nature those all-powerful art impulses and in them a fervent longing for appearance for redemption through appearance the more i feel myself driven to the metaphysical assumption that the verily existent and primordial unity as the eternally suffering and self-contradictory requires the rapturous vision the joyful appearance for its continuous salvation which appearance we who are completely wrapped in it and composed of it must regard as the verily non-existent that is as a perpetual unfolding in time space and causality in other words as empiric reality if we therefore waive the consideration of our own reality for the present if we conceive our empiric existence and that of the world generally as a representation of the primordial unity generated every moment we shall then have to regard the dream as an appearance of appearance hence as a still higher gratification of the primordial desire for appearance it is for this same reason that the innermost heart of nature experiences that indescribable joy in the naive artist and in the naive work of art which is likewise only an appearance of appearance in a symbolic painting raphael himself one of these immortal naive ones has represented to us this depotentiating of appearance to appearance the primordial process of the naive artist and at the same time of apollonian culture in his transfiguration the lower half with the possessed boy the despairing bearers the helpless terrified disciples shows to us the reflection of eternal primordial pain the sole basis of the world the appearance here is the counter appearance of eternal contradiction the father of things out of this appearance then arises like an ambrosial vapour a vision like new world of appearances of which those wrapped in the first appearance see nothing a radiant floating in purest bliss and painless contemplation beaming from wide open eyes here there is presented to our view in the highest symbolism of art that apollonian world of beauty and its substratum the terrible wisdom of silenus and we comprehend by intuition their necessary interdependence apollo however again appears to us as the apotheosis of the principium individuationis in which alone the perpetually attained end of the primordial unity its redemption through appearance is consummated he shows us with sublime attitudes how the entire world of torment is necessary that thereby the individual may be impelled to realize the redeeming vision and then sunk in contemplation thereof 
quietly sit in his fluctuating bark in the midst of the sea this apotheosis of individuation if it be at all conceived as imperative and laying down precepts knows but one law the individual that is the observance of the boundaries of the individual measure in the hellenic sense apollo as ethical deity demands due proportion of his disciples and that this may be observed he demands self-knowledge and thus parallel to the aesthetic necessity for beauty there run the demands know thyself and not too much while presumption and undueness are regarded as the truly hostile demons of the non apollonian sphere hence as characteristics of the pre apollonian age that of the titans and of the extra apollonian world that of the barbarians because of his titan-like love for man prometheus had to be torn to pieces by vultures because of his excessive wisdom which solved the riddle of the sphinx oedipus had to plunge into a bewildering vortex of monstrous crimes thus did the delphic god interpret the grecian past so also the effects wrought by the dionysian appeared titanic and barbaric to the apollonian greek while at the same time he could not conceal from himself that he too was inwardly related to these overthrown titans and heroes indeed he had to recognize still more than this his entire existence with all its beauty and moderation rested on a hidden substratum of suffering and of knowledge which was again disclosed to him by the dionysian and lo apollo could not live without dionysus the titanic and the barbaric were in the end not less necessary than the apollonian and now let us imagine to ourselves how the ecstatic tone of the dionysian festival sounded in ever more luring and bewitching strains into this artificially confined world built on appearance and moderation how in these strains all the undueness of nature in joy sorrow and knowledge even to the transpiercing shriek became audible let us ask ourselves what meaning could be attached to the psalmodizing artist of apollo with the phantom harp sound as compared with this demonic folk song the muses of the arts of appearance pale before an art which in its intoxication spoke the truth the wisdom of silenus cried woe woe against the cheerful olympians the individual with all his boundaries and due proportions went under in the self-oblivion of the dionysian states and forgot the apollonian precepts the undueness revealed itself as truth contradiction the bliss born of pain declared itself but of the heart of nature and thus wherever the dionysian prevailed the apollonian was routed and annihilated but it is quite as certain that where the first assault was successfully withstood the authority and majesty of the delphic god exhibited itself as more rigid and menacing than ever for i can only explain to myself the doric state and doric art as a permanent war camp of the apollonian only by incessant opposition to the titanic barbaric nature of the dionysian was it possible for an art so defiantly prim so encompassed with bulwarks a training so warlike and rigorous a constitution so cruel and relentless to last for any length of time up to this point we have enlarged upon the observation made at the beginning of this essay how the dionysian and the apollonian in ever new births succeeding and mutually augmenting one another control the hellenic genius how from out the age of bronze with its titan struggles and rigorous folk philosophy the homeric world develops under the fostering sway of the apollonian impulse to beauty how this naive splendor is again overwhelmed by the inbursting flood of the dionysian and how against this new power the apollonian rises to the austere majesty of doric art and the doric view of things if then in this way in the strife of these two hostile principles 
the older hellenic history falls into four great periods of art we are now driven to inquire after the ulterior purpose of these unfoldings and processes unless perchance we should regard the last attained period the period of doric art as the end and aim of these artistic impulses and here the sublime and highly celebrated artwork of attic tragedy and dramatic dithyram presents itself to our view as the common goal of both these impulses whose mysterious union after many and long precursory struggles found its glorious consummation in such a child which is at once antigone and cassandra End of chapter four chapter five of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five we now approach the real purpose of our investigation which aims at acquiring a knowledge of the dioniso apollonian genius and his artwork or at least an anticipatory understanding of the mystery of the aforesaid union here we shall ask first of all where that new germ which subsequently developed into tragedy and dramatic dithyram first makes itself perceptible in the hellenic world the ancients themselves supply the answer in symbolic form when they place homer and archilochus as the forefathers and torch-bearers of greek poetry side by side on gems sculptures etc in the sure conviction that only these two thoroughly original compeers from whom a stream of fire flows over the whole of greek posterity should be taken into consideration homer the aged dreamer sunk in himself the type of the apollonian naive artist beholds now with astonishment the impassioned genius of the warlike votary of the muses archilochus violently tossed to and fro on the billows of existence and modern aesthetics could only add by way of interpretation that here the objective artist is confronted by the first subjective artist but this interpretation is of little service to us because we know the subjective artist only as the poor artist and in every type and elevation of art we demand specially and first of all the conquest of the subjective the redemption from the ego and the cessation of every individual will and desire indeed we find it impossible to believe in any truly artistic production however insignificant without objectivity without pure interestedless contemplation hence our aesthetics must first solve the problem as to how the lyrist is possible as an artist he who according to the experience of all ages continually says i and sings off to us the entire chromatic scale of his passions and desires this very archilochus appalls us alongside of homer by his cries of hatred and scorn by the drunken outbursts of his desire is not just he then who has been called the first subjective artist the non-artist proper but whence then the reverence which was shown to him the poet in very remarkable utterances by the delphic oracle itself the focus of objective art schiller has enlightened us concerning his poetic procedure by a psychological observation inexplicable to himself yet not apparently open to any objection he acknowledges that as the preparatory state to the act of poetizing he had not perhaps before him or within him a series of pictures with coordinate causalities of thoughts but rather a musical mood the perception with me is at first without a clear and definite object this forms itself later a certain musical mood of mind precedes and only after this 
does the poetical ideal follow with me add to this the most important phenomenon of all ancient lyric poetry the union regarded everywhere as natural of the lyrist with the musician their very identity indeed compared with which our modern lyric poetry is like the statue of a god without a head and we may now on the basis of our metaphysics of aesthetics set forth above interpret the lyrist to ourselves as follows as dionysian artist he is in the first place become altogether one with the primordial unity its pain and contradiction and he produces the copy of this primordial unity as music granting that music has been correctly termed a repetition and a recast of the world but now under the apollonian dream inspiration this music again becomes visible to him as in a symbolic dream picture the formless and intangible reflection of the primordial pain in music with its redemption in appearance then generates a second mirroring as a concrete symbol or example the artist has already surrendered his subjectivity in the dionysian process the picture which now shows to him his oneness with the heart of the world is a dream scene which embodies the primordial contradiction and primordial pain together with the primordial joy of appearance the eye of the lyrist sounds therefore from the abyss of being its subjectivity in the sense of the modern aesthetes is a fiction when archilochus the first lyrist of the greeks makes known both his mad love and his contempt to the daughters of lycambes it is not his passion which dances before us in orgiastic frenzy we see dionysus and the menads we see the drunken reveller archilochus sunk down to sleep as euripides depicts it in the bacchae the sleep on the high alpine pasture in the noonday sun and now apollo approaches and touches him with the laurel the dioniso musical enchantment of the sleeper now emits as it were picture sparks lyrical poems which in their highest development are called tragedies and dramatic dithyrams the plastic artist as also the epic poet who is related to him is sunk in the pure contemplation of pictures the dionysian musician is without any picture himself just primordial pain and the primordial re-echoing thereof the lyric genius is conscious of a world of pictures and symbols growing out of the state of mystical self-abnegation and oneness which has a colouring causality and velocity quite different from that of the world of the plastic artist and epic poet while the latter lives in these pictures and only in them with joyful satisfaction and never grows tired of contemplating them with love even in their minutest characters while even the picture of the angry achilles is to him but a picture the angry expression of which he enjoys with the dream joy in appearance so that by this mirror of appearance he is guarded against being unified and blending with his figures the pictures of the lyrist on the other hand are nothing but his very self and as it were only different projections of himself on account of which he as the moving centre of this world is entitled to say i only of course this self is not the same as that of the waking empirically real man but the only verily existent and eternal self resting at the basis of things by means of the images whereof the lyric genius sees through even to this basis of things now let us suppose that he beholds himself also among these images as non-genius that is his subject the whole throng of subjective passions and impulses of the will directed to a definite object which appears real to him if now it seems as if the lyric genius and the allied non-genius were one and as if the former spoke that little word i of his own accord this appearance will no longer be able to lead us astray as it certainly led those astray who designated the lyrist as the subjective poet in truth archilochus 
the passionately inflamed loving and hating man is but a vision of the genius who by this time is no longer archilochus but a genius of the world who expresses his primordial pain symbolically in the figure of the man archilochus while the subjectively willing and desiring man archilochus can never at any time be a poet it is by no means necessary however that the lyrist should see nothing but the phenomenon of the man archilochus before him as a reflection of eternal being and tragedy shows how far the visionary world of the lyrist may depart from this phenomenon to which of course it is most intimately related schopenhauer who did not shut his eyes to the difficulty presented by the lyrist in the philosophical contemplation of art thought he had found a way out of it on which however i cannot accompany him while he alone in his profound metaphysics of music held in his hands the means whereby this difficulty could be definitely removed as i believe i have removed it here in his spirit and to his honour in contrast to our view he describes the peculiar nature of song as follows welt aus villa und vorstellung one to ninety five it is the subject of the will that is his own volition which fills the consciousness of the singer often as an unbound and satisfied desire joy but still more often as a restricted desire grief always as an emotion a passion or an agitated frame of mind besides this however and along with it by the sight of surrounding nature the singer becomes conscious of himself as the subject of pure willless knowing the unbroken blissful peace of which now appears in contrast to the stress of desire which is always restricted and always needy the feeling of this contrast this alternation is really what the song as a whole expresses and what principally constitutes the lyrical state of mind in it pure knowing comes to us as it were to deliver us from desire and the stress thereof we follow but only for an instant for desire the remembrance of our personal ends tears us anew from peaceful contemplation yet ever again the next beautiful surrounding in which the pure willless knowledge presents itself to us allures us away from desire therefore in song and in the lyrical mood desire the personal interest of the ends and the pure perception of the surrounding which presents itself are wonderfully mingled with each other connections between them are sought for and imagined the subjective disposition the affection of the will imparts its own hue to the contemplated surrounding and conversely the surroundings communicate the reflex of their colour to the will the true song is the expression of the whole of this mingled and divided state of mind who could fail to see in this description that lyric poetry is here characterised as an imperfectly attained art which seldom and only as it were in leaps arrives at its goal indeed as a semi-art the essence of which is said to consist in this that desire and pure contemplation that is the unaesthetic and the aesthetic condition are wonderfully mingled with each other we maintain rather that this entire antithesis according to which as according to some standard of value schopenhauer too still classifies the arts the antithesis between the subjective and the objective is quite out of place in aesthetics inasmuch as the subject that is the desiring individual who furthers his own egoistic ends can be conceived only as the adversary not as the origin of art in so far as the subject is the artist however he has already been released from his individual will and has become as it were the medium through which the one verily existent subject celebrates his redemption in appearance for this one thing must above all be clear to us to our humiliation and exaltation that the entire comedy of art is not at all performed say for our betterment and culture and that we are just as little the true authors of this art world rather we may assume with regard to ourselves that its true author uses us as pictures and artistic projections and that we have our highest dignity and our significance as works of art for only as an aesthetic phenomenon is existence 
and the world eternally justified while of course our consciousness of this our specific significance hardly differs from the kind of consciousness which the soldiers painted on canvas half of the battle represented thereon hence all our knowledge of art is at bottom quite illusory because as knowing persons we are not one and identical with the being who as the sole author and spectator of this comedy of art prepares a perpetual entertainment for himself only in so far as the genius in the act of artistic production coalesces with this primordial artist of the world does he get a glimpse of the eternal essence of art for in this state he is in a marvellous manner like the weird picture of the fairy tale which can at will turn its eyes and behold itself he is now at once subject and object at once poet actor and spectator End of chapter five chapter six of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six with reference to archilochus it has been established by critical research that he introduced the folk song into literature and on account thereof deserved according to the general estimate of the greeks his unique position alongside of homer but what is this popular folk song in contrast to the holy apollonian epos what else but the perpetuum vestigium of a union of the apollonian and the dionysian its enormous diffusion among all peoples still further enhanced by ever new births testifies to the power of this artistic double impulse of nature which leaves its vestiges in the popular song in like manner as the orgiastic movements of a people perpetuate themselves in its music indeed one might also furnish historical proofs that every period which is highly productive in popular songs has been most violently stirred by dionysian currents which we must always regard as the substratum and prerequisite of the popular song first of all however we regard the popular song as the musical mirror of the world as the original melody which now seeks for itself a parallel dream phenomenon and expresses it in poetry melody is therefore primary and universal and as such may admit of several objectivations in several texts likewise in the naive estimation of the people it is regarded as by far the more important and necessary melody generates the poem out of itself by an ever-recurring process the strophic form of the popular song points to the same phenomenon which i always beheld with astonishment till at last i found this explanation any one who in accordance with this theory examines a collection of popular songs such as des nobben wunderhorn will find innumerable instances of the perpetually productive melody scattering picture sparks all around which in their very agation their abrupt change their mad precipitance manifest a power quite unknown to the epic appearance and its steady flow from the point of view of the epos this unequal and irregular pictorial world of lyric poetry must be simply condemned and the solemn epic rhapsodists of the apollonian festivals in the age of terpander have certainly done so accordingly we observe that in the poetizing of the popular song language is strained to its utmost to imitate music and hence a new world of poetry begins with archilochus which is fundamentally opposed to the homeric and in saying this we have pointed out the only possible relation between poetry and music between word and tone the word the picture the concept here seeks an expression analogous to music and now experiences in itself the power of music in this sense we may discriminate between two main currents in the history of the language of the greek people according as their language imitated either the world of phenomena and of pictures 
or the world of music one has only to reflect seriously on the linguistic difference with regard to colour syntactical structure and vocabulary in homer and pindar in order to comprehend the significance of this contrast indeed it becomes palpably clear to us that in the period between homer and pindar the orgiastic flute tones of olympus must have sounded forth which in an age as late as aristotle's when music was infinitely more developed transported people to drunken enthusiasm and which when their influence was first felt undoubtedly incited all the poetic means of expression of contemporaneous man to imitation i here call attention to a familiar phenomenon of our own times against which our aesthetics raises many objections we again and again have occasion to observe how a symphony of beethoven compels the individual hearers to use figurative speech though the appearance presented by a collocation of the different pictorial world generated by a piece of music may be never so fantastically diversified and even contradictory to practise its small wit on such compositions and to overlook a phenomenon which is certainly worth explaining is quite in keeping with this aesthetics indeed even if the tone poet has spoken in pictures concerning a composition when for instance he designates a certain symphony as the pastoral symphony or a passage therein as the scene by the brook or another as the merry gathering of rustics these are likewise only symbolical representations born out of music and not perhaps the imitated objects of music representations which can give us no information whatever concerning the dionysian content of music and which in fact have no distinctive value of their own alongside of other pictorial expressions this process of a discharge of music in pictures we have now to transfer to some youthful linguistically productive people to get a notion as to how the strophic popular song originates and how the entire faculty of speech is stimulated by this new principle of imitation of music if therefore we may regard lyric poetry as the effulguration of music in pictures and concepts we can now ask how does music appear in the mirror of symbolism and conception it appears as will taking the word in the schopenhauerian sense that is as the antithesis of the aesthetic purely contemplative and passive frame of mind here however we must discriminate as sharply as possible between the concept of essentiality and the concept of phenomenality for music according to its essence cannot be will because as such it would have to be wholly banished from the domain of art for the will is the unesthetic in itself yet it appears as will for in order to express the phenomenon of music in pictures the lyrist requires all the stirrings of passion from the whispering of infant desire to the roaring of madness under the impulse to speak of music and apollonian symbols he conceives of all nature and himself therein only as the eternally willing desiring longing existence but in so far as he interprets music by means of pictures he himself rests in the quiet calm of apollonian contemplation however much all around him which he beholds through the medium of music is in a state of confused and violent motion indeed when he beholds himself through this same medium his own image appears to him in a state of unsatisfied feeling his own willing longing moaning and rejoicing are to him symbols by which he interprets music such is the phenomenon of the lyrist as apollonian genius he interprets music through the image of the will while he himself completely released from the avidity of the will is the pure undimmed eye of day our whole disquisition insists on this that lyric poetry is dependent on the spirit of music just as music itself in its absolute sovereignty does not require the picture and the concept but only endures them as accompaniments the poems of the lyrist can express nothing which has not already been contained in the vast universality and absoluteness of the music which compelled him to use figurative speech by no means is it possible for language adequately to render the cosmic symbolism of music for the very reason that music stands in symbolic relation to the primordial contradiction and primordial pain in the heart of the primordial unity 
and therefore symbolizes a sphere which is above all appearance and before all phenomena rather should we say that all phenomena compared with it are but symbols hence language as the organ and symbol of phenomena cannot at all disclose the innermost essence of music language can only be in superficial contact with music when it attempts to imitate music while the profoundest significance of the latter cannot be brought one step nearer to us by all the eloquence of lyric poetry End of chapter six chapter seven of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven we shall now have to avail ourselves of all the principles of art hitherto considered in order to find our way through the labyrinth as we must designate the origin of greek tragedy i shall not be charged with absurdity in saying that the problem of this origin has as yet not even been seriously stated not to say solved however often the fluttering tatters of ancient tradition have been sewed together in sundry combinations and torn asunder again this tradition tells us in the most unequivocal terms that tragedy sprang from the tragic chorus and was originally only chorus and nothing but chorus and hence we feel it our duty to look into the heart of this tragic chorus as being the real proto-drama without in the least contenting ourselves with current art phraseology according to which the chorus is the ideal spectator or represents the people in contrast to the regal side of the scene the latter explanatory notion which sounds sublime to many a politician that the immutable moral law was embodied by the democratic athenians in the popular chorus which always carries its point over the passionate excesses and extravagances of kings may be ever so forcibly suggested by an observation of aristotle still it has no bearing on the original formation of tragedy inasmuch as the entire antithesis of king and people and in general the whole politico-social sphere is excluded from the purely religious beginnings of tragedy but considering the well-known classical form of the chorus in aeschylus and sophocles we should even deem it blasphemy to speak here of the anticipation of a constitutional representation of the people from which blasphemy others have not shrunk however the ancient governments knew of no constitutional representation of the people in proxy and it is to be hoped that they did not even so much as anticipate it in tragedy much more celebrated than this political explanation of the course is the notion of a w schlegel who advises us to regard the course in a manner as the essence and extract of the crowd of spectators as the ideal spectator this view when compared with the historical tradition that tragedy was originally only coarse reveals itself in its true character as a crude unscientific yet brilliant assertion which however has acquired its brilliancy only through its concentrated form of expression through the truly germanic bias in favour of whatever is called ideal and through our momentary astonishment for we are indeed astonished the moment we compare our well-known theatrical public with this chorus and ask ourselves if it could ever be possible to idealize something analogous to the greek chorus out of such a public we tacitly deny this and now wonder as much at the boldness of schlegel's assertion as at the totally different nature of the greek public for hitherto we always believed that the true spectator be he who he may had always to remain conscious of having before him a work of art and not an empiric reality whereas the tragic chorus of the greeks is compelled to recognize real beings in the figures of the stage the chorus of the oceanides really believes that it sees before it the titan prometheus and considers itself as real as the god of the scene and are we to own that he is the highest and purest type of a spectator who like the oceanides regards prometheus as real and present in body and is it characteristic of the ideal spectator that he should run on the stage and free the god from his torments we had believed in an aesthetic public and considered the individual spectator the better qualified the more he was capable of viewing a work of art as art that is aesthetically but now the schlegelian expression has intimated to us that the perfect ideal spectator does not at all suffer the world of the scenes to act aesthetically on him but corporeo empirically 
oh these greeks we have sighed they will upset our aesthetics but once accustomed to it we have reiterated the saying of schlegel as often as the subject of the chorus has been broached but the tradition which is so explicit here speaks against schlegel the chorus as such without the stage the primitive form of tragedy and the chorus of ideal spectators do not harmonize what kind of art would that be which was extracted from the concept of the spectator and whereof we are to regard the spectator as such as the true form the spectator without the play is something absurd we fear that the birth of tragedy can be explained neither by the high esteem for the moral intelligence of the multitude nor by the concept of the spectator without the play and we regard the problem as too deep to be even so much as touched by such superficial modes of contemplation an infinitely more valuable insight into the signification of the chorus had already been displayed by schiller in the celebrated preface to his bride of messina where he regarded the chorus as a living wall which tragedy draws round herself to guard her from contact with the world of reality and to preserve her ideal domain and poetical freedom it is with this his chief weapon that schiller combats the ordinary conception of the natural the illusion ordinarily required in dramatic poetry he contends that while indeed the day on the stage is merely artificial the architecture only symbolical and the metrical dialogue purely ideal in character nevertheless an erroneous view still prevails in the main that it is not enough to tolerate merely as a poetical license that which is in reality the essence of all poetry the introduction of the course is he says the decisive step by which war is declared openly and honestly against all naturalism in art it is methinks for disparaging this mode of contemplation that our would-be superior age has coined the disdainful catchword pseudo-idealism i fear however that we on the other hand with our present worship of the natural and the real have landed at the nadir of all idealism namely in the region of cabinets of wax figures an art indeed exists also here as in certain novels much in vogue at present but let no one pester us with the claim that by this art the schiller gertian pseudo idealism has been vanquished it is indeed an ideal domain as schiller rightly perceived upon which the greek satiric chorus the chorus of primitive tragedy was wont to walk a domain raised far above the actual path of mortals the greek framed for this chorus the suspended scaffolding of a fictitious natural state and placed thereon fictitious natural beings it is on this foundation that tragedy grew up and so it could of course dispense from the very first with a painful portrayal of reality yet it is not an arbitrary world placed by fancy betwixt heaven and earth rather is it a world possessing the same reality and trustworthiness that olympus with its dwellers possess for the believing helene the satyr as being the dionysian chorus lives in a religiously acknowledged reality under the sanction of the myth and cult that tragedy begins with him that the dionysian wisdom of tragedy speaks through him is just as surprising a phenomenon to us as in general the derivation of tragedy from the chorus perhaps we shall get a starting point for our inquiry if i put forward the proposition that the satyr the fictitious natural being is to the man of culture what dionysian music is to civilization concerning this latter ricard wagner says that it is neutralized by music even as lamplight by daylight in like manner i believe the greek man of culture felt himself neutralized in the presence of the satiric chorus and this is the most immediate effect of the dionysian tragedy but the state and society and in general the gaps between man and man give way to an overwhelming feeling of oneness which leads back to the heart of nature the metaphysical comfort with which as i have here intimated every true tragedy dismisses us that in spite of the perpetual change of phenomena life at bottom is indestructibly powerful and pleasurable this comfort appears with corporeal lucidity as the satiric chorus as the chorus of natural beings who live in ineradicable as it were behind all civilization and who in spite of the ceaseless change of generations and the history of nations remain for ever the same with this chorus the deep-minded helene who is so singularly qualified for the most delicate and severe suffering consoles himself he who has glanced with piercing eye into the very heart of the terrible destructive processes of so-called universal history as also into the cruelty of nature and is in danger of longing for a buddhistic negation of the will art saves him and through art life saves him for herself for we must know that in the rapture of the dionysian state with its annihilation of the ordinary bounds and limits of existence there is a lethargic element wherein all personal experiences of the past are submerged 
it is by this gulf of oblivion that the everyday world and the world of dionysian reality are separated from each other but as soon as this everyday reality rises again in consciousness it is felt as such and nauseates us an ascetic will a paralyzing mood is the fruit of these states in this sense the dionysian man may be said to resemble hamlet both have for once seen into the true nature of things they have perceived but they are loath to act for their action cannot change the eternal nature of things they regard it as shameful or ridiculous that one should require of them to set aright the time which is out of joint knowledge kills action action requires the veil of illusion it is this lesson which hamlet teaches and not the cheap wisdom of john o dreams who from too much reflection as it were from a surplus of possibilities does not arrive at action at all not reflection no true knowledge insight into appalling truth preponderates over all motives inciting to action in hamlet as well as in the dionysian man no comfort avails any longer his longing goes beyond a world after death beyond the gods themselves existence with its glittering reflection in the gods or in an immortal other world is abjured in the consciousness of the truth he has perceived man now sees everywhere only the awfulness or the absurdity of existence he now understands the symbolism in the fate of ophelia he now discerns the wisdom of the sylvan god silenus and loathing seizes him here in this extremest danger of the will art approaches as a saving and healing enchantress she alone is able to transform these nauseating reflections on the awfulness or absurdity of existence into representations wherewith it is possible to live these are the representations of the sublime as the artistic subjugation of the awful and the comic as the artistic delivery from the nausea of the absurd the satiric chorus of dithyram is the saving deed of greek art the paroxysms described above spent their force in the intermediary world of these dionysian followers End of chapter seven chapter eight of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight the satyr like the idyllic shepherd of our more recent time is the offspring of a longing after the primitive and the natural but mark with what firmness and fearlessness the greek embraced the man of the woods and again how coyly and mawkishly the modern man dallied with the flattering picture of a tender flute-playing soft-natured shepherd nature on which as yet no knowledge has been at work which maintains unbroken barriers to culture this is what the greek saw in his satyr which still was not on this account supposed to coincide with the ape on the contrary it was the archetype of man the embodiment of his highest and strongest emotions as the enthusiastic reveller enraptured by the proximity of his god as the fellow-suffering companion in whom the suffering of the god repeats itself as the herald of wisdom speaking from the very depths of nature as the emblem of the sexual omnipotence of nature which the greek was wont to contemplate with reverential awe the satyr was something sublime and godlike he could not but appear so especially to the sad and wearied eye of the dionysian man he would have been offended by our spurious tricked-up shepherd while his eye dwelt with sublime satisfaction on the naked and unstuntedly magnificent characters of nature here the illusion of culture was brushed away from the archetype of man here the true man the bearded satyr revealed himself who shouts joyfully to his god before him the cultured man shrank to a lying caricature schiller is right also with reference to these beginnings of tragic art the chorus is a living bulwark against the onsets of reality because it the satiric chorus portrays existence more truthfully more realistically more perfectly than the cultured man who ordinarily considers himself as the only reality the sphere of poetry does not lie outside the world 
like some fantastic impossibility of a poet's imagination it seeks to be the very opposite the unvarnished expression of truth and must for this very reason cast aside the false finery of that supposed reality of the cultured man the contrast between this intrinsic truth of nature and the falsehood of culture which poses as the only reality is similar to that existing between the eternal kernel of things the thing in itself and the collective world of phenomena and even as tragedy with its metaphysical comfort points to the eternal life of this kernel of existence notwithstanding the perpetual dissolution of phenomena so the symbolism of the satiric chorus already expresses figuratively this primordial relation between the thing in itself and phenomenon the idyllic shepherd of the modern man is but a copy of the sum of the illusions of culture which he calls nature the dionysian greek desires truth and nature in their most potent form he sees himself metamorphosed into the satyr the revelling crowd of the votaries of dionysus rejoices swayed by such moods and perceptions the power of which transforms them before their own eyes so that they imagine they behold themselves as reconstituted genii of nature as satyrs the later constitution of the tragic course is the artistic imitation of this natural phenomenon which of course required a separation of the dionysian spectators from the enchanted dionysians however we must never lose sight of the fact that the public of the attic tragedy rediscovered itself in the chorus of the orchestra that there was in reality no antithesis of public and chorus for all was but one great sublime chorus of dancing and singing satyrs or of such as allowed themselves to be represented by the satyrs the schlegelian observation must here reveal itself to us in a deeper sense the chorus is the ideal spectator in so far as it is the only beholder the beholder of the visionary world of the scene a public of spectators as known to us was unknown to the greeks and their theatres the terraced structure of the spectator's space rising in concentric arcs enabled every one in the strictest sense to overlook the entire world of culture around him and in surfeited contemplation to imagine himself a chorus according to this view then we may call the chorus in its primitive stage in proto-tragedy a self-mirroring of the dionysian man a phenomenon which may be best exemplified by the process of the actor who if he be truly gifted sees hovering before his eyes with almost tangible perceptibility the character he is to represent the satiric course is first of all a vision of the dionysian throng just as the world of the stage is in turn a vision of the satiric chorus the power of this vision is great enough to render the eye dull and insensible to the impression of reality to the presence of the cultured men occupying the tiers of seats on every side the form of the greek theatre reminds one of a lonesome mountain valley the architecture of the scene appears like a luminous cloud picture which the bacchants swarming on the mountains behold from the heights as the splendid encirclement in the midst of which the image of dionysus is revealed to them owing to our learned conception of the elementary artistic processes this artistic proto-phenomenon which is here introduced to explain the tragic chorus is almost shocking while nothing can be more certain than that the poet is a poet only in that he beholds himself surrounded by forms which live and act before him into the innermost being of which his glance penetrates 
by reason of a strange defeat in our capacities we modern men are apt to represent to ourselves the aesthetic proto-phenomenon as too complex and abstract for the true poet the metaphor is not a rhetorical figure but a vicarious image which actually hovers before him in place of a concept the character is not for him an aggregate composed of a studied collection of particular traits but an irrepressibly live person appearing before his eyes and differing only from the corresponding vision of the painter by its ever-continued life and action why is it that homer sketches much more vividly than all the other poets because he contemplates much more we talk so abstractly about poetry because we are all want to be bad poets at bottom the aesthetic phenomenon is simple let a man but have the faculty of perpetually seeing a lively play and of constantly living surrounded by hosts of spirits then he is a poet let him but feel the impulse to transform himself and to talk from out the bodies and souls of others then he is a dramatist the dionysian excitement is able to impart to a whole mass of men this artistic faculty of seeing themselves surrounded by such a host of spirits with whom they know themselves to be inwardly one this function of the tragic chorus is the dramatic proto-phenomenon to see one's self transformed before one's self and then to act as if one had really entered into another body into another character this function stands at the beginning of the development of the drama here we have something different from the rhapsodist who does not blend with his pictures but only sees them like the painter with contemplative eye outside of him here we actually have a surrender of the individual by his entering into another nature moreover this phenomenon appears in the form of an epidemic a whole throng feels itself metamorphosed in this wise hence it is that the dithyram is essentially different from every other variety of the choric song the virgins who with laurel twigs in their hands solemnly proceed to the temple of apollo and sing a processional hymn remain what they are and retain their civic names the dithyrambic chorus is a chorus of transformed beings whose civic past and social rank are totally forgotten they have become the timeless servants of their god that live aloof from all the spheres of society every other variety of the choric lyric of the hellenes is but an enormous enhancement of the apollonian unit singer while in the dithyram we have before us a community of unconscious actors who mutually regard themselves as transformed among one another this enchantment is the prerequisite of all dramatic art in this enchantment the dionysian reveller sees himself as a satyr and as satyr he in turn beholds the god that is in his transformation he sees a new vision outside him as the apollonian consummation of his state with this new vision the drama is complete according to this view we must understand greek tragedy as the dionysian chorus which always disburdens itself anew in an apollonian world of pictures the choric parts therefore with which tragedy is interlaced are in a manner the mother womb of the entire so-called dialogue that is of the whole stage world of the drama proper in several successive outbursts does this primordial basis of tragedy beam forth the vision of the drama which is a dream phenomenon throughout and as such epic in character on the other hand however as objectivation of a dionysian state it does not represent the apollonian redemption in appearance but conversely the dissolution of the individual and his unification with primordial existence accordingly the drama is the apollonian embodiment of dionysian perceptions and influences and is thereby separated 
from the epic as by an immense gap the chorus of greek tragedy the symbol of the mass of the people moved by dionysian excitement is thus fully explained by our conception of it as here set forth whereas being accustomed to the position of a chorus on the modern stage especially an operatic chorus we could never comprehend why the tragic chorus of the greeks should be older more primitive indeed more important than the action proper as has been so plainly declared by the voice of tradition whereas furthermore we could not reconcile with this traditional paramount importance and primitiveness the fact of the chorus being composed only of humble ministering beings indeed at first only of goat-like satyrs whereas finally the orchestra before the scene was always a riddle to us we have learned to comprehend at length that the scene together with the action was fundamentally and originally conceived only as a vision that the only reality is just the chorus which of itself generates the vision and speaks thereof with the entire symbolism of dancing tone and word this chorus beholds in the vision its lord and master dionysus and is thus for ever the serving chorus it sees how he the god suffers and glorifies himself and therefore does not itself act but though its attitude towards the god is throughout the attitude of ministration this is nevertheless the highest expression the dionysian expression of nature and therefore like nature herself the chorus utters oracles and wise sayings when transported with enthusiasm as fellow-sufferer it is also the sage proclaiming truth from out the heart of nature thus then originates the fantastic figure which seems so shocking of the wise and enthusiastic satyr who is at the same time the dumb man in contrast to the god the image of nature and her strongest impulses yea the symbol of nature and at the same time the herald of her art and wisdom musician poet dancer and visionary in one person agreeably to this view and agreeably to tradition dionysus the proper stage hero and focus of vision is not at first actually present in the oldest period of tragedy but is only imagined as present that is tragedy is originally only chorus and not drama later on the attempt is made to exhibit the god as real and to display the visionary figure together with its glorifying encirclement before the eyes of all it is here that the drama in the narrow sense of the term begins to the dithyrambic chorus is now assigned the task of exciting the minds of the hearers to such a pitch of dionysian frenzy that when the tragic hero appears on the stage they do not behold in him say the unshapely masked man but a visionary figure born as it were of their own ecstasy let us picture admetes thinking in profound meditation of his lately departed wife alcestis and quite consuming himself in spiritual contemplation thereof when suddenly the veiled figure of a woman resembling her in form and gait is led towards him let us picture his sudden trembling anxiety his agitated comparisons his instinctive conviction and we shall have an analogon to the sensation with which the spectator excited to dionysian frenzy saw the god approaching on the stage a god with whose sufferings he had already become identified he involuntarily transferred the entire picture of the god fluttering magically before his soul to this masked figure and resolved its reality as it were into a phantasmal unreality this is the apollonian dream state in which the world of day is veiled and a new world clearer more intelligible more striking than the former and nevertheless more shadowy is ever born anew in perpetual change before our eyes we accordingly recognize in tragedy a thorough-going stylistic contrast the language colour flexibility and dynamics of the dialogue fall apart in the dionysian lyrics of the chorus on the one hand and in the apollonian dream-world of the scene 
on the other into entirely separate spheres of expression the apollonian appearances in which dionysus objectifies himself are no longer ein ewiges mir ein wegschelnd weben ein gluhend leben as is the music of the chorus they are no longer the forces merely felt but not condensed into a picture by which the inspired votary of dionysus divines the proximity of his god the clearness and firmness of epic form now speak to him from the scene dionysus now no longer speaks through forces but as an epic hero almost in the language of homer End of chapter eight chapter nine of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine whatever rises to the surface in the dialogue of the apollonian part of greek tragedy appears simple transparent beautiful in this sense the dialogue is a copy of the hellene whose nature reveals itself in the dance because in the dance the greatest energy is merely potential but betrays itself nevertheless in flexible and vivacious movements the language of the sophoclean heroes for instance surprises us by its apollonian precision and clearness so that we at once imagine we see into the innermost recesses of their being and marvel not a little that the way to these recesses is so short but if for the moment we disregard the character of the hero which rises to the surface and grows visible and which at bottom is nothing but the light picture cast on a dark wall that is appearance through and through if rather we enter into the myth which projects itself in these bright mirrorings we shall of a sudden experience a phenomenon which bears a reverse relation to one familiar in optics when after a vigorous effort to gaze into the sun we turn away blinded we have dark-coloured spots before our eyes as restoratives so to speak while on the contrary those light picture phenomena of the sophoclean hero in short the apollonian of the mask are the necessary productions of a glance into the secret and terrible things of nature as it were shining spots to heal the eye which dire night has seared only in this sense can we hope to be able to grasp the true meaning of the serious and significant notion of greek cheerfulness while of course we encounter the misunderstood notion of this cheerfulness as resulting from a state of unendangered comfort on all the ways and paths of the present time the most sorrowful figure of the greek stage the hapless oedipus was understood by sophocles as the noble man who in spite of his wisdom was destined to error and misery but nevertheless through his extraordinary sufferings ultimately exerted a magical wholesome influence on all around him which continues effective even after his death the noble man does not sin this is what the thoughtful poet wishes to tell us all laws all natural order yea the moral world itself may be destroyed through his action but through this very action a higher magic circle of influences is brought into play which establish a new world on the ruins of the old that has been overthrown this is what the poet in so far as he is at the same time a religious thinker wishes to tell us as poet he shows us first of all a wonderfully complicated legal mystery which the judge slowly unravels link by link to his own destruction 
the truly hellenic delight at this dialectical loosening is so great that a touch of surpassing cheerfulness is thereby communicated to the entire play which everywhere blunts the edge of the horrible presuppositions of the procedure in the oedipus at colonus we find the same cheerfulness elevated however to an infinite transfiguration in contrast to the aged king subjected to an excess of misery and exposed solely as a sufferer to all that befalls him we have here a supermundane cheerfulness which descends from a divine sphere and intimates to us that in his purely passive attitude the hero attains his highest activity the influence of which extends far beyond his life while his earlier conscious musing and striving led him only to passivity thus then the legal knot of the fable of oedipus which to mortal eyes appears indissolubly entangled is slowly unravelled and the profoundest human joy comes upon us in the presence of this divine counterpart of dialectics if this explanation does justice to the poet it may still be asked whether the substance of the myth is thereby exhausted and here it turns out that the entire conception of the poet is nothing but the light picture which healing nature holds up to us after a glance into the abyss oedipus the murderer of his father the husband of his mother oedipus the interpreter of the riddle of the sphinx what does the mysterious triad of these deeds of destiny tell us there is a primitive popular belief especially in persia that a wise magian can be born only of incest which we have forthwith to interpret to ourselves with reference to the riddle solving and mother marrying oedipus to the effect that when the boundary of the present and future the rigid law of individuation and in general the intrinsic spell of nature are broken by prophetic and magical powers an extraordinary counter naturalness as in this case incest must have preceded as a cause for how else could one force nature to surrender her secrets but by victoriously opposing her that is by means of the unnatural it is this intuition which i see imprinted in the awful triad of the destiny of oedipus the very man who solves the riddle of nature that double constituted sphinx must also as the murderer of his father and husband of his mother break the holiest laws of nature indeed it seems as if the myth sought to whisper into our ears that wisdom especially dionysian wisdom is an unnatural abomination and that whoever through his knowledge plunges nature into an abyss of annihilation must also experience the dissolution of nature in himself the sharpness of wisdom turns round upon the sage wisdom is a crime against nature such terrible expressions does the myth call out to us but the hellenic poet touches like a sunbeam the sublime and formidable memnonian statue of the myth so that it suddenly begins to sound in sophoclean melodies with the glory of passivity i now contrast the glory of activity which illuminates the prometheus of aeschylus that which aeschylus the thinker had to tell us here but which as a poet he only allows us to surmise by his symbolic picture the youthful goethe succeeded in disclosing to us in the daring words of his prometheus higher zit ich forma menschen nach meinem bilde ein geschlecht das mir gleich sei zu leiden zu weinen zu genessen und, und zu frauen sich und dein nicht zu achten wie ich here sit i forming mankind in my image a race resembling me to sorrow and to weep to taste to hold to enjoy and not have need of thee 
as i man elevating himself to the rank of the titans acquires his culture by his own efforts and compels the gods to unite with him because in his self-sufficient wisdom he has their existence and their limits in his hand what is most wonderful however in this promethean form which according to its fundamental conception is the specific hymn of impiety is the profound aeschylean yearning for justice the untold sorrow of the bold single-handed being on the one hand and the divine need i the foreboding of a twilight of the gods on the other the power of these two worlds of suffering constraining to reconciliation to metaphysical oneness all this suggests most forcibly the central and main position of the aeschylean view of things which sees moira as eternal justice enthroned above gods and men in view of the astonishing boldness with which aeschylus places the olympian world on his scales of justice it must be remembered that the deep-minded greek had an immovably firm substratum of metaphysical thought in his mysteries and that all his sceptical paroxysms could be discharged upon the olympians with reference to these deities the greek artist in particular had an obscure feeling as to mutual dependency and it is just in the prometheus of aeschylus that this feeling is symbolized the titanic artist found in himself the daring belief that he could create men and at least destroy olympian deities namely by his superior wisdom for which to be sure he had to atone by eternal suffering the splendid canning of the great genius bought too cheaply even at the price of eternal suffering the stern pride of the artist this is the essence and soul of aeschylean poetry while sophocles in his oedipus preluding strikes up the victory song of the saint but even this interpretation which aeschylus has given to the myth does not fathom its astounding depth of terror the fact is rather that the artist's delight in unfolding the cheerfulness of artistic creating bidding defiance to all calamity is but a shining stellar and nebular image reflected in a black sea of sadness the tale of prometheus is an original possession of the entire aryan family of races and documentary evidence of their capacity for the profoundly tragic indeed it is not improbable that this myth has the same characteristic significance for the aryan race that the myth of the fall of man has for the semitic and that there is a relationship between the two myths like that of brother and sister the presupposition of the promethean myth is the transcendent value which a naive humanity attached to fire as the true palladium of every ascending culture that man however should dispose at will of this fire and should not receive it only as a gift from heaven as the igniting lightning or the warming solar flame appeared to the contemplative primordial men as crime and robbery of the divine nature and thus the first philosophical problem at once causes a painful irreconcilable antagonism between man and god and puts as it were a mass of rock at the gate of every culture the best and highest that men can acquire they obtain by a crime and must now in their turn take upon themselves its consequences namely the whole flood of sufferings and sorrows with which the offended celestials must visit the nobly aspiring race of man a bitter reflection which by the dignity it confers on crime contrasts strangely with the semitic myth of the fall of man in which curiosity beguilement seducibility wantonness in short a whole series of pre-eminently feminine passions were regarded as the origin of evil what distinguishes the aryan representation is the sublime view of active sin as the properly promethean virtue 
which suggests at the same time the ethical basis of pessimistic tragedy as the justification of human evil of human guilt as well as of the suffering incurred thereby the misery in the essence of things which the contemplative arian is not disposed to explain away the antagonism in the heart of the world manifests itself to him as a medley of different worlds for instance a divine and a human world each of which is in the right individually but as a separate existence alongside of another has to suffer for its individuation with the heroic effort made by the individual for universality in his attempt to pass beyond the bounds of individuation and become the one universal being he experiences in himself the primordial contradiction concealed in the essence of things that is he trespasses and suffers accordingly crime is understood by the arians to be a man sin by the semites a woman as also the original crime is committed by man the original sin by woman besides the witch's chorus says vir ne men das nicht so now mit tausend schritten max die frau doch wie sie auch sich eilen kann mit einem sprung mach der mann we do not measure with such care woman in thousand steps is there but howsoever she hasten may man in one leap has cleared the way he who understands this innermost core of the tale of prometheus namely the necessity of crime imposed on the titanically striving individual will at once be conscious of the un apollonian nature of this pessimistic representation for apollo seeks to pacify individual beings precisely by drawing boundary lines between them and by again and again calling attention thereto with his requirements of self-knowledge and due proportion as the holiest laws of the universe in order however to prevent the form from congealing to egyptian rigidity and coldness in consequence of this apollonian tendency in order to prevent the extinction of the motion of the entire lake in the effort to prescribe to the individual wave its path and compass the high tide of the dionysian tendency destroyed from time to time all the little circles in which the one-sided apollonian will sought to confine the hellenic world the suddenly swelling tide of the dionysian then takes the separate little wave mountains of individuals on its back just as the brother of prometheus the titan atlas does with the earth this titanic impulse to become as it were the atlas of all individuals and to carry them on broad shoulders higher and higher farther and farther is what the promethean and the dionysian have in common in this respect the aeschylean prometheus is a dionysian mask while in the aforementioned profound yearning for justice aeschylus betrays to the intelligent observer his paternal descent from apollo the god of individuation and of the boundaries of justice and so the double being of the aeschylean prometheus his conjoint dionysian and apollonian nature might be thus expressed in an abstract formula whatever exists is alike just and unjust and equally justified in both das ist deine welt das heißt eine welt this is thy world and what a world End of chapter nine chapter ten of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten it is an indisputable tradition that greek tragedy in its earliest form had for its theme only the sufferings of dionysus and that for some time the only stage hero therein was simply dionysus himself with the same confidence however we can maintain that not until euripides did dionysus cease to be the tragic hero and that in fact all the celebrated figures of the greek stage prometheus oedipus etc are but masks of this original hero dionysus the presence of a god 
behind all these masks is the one essential cause of the typical ideality so oft exciting wonder of these celebrated figures some one i know not whom has maintained that all individuals are comic as individuals and are consequently untragic from whence it might be inferred that the greeks in general could not endure individuals on the tragic stage and they really seem to have had these sentiments as in general it is to be observed that the platonic discrimination and valuation of the idea in contrast to the eidolon the image is deeply rooted in the hellenic being availing ourselves of plato's terminology however we should have to speak of the tragic figures of the hellenic stage somewhat as follows the one truly real dionysus appears in a multiplicity of forms in the mask of a fighting hero and entangled as it were in the net of an individual will as the visibly appearing god now talks and acts he resembles an erring striving suffering individual and that in general he appears with such epic precision and clearness is due to the dream reading apollo who reads to the chorus its dionysian state through this symbolic appearance in reality however this hero is the suffering dionysus of the mysteries a god experiencing in himself the sufferings of individuation of whom wonderful myths tell that as a boy he was dismembered by the titans and has been worshipped in this state as zagreus whereby is intimated that this dismemberment the properly dionysian suffering is like a transformation into air water earth and fire that we must therefore regard the state of individuation as the source and primal cause of all suffering as something objectionable in itself from the smile of this dionysus sprang the olympian gods from his tears sprang man in his existence as a dismembered god dionysus has the dual nature of a cruel barbarized demon and a mild pacific ruler but the hope of the epops looked for a new birth of dionysus which we have now to conceive of in anticipation as the end of individuation it was for this coming third dionysus that the stormy jubilation hymns of the epops resounded and it is only this hope that sheds a ray of joy upon the features of a world torn asunder and shattered into individuals as is symbolized in the myth by demeter sunk in eternal sadness who rejoices again only when told that she may once more give birth to dionysus in the views of things here given we already have all the elements of a profound and pessimistic contemplation of the world and along with these we have the mystery doctrine of tragedy the fundamental knowledge of the oneness of all existing things the consideration of individuation as the primal cause of evil and art as the joyous hope that the spell of individuation may be broken as the augury of a restored oneness it has already been intimated that the homeric epos is the poem of olympian culture wherewith this culture has sung its own song of triumph over the terrors of the war of the titans under the predominating influence of tragic poetry these homeric myths are now reproduced anew and show by this metempsychosis that meantime the olympian culture also has been vanquished by a still deeper view of things the haughty titan prometheus has announced to his olympian tormentor that the extremest danger will one day menace his rule unless he ally with him betimes in aeschylus we perceive the terrified zeus apprehensive of his end in alliance with the titan thus the former age of the titans is subsequently brought from tartarus once more to the light of day the philosophy of wild and naked nature beholds with the undissembled mien of truth the myths of the homeric world as they dance past they turn pale they tremble before the lightning glance of this goddess till the powerful fist of the dionysian artist forces them into the service of the new deity dionysian truth takes over the entire domain of myth as symbolism of its knowledge which it makes known partly in the public cult of tragedy and partly in the secret celebration of the dramatic mysteries always however in the old mythical garb what was the power which freed prometheus from his vultures and transformed the myth into a vehicle of dionysian wisdom it is the heraclean power of music which having reached its highest manifestness 
in tragedy can invest myths with a new and most profound significance which we have already had occasion to characterize as the most powerful faculty of music for it is the fate of every myth to insinuate itself into the narrow limits of some alleged historical reality and to be treated by some later generation as a solitary fact with historical claims and the greeks were already fairly on the way to re-stamp the whole of their mythical juvenile dream sagaciously and arbitrarily into a historico-pragmatical juvenile history for this is the manner in which religions are wont to die out when of course under the stern intelligent eyes of an orthodox dogmatism the mythical presuppositions of a religion are systematized as a completed sum of historical events and when one begins apprehensively to defend the credibility of the myth while at the same time opposing all continuation of their natural vitality and luxuriance when accordingly the feeling for myth dies out and its place is taken by the claim of religion to historical foundations this dying myth was now seized by the newborn genius of dionysian music in whose hands it bloomed once more with such colours as it had never yet displayed with a fragrance that awakened a longing anticipation of a metaphysical world after this final effulgence it collapses its leaves wither and soon the scoffing lucians of antiquity catch at the discoloured and faded flowers which the winds carry off in every direction through tragedy the myth attains its profoundest significance its most expressive form it rises once more like a wounded hero and the whole surplus of vitality together with the philosophical calmness of the dying burns in its eyes with a last powerful gleam what meanest thou o impious euripides in seeking once more to enthrall this dying one it died under thy ruthless hands and then thou madest use of counterfeit masked myth which like the ape of heracles could only trick itself out in the old finery and as myth died in thy hands so also died the genius of music though thou couldst covetously plunder all the gardens of music thou didst only realize a counterfeit masked music and because thou hast forsaken dionysus apollo hath also forsaken thee rout up all the passions from their haunts and conjure them into thy sphere sharpen and polish us sophistical dialectics for the speeches of thy heroes thy very heroes have only counterfeit masked passions and speak only counterfeit masked music End of chapter ten chapter eleven of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven greek tragedy had a fate different from that of all her older sister art she died by suicide in consequence of an irreconcilable conflict accordingly she died tragically while they all passed away very calmly and beautifully in ripe old age for if it be in accordance with a happy state of things to depart this life without a struggle leaving behind a fair posterity the closing period of these older arts exhibits such a happy state of things slowly they sink out of sight and before their dying eyes already stand their fairer progeny who impatiently lift up their heads with courageous mien the death of greek tragedy on the other hand left an immense void deeply felt everywhere even as certain greek sailors in the time of tiberius once heard upon a lonesome island the thrilling cry great pan is dead so now as it were sorrowful wailing sounded through the hellenic world tragedy is dead poetry itself has perished with her begone begone ye stunted emaciated epigenes begone to hades that ye may for once eat your fill of the crumbs of your former masters but when after all a new art blossomed forth which revered tragedy as her ancestress and mistress it was observed with horror that she did indeed bear the features of her mother but those very features the latter had exhibited in her long death struggle it was euripides who fought this death struggle of tragedy the later art is known as the new attic comedy in it the degenerate form of tragedy lived on as a monument of the most painful and violent death of tragedy proper this connection between the two serves to explain the passionate attachment to euripides evinced by the poets of the new comedy 
and hence we are no longer surprised at the wish of philemon who would have got himself hanged at once with the sole design of being able to visit euripides in the lower regions if only he could be assured generally that the deceased still had his wits but if we desire as briefly as possible and without professing to say aught exhaustive on the subject to characterize what euripides has in common with menander and philemon and what appealed to them so strongly as worthy of imitation it will suffice to say that the spectator was brought upon the stage by euripides he who has perceived the material of which the promethean tragic writers prior to euripides formed their heroes and how remote from their purpose it was to bring the true mask of reality on the stage will also know what to make of the wholly divergent tendency of euripides through him the commonplace individual forced his way from the spectators benches to the stage itself the mirror in which formerly only great and bold traits found expression now showed the painful exactness that conscientiously reproduces even the abortive lines of nature odysseus the typical hellene of the old art sank in the hands of the new poets to the figure of the Grycolus, who as the good-naturedly cunning domestic slave stands henceforth in the centre of dramatic interest what euripides takes credit for in the aristophanian frogs namely that by his household remedies he freed tragic art from its pompous corpulency is apparent above all in his tragic heroes the spectator now virtually saw and heard his double on the euripidean stage and rejoiced that he could talk so well but this joy was not all one even learned of euripides how to speak he prides himself upon this in his contest with aeschylus how the people have learned from him how to observe debate and draw conclusions according to the rules of art and with the cleverest sophistications in general it may be said that through this revolution of the popular language he made the new comedy possible for it was henceforth no longer a secret how and with what saws the commonplace could represent and express itself on the stage civic mediocrity on which euripides built all his political hopes was now suffered to speak while heretofore the demigod in tragedy and the drunken satyr or demi-man in comedy had determined the character of the language and so the aristophanian euripides prides himself on having portrayed the common familiar everyday life and dealings of the people concerning which all are qualified to pass judgment if now the entire populace philosophizes manages land and goods with unheard of circumspection and conducts lawsuits he takes all the credit to himself and glories in the splendid results of the wisdom with which he inoculated the rabble it was to a populace prepared and enlightened in this manner that the new comedy could now address itself of which euripides had become as it were the chorus master only that in this case the chorus of spectators had to be trained as soon as this chorus was trained to sing in the euripidean key there arose that chess-like variety of the drama the new comedy with its perpetual triumphs of cunning and artfulness but euripides the chorus master was praised incessantly indeed people would have killed themselves in order to learn yet more from him had they not known that tragic poets were quite as dead as tragedy but with it the hellene had surrendered the belief in his immortality not only the belief in an ideal past but also the belief in an ideal future the saying taken from the well-known epitaph as an old man frivolous and capricious applies also to aged hellenism the passing moment wit levity and caprice are its highest deities the fifth class that of the slaves now attains to power at least in sentiment and if we can still speak at all of greek cheerfulness it is the cheerfulness of the slave who has nothing of consequence to answer for 
nothing great to strive for and cannot value anything of the past or future higher than the present it was this semblance of greek cheerfulness which so revolted the deep-minded and formidable natures of the first four centuries of christianity this womanish flight from earnestness and terror this cowardly contentedness with easy pleasure was not only contemptible to them but seemed to be a specifically anti-christian sentiment and we must ascribe it to its influence that the conception of greek antiquity which lived on for centuries preserved with almost enduring persistency that peculiar hectic colour of cheerfulness as if there had never been a sixth century with its birth of tragedy its mysteries its pythagoras and heraclitus indeed as if the art-works of that great period did not at all exist which in fact each by itself can in no wise be explained as having sprung from the soil of such a decrepit and slavish love of existence and cheerfulness and point to an altogether different conception of things as their source the assertion made a moment ago that euripides introduced the spectator on the stage to qualify him the better to pass judgment on the drama will make it appear as if the old tragic art was always in a false relation to the spectator and one would be tempted to extol the radical tendency of euripides to bring about an adequate relation between artwork and public as an advance on sophocles but as things are public is merely a word and not at all a homogeneous and constant quantity why should the artist be under obligations to accommodate himself to a power whose strength is merely in numbers and if by virtue of his endowments and aspirations he feels himself superior to every one of these spectators how could he feel greater respect for the collective expression of all these subordinate capacities than for the relatively highest endowed individual spectator in truth if ever a greek artist treated his public throughout a long life with presumptuousness and self-sufficiency it was euripides who even when the masses threw themselves at his feet with sublime defiance made an open assault on his own tendency the very tendency with which he had triumphed over the masses if this genius had had the slightest reverence for the pandemonium of the public he would have broken down long before the middle of his career beneath the weighty blows of his own failures these considerations here make it obvious that our formula namely that euripides brought the spectator upon the stage in order to make him truly competent to pass judgment was but a provisional one and that we must seek for a deeper understanding of his tendency conversely it is undoubtedly well known that aeschylus and sophocles during all their lives indeed far beyond their lives enjoyed the full favour of the people and that therefore in the case of these predecessors of euripides the idea of a false relation between artwork and public was altogether excluded what was it that thus forcibly diverted this highly gifted artist so incessantly impelled to production from the path over which shone the sun of the greatest names in poetry and the cloudless heaven of popular favour what strange consideration for the spectator led him to defy the spectator how could he owing to too much respect for the public disrespect the public euripides and this is the solution of the riddle just propounded felt himself as a poet undoubtedly superior to the masses but not to two of his spectators he brought the masses upon the stage these two spectators he revered as the only competent judges and masters of his art in compliance with their directions and admonitions he transferred the entire world of sentiments passions and experiences hitherto present at every festival representation as the invisible chorus on the spectators benches into the souls of his stage heroes he yielded to their demands when he also sought for these new characters the new word and the new tone in their voices alone he heard the conclusive verdict on his work as also the cheering promise of triumph when he found himself condemned as usual by the justice of the public of these two spectators the one is euripides himself euripides as thinker not as poet it might be said of him that his unusually large fund of critical ability as in the case of lessing if it did not create at least constantly fructified a productively artistic collateral impulse with this faculty with all the clearness 
and dexterity of his critical thought euripides had sat in the theatre and striven to recognize in the masterpieces of his great predecessors as in faded paintings feature and feature line and line and here had happened to him what one initiated in the deeper arcana of aeschylean tragedy must needs have expected he observed something incommensurable in every feature and in every line a certain deceptive distinctness and at the same time an enigmatic profundity yea an infinitude of background even the clearest figure had always a comet's tail attached to it which seemed to suggest the uncertain and the inexplicable the same twilight shrouded the structure of the drama especially the significance of the chorus and how doubtful seemed the solution of the ethical problems to his mind how questionable the treatment of the myths how unequal the distribution of happiness and misfortune even in the language of the old tragedy there was much that was objectionable to him or at least enigmatical he found especially too much pomp for simple affairs too many tropes and immense things for the plainness of the characters thus he sat restlessly pondering in the theatre and as a spectator he acknowledged to himself that he did not understand his great predecessors if however he thought the understanding the root proper of all enjoyment and productivity he had to inquire and look about to see whether any one else thought as he did and also acknowledged this incommensurability but most people and among them the best individuals had only a distrustful smile for him while none could explain why the great masters were still in the right in face of his scruples and objections and in this painful condition he found that other spectator who did not comprehend and therefore did not esteem tragedy in alliance with him he could venture from amid his lonesomeness to begin the prodigious struggle against the art of aeschylus and sophocles not with polemic writings but as a dramatic poet who opposed his own conception of tragedy to the traditional one End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve before we name this other spectator let us pause here a moment in order to recall our own impression as previously described of the discordant and incommensurable elements in the nature of aeschylean tragedy let us think of our own astonishment at the chorus and the tragic hero of that type of tragedy neither of which we could reconcile with our practices any more than with tradition till we rediscovered this duplexity itself as the origin and essence of greek tragedy as the expression of two interwoven artistic impulses the apollonian and the dionysian to separate this primitive and all-powerful dionysian element from tragedy and to build up a new and purified form of tragedy on the basis of a non dionysian art morality and conception of things such is the tendency of euripides which now reveals itself to us in a clear light in a myth composed in the eve of his life euripides himself most urgently propounded to his contemporaries the question as to the value and signification of this tendency is the dionysian entitled to exist at all should it not be forcibly rooted out of the hellenic soil certainly the poet tells us if only it were possible but the god dionysus is too powerful his most intelligent adversary like pentheus in the bacchae is unwittingly enchanted by him and in this enchantment meets his fate the judgment of the two old sages cadmus and tiresias seems to be also the judgment of the aged poet that the reflection of the wisest individuals does not overthrow 
old popular traditions nor the perpetually propagating worship of dionysus that in fact it behooves us to display at least a diplomatically cautious concern in the presence of such strange forces where however it is always possible that the god may take offence at such lukewarm participation and finally change the diplomat in this case cadmus into a dragon this is what a poet tells us who opposed dionysus with heroic valour throughout a long life in order finally to wind up his career with a glorification of his adversary and with suicide like one staggering from giddiness who in order to escape the horrible vertigo he can no longer endure casts himself from a tower this tragedy the bacchae is a protest against the practicability of his own tendency alas and it has already been put into practice the surprising thing had happened when the poet recanted his tendency had already conquered dionysus had already been scared from the tragic stage and in fact by a demonic power which spoke through euripides even euripides was in a certain sense only a mask the deity that spoke through him was neither dionysus nor apollo but an altogether new-born demon called socrates this is the new antithesis the dionysian and the socratic and the artwork of greek tragedy was wrecked on it what if even euripides now seeks to comfort us by his recantation it is of no avail the most magnificent temple lies in ruins what avails the lamentation of the destroyer and his confession that it was the most beautiful of all temples and even that euripides has been changed into a dragon as a punishment by the art critics of all ages who could be content with this wretched compensation let us now approach this socratic tendency with which euripides combated and vanquished aeschylean tragedy we must now ask ourselves what could be the ulterior aim of the euripidean design which in the highest ideality of its execution would found drama exclusively on the non dionysian what other form of drama could there be if it was not to be born of the womb of music in the mysterious twilight of the dionysian only the dramatized epos in which apollonian domain of art the tragic effect is of course unattainable it does not depend on the subject matter of the events here represented indeed i venture to assert that it would have been impossible for goethe in his projected nausicaa to have rendered tragically effective the suicide of the idyllic being with which he intended to complete the fifth act so extraordinary is the power of the epic apollonian representation that it charms before our eyes the most terrible things by the joy in appearance and in redemption through appearance the poet of the dramatized epos cannot completely blend with his pictures any more than the epic rhapsodist he is still just the calm unmoved embodiment of contemplation whose wide eyes see the picture before them the actor in this dramatized epos still remains intrinsically rhapsodist the consecration of inner dreaming is on all his actions so that he is never wholly an actor how then is the euripidean play related to this ideal of the apollonian drama just as the younger rhapsodist is related to the solemn rhapsodist of the old time the former describes his own character in the platonic ion as follows when i am saying anything sad my eyes fill with tears when however what i am saying is awful and terrible then my hair stands on end through fear and my heart leaps here we no longer observe anything of the epic absorption in appearance or of the unemotional coolness of the true actor who precisely in his highest activity is holy appearance and joy in appearance euripides is the actor with leaping heart with hair standing on end as socratic thinker he designs the plan 
as passionate actor he executes it neither in the designing nor in the execution is he an artist pure and simple and so the euripidean drama is a thing both cool and fiery equally capable of freezing and burning it is impossible for it to attain the apollonian effect of the epos while on the other hand it has severed itself as much as possible from dionysian elements and now in order to act at all it requires new stimulants which can no longer lie within the sphere of the two unique art impulses the apollonian and the dionysian the stimulants are cool paradoxical thoughts in place of apollonian intuitions and fiery passions in place of dionysian ecstasies and in fact thoughts and passions very realistically copied and not at all steeped in the ether of art accordingly if we have perceived this much that euripides did not succeed in establishing the drama exclusively on the apollonian but that rather his non-dionysian inclinations deviated into a naturalistic and inartistic tendency we shall now be able to approach nearer to the character aesthetic socratism supreme law of which reads about as follows to be beautiful everything must be intelligible as the parallel to the socratic proposition only the knowing is one virtuous with this canon in his hands euripides measured all the separate elements of the drama and rectified them according to his principle the language the characters the dramaturgic structure and the choric music the poetic deficiency and retrogression which we are so often wont to impute to euripides in comparison with sophoclean tragedy is for the most part the product of this penetrating critical process this daring intelligibility the euripidean prologue may serve us as an example of the productivity of this rationalistic method nothing could be more opposed to the technique of our stage than the prologue in the drama of euripides for a single person to appear at the outset of the play telling us who he is what precedes the action what has happened thus far yea what will happen in the course of the play would be designated by a modern playwright as a wanton and unpardonable abandonment of the effect of suspense everything that is about to happen is known beforehand who then cares to wait for it actually to happen considering moreover that here there is not by any means the exciting relation of a predicting dream to a reality taking place later on euripides speculated quite differently the effect of tragedy never depended on epic suspense on the fascinating uncertainty as to what is to happen now and afterwards but rather on the great retoro lyric scenes in which the passion and dialectics of the chief hero swelled to a broad and mighty stream everything was arranged for pathos not for action and whatever was not arranged for pathos was regarded as objectionable but what interferes most with the hearer's pleasurable satisfaction in such scenes is a missing link a gap in the texture of the previous history so long as the spectator has to divine the meaning of this or that person or the presuppositions of this or that conflict of inclinations and intentions his complete absorption in the doings and sufferings of the chief persons is impossible as is likewise breathless fellow-feeling and fellow-fearing the aeschyliosophoclean tragedy employed the most ingenious devices in the first scenes to place in the hands of the spectator as if by chance all the threads requisite for understanding the whole a trade in which that noble artistry is approved which as it were masks the inevitably formal and causes it to appear as something accidental but nevertheless euripides thought he observed that during these first scenes the spectator was in a strange state of anxiety to make out the problem of the previous history so that the poetic beauties and pathos of the exposition were lost to him accordingly he placed the prologue even before the exposition and put it in the mouth of a person who could be trusted some deity had often as it were to guarantee the particulars of the tragedy to the public and remove every doubt as to the reality of the myth as in the case of descartes who could only prove the reality of the empiric world by an appeal to the truthfulness of god and his inability to utter falsehood 
euripides makes use of the same divine truthfulness once more at the close of his drama in order to ensure to the public the future of his heroes this is the task of the notorious deus ex machina between the preliminary and the additional epic spectacle there is the dramatico lyric present the drama proper thus euripides as a poet echoes above all his own conscious knowledge and it is precisely on this account that he occupies such a notable position in the history of greek art with reference to his critico productive activity he must often have felt that he ought to actualize in the drama the words at the beginning of the essay of anaxagoras in the beginning all things were mixed together then came the understanding and created order and if anaxagoras with his noose seemed like the first sober person among nothing but drunken philosophers euripides may also have conceived his relation to the other tragic poets under a similar figure as long as the sole ruler and disposer of the universe the noose was still excluded from artistic activity things were all mixed together in a chaotic primitive mess it is thus euripides was obliged to think it is thus he was obliged to condemn the drunken poets as the first sober one among them what sophocles said of aeschylus that he did what was right though unconsciously was surely not in the mind of euripides who would have admitted only thus much that aeschylus because he wrought unconsciously did what was wrong so also the divine plato speaks for the most part only ironically of the creative faculty of the poet in so far as it is not conscious insight and places it on a par with the gift of the soothsayer and dream interpreter insinuating that the poet is incapable of composing until he has become unconscious and reason has deserted him like plato euripides undertook to show to the world the reverse of the unintelligent poet his aesthetic principle that to be beautiful everything must be known is as i have said the parallel to the socratic to be good everything must be known accordingly we may regard euripides as the poet of aesthetic socratism socrates however was that second spectator who did not comprehend and therefore did not esteem the old tragedy in alliance with him euripides ventured to be the herald of a new artistic activity if then the old tragedy was here destroyed it follows that aesthetic socratism was the murderous principle but in so far as the struggle is directed against the dionysian element in the old art we recognize in socrates the opponent of dionysus the new orpheus who rebels against dionysus and although destined to be torn to pieces by the menads of the athenian court yet puts to flight the overpowerful god himself who when he fled from lycurgus the king of edenai sought refuge in the depths of the ocean namely in the mystical flood of a secret cult which gradually overspread the earth End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen that socrates stood in close relationship to euripides in the tendency of his teaching did not escape the notice of contemporaneous antiquity the most eloquent expression of this felicitous insight being the tale current in athens that socrates was accustomed to help euripides in poetizing both names were mentioned in one breath by the adherents of the good old time whenever they came to enumerating the popular agitators of the day to whose influence they attributed the fact that the old marathonian stalwart capacity of body and soul was more and more being sacrificed to a dubious enlightenment involving progressive degeneration of the physical and mental powers it is in this tone half indignantly and half contemptuously that aristophanic comedy is wont to speak of both of them to the consternation of modern men who would indeed be willing enough 
to give up euripides but cannot suppress their amazement that socrates should appear in aristophanes as the first and head sophist as the mirror and epitome of all sophistical tendencies in connection with which it offers the single consolation of putting aristophanes himself in the pillory as a rakish lying alcibiades of poetry without here defending the profound instincts of aristophanes against such attacks i shall now indicate by means of the sentiments of the time the close connection between socrates and euripides with this purpose in view it is especially to be remembered that socrates as an opponent of tragic art did not ordinarily patronize tragedy but only appeared among the spectators when a new play of euripides was performed the most noted thing however is the close juxtaposition of the two names in the delphic oracle which designated socrates as the wisest of men but at the same time decided that the second prize in the contest of wisdom was due to euripides sophocles was designated as the third in this scale of rank he who could pride himself that in comparison with aeschylus he did what was right and did it moreover because he knew what was right it is evidently just the degree of clearness of this knowledge which distinguishes these three men in common as the three knowing ones of their age the most decisive word however for this new and unprecedented esteem of knowledge and insight was spoken by socrates when he found that he was the only one who acknowledged to himself that he knew nothing while in his critical pilgrimage through athens and calling on the greatest statesmen orators poets and artists he discovered everywhere the conceit of knowledge he perceived to his astonishment that all these celebrities were without a proper and accurate insight even with regard to their own callings and practised them only by instinct only by instinct with this phrase we touch upon the heart and core of the socratic tendency socratism condemns therewith existing art as well as existing ethics wherever socratism turns its searching eyes it beholds the lack of insight and the power of illusion and from this lack infers the inner perversity and objectionableness of existing conditions from this point onwards socrates believed that he was called upon to correct existence and with an air of disregard and superiority as the precursor of an altogether different culture art and morality he enters single-handed into a world of which if we reverently touch the hem we should count it our greatest happiness here is the extraordinary hesitancy which always seizes upon us with regard to socrates and again and again invites us to ascertain the sense and purpose of this most questionable phenomenon of antiquity who is it that ventures single-handed to disown the greek character which as homer pindar and aeschylus as phidias as pericles as pythia and dionysus as the deepest abyss and the highest height is sure of our wondering admiration what demoniac power is it which would presume to spill this magic draught in the dust what demigod is it to whom the chorus of spirits of the noblest of mankind must call out ve ve du hast sie zerstört die schöne welt mit mächtiger faust sie stürzt sie woe woe thou hast it destroyed the beautiful world with powerful fist in ruin tis hurled a key to the character of socrates is presented to us by the surprising phenomenon designated as a daimonium of socrates in special circumstances when his gigantic intellect began to stagger he got a secure support 
in the utterances of a divine voice which then spake to him this voice whenever it comes always dissuades in this totally abnormal nature instinctive wisdom only appears in order to hinder the progress of conscious perception here and there while in all productive men it is instinct which is the creatively affirmative force consciousness only comporting itself critically and dissuasively with socrates it is instinct which becomes critic it is consciousness which becomes creator a perfect monstrosity per defectum and we do indeed observe here a monstrous defectus of all mystical attitude so that socrates might be designated as the specific non-mystic in whom the logical nature is developed through a superfetation to the same excess as instinctive wisdom is developed in the mystic on the other hand however the logical instinct which appeared in socrates was absolutely prohibited from turning against itself in its unchecked flow it manifests a native power such as we meet with to our shocking surprise only among the very greatest instinctive forces he who has experienced even a breath of the divine naivete and security of the socratic course of life in the platonic writings will also feel that the enormous driving wheel of logical socratism is in motion as it were behind socrates and that it must be viewed through socrates as through a shadow and that he himself had a boding of this relation is apparent from the dignified earnestness with which he everywhere and even before his judges insisted on his divine calling to refute him here was really as impossible as to approve of his instinct disintegrating influence in view of this indissoluble conflict when he had at last been brought before the forum of the greek state there was only one punishment demanded namely exile he might have been sped across the borders as something thoroughly enigmatical irrubricable and inexplicable and so posterity would have been quite unjustified in charging the athenians with a deed of ignominy but that the sentence of death and not mere exile was pronounced upon him seems to have been brought about by socrates himself with perfect knowledge of the circumstances and without the natural fear of death he met his death with the calmness with which according to the description of plato he leaves the symposium at break of day as the last of the revellers to begin a new day while the sleepy companions remain behind on the benches and the floor to dream of socrates the true eroticist the dying socrates became the new ideal of the noble greek youths an ideal they had never yet beheld and above all the typical hellenic youth plato prostrated himself before this scene with all the fervent devotion of his visionary soul End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the birth of tragedy by frederick nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen let us now imagine the one great cyclopean eye of socrates fixed on tragedy that eye in which the fine frenzy of artistic enthusiasm had never glowed let us think how it was denied to this eye to gaze with pleasure into the dionysian abysses what could it not but see in the sublime and greatly lauded tragic art as plato called it something very absurd with causes that seemed to be without effects and effects apparently without causes the whole moreover so motley and diversified that it could not but be repugnant to a thoughtful mind a dangerous incentive however 
to sensitive and irritable souls we know what was the sole kind of poetry which he comprehended the aesopian fable and he did this no doubt with that smiling complacence with which the good honest galert sings the praise of poetry in the fable of the bee and the hen du seist an mir nerzt dem der nick wiel wer stand besitzt die wahrheit durk ein bild zu sagen in me thou seest its benefit to him who hath but little wit through parables to tell the truth but then it seemed to socrates that tragic art did not even tell the truth not to mention the fact that it addresses itself to him who hath but little wit consequently not to the philosopher a twofold reason why it should be avoided like plato he reckoned it among the seductive arts which only represent the agreeable not the useful and hence he required of his disciples abstinence and strict separation from such unphilosophical allurements with such success that the youthful tragic poet plato first of all burned his poems to be able to become a scholar of socrates but where unconquerable native capacities bore up against the socratic maxims their power together with the momentum of his mighty character still sufficed to force poetry itself into new and hitherto unknown channels an instance of this is the aforesaid plato he who in the condemnation of tragedy and of art in general certainly did not fall short of the naive cynicism of his master was nevertheless constrained by sheer artistic necessity to create a form of art which is inwardly related even to the then existing forms of art which he repudiated plato's main objection to the old art that it is the imitation of a phantom and hence belongs to a sphere still lower than the empiric world could not at all apply to the new art and so we find plato endeavouring to go beyond reality and attempting to represent the idea which underlies this pseudo-reality but plato the thinker thereby arrived by a roundabout road just at the point where he had always been at home as poet and from which sophocles and all the old artists had solemnly protested against that objection if tragedy absorbed into itself all the earlier varieties of art the same could again be said in an unusual sense of platonic dialogue which engendered by a mixture of all the then existing forms and styles hovers midway between narrative lyric and drama between prose and poetry and has also thereby broken loose from the older strict law of unity of linguistic form a movement which was carried still farther by the cynic writers who in the most promiscuous style oscillating to and fro betwixt prose and metrical forms realized also the literary picture of the raving socrates whom they were wont to represent in life platonic dialogue was as it were the boat in which the shipwrecked ancient poetry saved herself together with all her children crowded into a narrow space and timidly obsequious to the one steersman socrates they now launched into a new world which never tired of looking at the fantastic spectacle of this procession in very truth plato has given to all posterity the prototype of a new form of art the prototype of the novel which must be designated as the infinitely evolved aesopian fable in which poetry holds the same rank with reference to dialectic philosophy as this same philosophy held for many centuries 
with reference to theology namely the rank of ancilla this was the new position of poetry into which plato forced it under the pressure of the demon inspired socrates here philosophic thought overgrows art and compels it to cling close to the trunk of dialectics the apollonian tendency has crystallized in the logical schematism just as something analogous in the case of euripides and moreover a translation of the dionysian into the naturalistic emotion was forced upon our attention socrates the dialectical hero in platonic drama reminds us of the kindred nature of the euripidean hero who has to defend his actions by arguments and counter-arguments and thereby so often runs the risk of forfeiting our tragic pity for who could mistake the optimistic element in the essence of dialectics which celebrates a jubilee in every conclusion and can breathe only in cool clearness and consciousness the optimistic element which having once forced its way into tragedy must gradually overgrow its dionysian regions and necessarily impel it to self-destruction even to the death leap into the bourgeois drama let us but realize the consequences of the socratic maxims virtue is knowledge man only sins from ignorance he who is virtuous is happy these three fundamental forms of optimism involve the death of tragedy for the virtuous hero must now be a dialectician there must now be a necessary visible connection between virtue and knowledge between belief and morality the transcendental justice of the plot in aeschylus is now degraded to the superficial and audacious principle of poetic justice with its usual deus ex machina how does the chorus and in general the entire dioniso musical substratum of tragedy now appear in the light of this new socrato optimistic stage world as something accidental as a readily dispensable reminiscence of the origin of tragedy while we have in fact seen that the chorus can be understood only as the cause of tragedy and of the tragic generally this perplexity with respect to the chorus first manifests itself in sophocles an important sign that the dionysian basis of tragedy already begins to disintegrate with him he no longer ventures to entrust to the chorus the main share of the effect but limits its sphere to such an extent that it now appears almost coordinate with the actors just as if it were elevated from the orchestra into the scene whereby of course its character is completely destroyed notwithstanding that aristotle countenances this very theory of the chorus this alteration of the position of the chorus which sophocles at any rate recommended by his practice and according to tradition even by a treatise is the first step towards the annihilation of the chorus the phases of which follow one another with alarming rapidity in euripides agathon and the new comedy optimistic dialectics drives music out of tragedy with the scourge of its syllogisms that is it destroys the essence of tragedy which can be explained only as a manifestation and illustration of dionysian states as the visible symbolization of music as the dream world of dionysian ecstasy if therefore we are to assume an anti-dionysian tendency operating even before socrates which received in him only an unprecedentedly grand expression we must not shrink from the question as to what a phenomenon like that of socrates indicates whom in view of the platonic dialogues we are certainly not entitled to regard 
as a purely disintegrating negative power and though there can be no doubt whatever that the most immediate effect of the socratic impulse tended to the dissolution of dionysian tragedy yet a profound experience of socrates own life compels us to ask whether there is necessarily only an antipodal relation between socratism and art and whether the birth of an artistic socrates is in general something contradictory in itself for that despotic logician had now and then the feeling of a gap or void a sentiment of semi-reproach as of a possibly neglected duty with respect to art there often came to him as he tells his friends in prison one and the same dream apparition which kept constantly repeating to him socrates practice music up to his very last days he solaces himself with the opinion that his philosophizing is the highest form of poetry and finds it hard to believe that a deity will remind him of the common popular music finally when in prison he consents to practice also this despised music in order thoroughly to unburden his conscience and in this frame of mind he composes a poem on apollo and turns a few aesopian fables into verse it was something similar to the demonian warning voice which urged him to these practices it was because of his apollonian insight that like a barbaric king he did not understand the noble image of a god and was in danger of sinning against a deity through ignorance the prompting voice of the socratic dream vision is the only sign of doubtfulness as to the limits of logical nature perhaps thus he had to ask himself what is not intelligible to me is not therefore unreasonable perhaps there is a realm of wisdom from which the logician is banished perhaps art is even a necessary correlative of and supplement to science end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen in the sense of these last portentous questions it must now be indicated how the influence of socrates extending to the present moment indeed to all futurity has spread over posterity like an ever-increasing shadow in the evening sun and how this influence again and again necessitates a regeneration of art yea of art already with metaphysical broadest and profoundest sense and its own eternity guarantees also the eternity of art before this could be perceived before the intrinsic dependence of every art on the greeks the greeks from homer to socrates was conclusively demonstrated it had to happen to us with regard to these greeks as it happened to the athenians with regard to socrates nearly every age and stage of culture has at some time or other sought with deep displeasure to free itself from the greeks because in their presence everything self-achieved sincerely admired and apparently quite original seemed all of a sudden to lose life and colour and shrink to an abortive copy even to caricature and so hardy indignation breaks forth time after time against this presumptuous little nation which dared to designate as barbaric for all time everything not native who are they one asks one's self who though they possessed only an ephemeral historical splendour ridiculously restricted institutions a dubious excellence in their customs and were even branded with ugly vices yet lay claim to the dignity and singular position among the peoples to which genius 
is entitled among the masses what a pity one has not been so fortunate as to find the cup of hemlock with which such an affair could be disposed of without ado for all the poison which envy calumny and rankling resentment engendered within themselves have not sufficed to destroy that self-sufficient grandeur and so one feels ashamed and afraid in the presence of the greeks unless one prize truth above all things and dare also to acknowledge to oneself this truth that the greeks as charioteers hold in their hands the reins of our own and of every culture but that almost always chariot and horses are of too poor material and incommensurate with the glory of their guides who then will deem it sport to run such a team into an abyss which they themselves clear with the leap of achilles in order to assign also to socrates the dignity of such a leading position it will suffice to recognize in him the type of an unheard-of form of existence the type of the theoretical man with regard to whose meaning and purpose it will be our next task to attain an insight like the artist the theorist also finds an infinite satisfaction in what is and like the former he is shielded by this satisfaction from the practical ethics of pessimism with its lynx eyes which shine only in the dark for if the artist in every unveiling of truth always cleaves with raptured eyes only to that which still remains veiled after the unveiling the theoretical man on the other hand enjoys and contents himself with the cast-off veil and finds the consummation of his pleasure in the process of a continuously successful unveiling through his own unaided efforts there would have been no science if it had only been concerned about that one naked goddess and nothing else for then its disciples would have been obliged to feel like those who propose to dig a hole straight through the earth each one of whom perceives that with the utmost lifelong exertion he is able to excavate only a very little of the enormous depth which is again filled up before his eyes by the labours of his successor so that a third man seems to do well when on his own account he selects a new spot for his attempts at tunnelling if now some one proves conclusively that the antipodal goal cannot be attained in this direct way who will still care to toil on in the old depths unless he has learned to content himself in the meantime with finding precious stones or discovering natural laws for that reason lessing the most honest theoretical man ventured to say that he cared more for the search after truth than for truth itself in saying which he revealed the fundamental secret of science to the astonishment and indeed to the vexation of scientific men well to be sure there stands alongside of this detached perception as an excess of honesty if not of presumption a profound illusion which first came to the world in the person of socrates the imperturbable belief that by means of the clue of causality thinking reaches to the deepest abysses of being and that thinking is able not only to perceive being but even to correct it this sublime metaphysical illusion is added as an instinct to science and again and again leads the latter to its limits where it must change into art which is really the end to be attained by this mechanism if we now look at socrates in the light of this thought he appears to us as the first who could not only live but what is far more also die under the guidance of this instinct of science and hence the picture of the dying socrates as the man delivered from the fear of death by knowledge and argument is the escutcheon above the entrance to science which reminds every one of its mission namely to make existence appear to be comprehensible and therefore to be justified for which purpose if arguments do not suffice myth also must be used which i just now 
designated even as the necessary consequence yea as the end of science he who once makes intelligible to himself how after the death of socrates the mystagogue of science one philosophical school succeeds another like wave upon wave how an entirely unforeshadowed universal development of the thirst for knowledge in the widest compass of the cultured world and as the specific task for every one highly gifted led science on to the high sea from which since then it has never again been able to be completely ousted how through the universality of this movement a common net of thought was first stretched over the entire globe with prospects moreover of conformity to law in an entire solar system he who realizes all this together with the amazingly high pyramid of our present-day knowledge cannot fail to see in socrates the turning point and vortex of so-called universal history for if one were to imagine the whole incalculable sum of energy which has been used up by that universal tendency employed not in the service of knowledge but for the practical that is egoistical ends of individuals and peoples then probably the instinctive love of life would be so much weakened in universal wars of destruction and incessant migrations of peoples that owing to the practice of suicide the individual would perhaps feel the last remnant of a sense of duty when like the native of the fiji islands as son he strangles his parents and as friend his friend a practical pessimism which might even give rise to a horrible ethics of general slaughter out of pity which for the rest exists and has existed wherever art in one form or another especially as science and religion has not appeared as a remedy and preventive of that pestilential breath in view of this practical pessimism socrates is the archetype of the theoretical optimist who in the above indicated belief in the fathomableness of the nature of things attributes to knowledge and perception the power of a universal medicine and sees in error and evil to penetrate into the depths of the nature of things and to separate true perception from error and illusion appeared to the socratic man the noblest and even the only truly human calling just as from the time of socrates onwards the mechanism of concepts judgments and inferences was prized above all other capacities as the highest activity and the most admirable gift of nature even the sublimest moral acts the stirrings of pity of self-sacrifice of heroism and that tranquillity of soul so difficult of attainment which the apollonian greek called saphrosyne were derived by socrates and his like-minded successors up to the present day from the dialectics of knowledge and were accordingly designated as teachable he who has experienced in himself the joy of a socratic perception and felt how it seeks to embrace in constantly widening circles the entire world of phenomena will thenceforth find no stimulus which could urge him to existence more forcible than the desire to complete that conquest and to knit the net impenetrably close to a person thus minded the platonic socrates then appears as the teacher of an entirely new form of greek cheerfulness and felicity of existence which seeks to discharge itself in actions and will find its discharge for the most part in myrudic and pedagogic influences on noble youths with a view to the ultimate production of genius but now science spurred on by its powerful illusion hastens irresistibly to its limits on which its optimism hidden in the essence of logic is wrecked for the periphery of the circle of science has an infinite number of points and while there is still no telling how this circle can ever be completely measured yet the noble and gifted man even before the middle of his career inevitably comes into contact 
with those extreme points of the periphery where he stares at the inexplicable when he here sees to his dismay how logic coils round itself at these limits and finally bites its own tail then the new form of perception discloses itself namely tragic perception which in order even to be endured requires art as a safeguard and remedy if with eyes strengthened and refreshed at the sight of the greeks we look upon the highest spheres of the world that surrounds us we behold the avidity of the insatiate optimistic knowledge of which socrates is the typical representative transformed into tragic resignation and the need of art while to be sure this same avidity in its lower stages has to exhibit itself as antagonistic to art and must especially have an inward detestation of dioniso tragic art as was exemplified in the opposition of socratism to aeschylean tragedy here then with agitated spirit we knock at the gates of the present and the future will that transforming lead to ever new configurations of genius and especially of the music practising socrates will the net of art which is spread over existence whether under the name of religion or of science be knit always more closely and delicately or is it destined to be torn to shreds under the restlessly barbaric activity and whirl which is called the present day anxious yet not disconsolate we stand aloof for a little while as the spectators who are permitted to be witnesses of these tremendous struggles and transitions alas it is the charm of these struggles that he who beholds them must also fight them End of chapter 15chapter sixteen of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter sixteen by this elaborate historical example we have endeavoured to make it clear that tragedy perishes as surely by evanescence of the spirit of music as it can be born only out of this spirit in order to qualify the singularity of this assertion and on the other hand to disclose the source of this insight of ours we must now confront with clear vision the analogous phenomena of the present time we must enter into the midst of these struggles which as i said just now are being carried on in the highest spheres of our present world between the insatiate optimistic perception and the tragic need of art in so doing i shall leave out of consideration all other antagonistic tendencies which at all times oppose art especially tragedy and which at present again extend their sway triumphantly to such an extent that of the theatrical arts only the farce and the ballet for example put forth their blossoms which perhaps not every one cares to smell intolerably rich luxuriance i will speak only of the most illustrious opposition to the tragic conception of things and by this i mean essentially optimistic science with its ancestor socrates at the head of it presently also the forces will be designated which seem to me to guarantee a rebirth of tragedy and who knows what other blessed hopes for the german genius before we plunge into the midst of these struggles let us array ourselves in the armour of our hitherto acquired knowledge in contrast to all those who are intent on deriving the arts from one exclusive principle as the necessary vital source of every work of art i keep my eyes fixed on the two artistic deities of the greeks apollo and dionysus and recognise in them the living and conspicuous representatives of two worlds of art which differ in their intrinsic essence and in their highest aims apollo stands before me as the transfiguring genius of the principium individuationis through which alone the redemption and appearance is to be truly attained while by the mystical cheer of dionysus 
the spell of individuation is broken and the way lies open to the mothers of being to the innermost heart of things this extraordinary antithesis which opens up yawningly between plastic art as the apollonian and music as the dionysian art has become manifest to only one of the great thinkers to such an extent that even without this key to the symbolism of the hellenic divinities he allowed to music a different character and origin in advance of all the other arts because unlike them it is not a copy of the phenomenon but a direct copy of the will itself and therefore represents the metaphysical of everything physical in the world the thing in itself of every phenomenon schopenhauer welt als villa und verstellung book one three ten to this most important perception of aesthetics with which taken in a serious sense aesthetics properly commences richard wagner by way of confirmation of its eternal truth affixed his seal when he asserted in his beethoven that music must be judged according to aesthetic principles quite different from those which apply to the plastic arts and not in general according to the category of beauty although an erroneous aesthetics inspired by a misled and degenerate art has by virtue of the concept of beauty prevailing in the plastic domain accustomed itself to demand of music an effect analogous to that of the works of plastic art namely the suscitating delight in beautiful forms upon perceiving this extraordinary antithesis i felt a strong inducement to approach the essence of greek tragedy and by means of it the profoundest revelation of hellenic genius for i at last thought myself to be in possession of a charm to enable me far beyond the phraseology of our usual aesthetics to represent vividly to my mind the primitive problem of tragedy whereby such an astounding insight into the hellenic character was afforded me that it necessarily seemed as if our proudly comporting classico hellenic science had thus far contrived to subsist almost exclusively on phantasmagoria and externalities perhaps we may lead up to this primitive problem with the question what aesthetic effect results when the intrinsically separate art powers the apollonian and the dionysian enter into concurrent actions or in briefer form how is music related to image and concept schopenhauer whom richard wagner with a special reference to this point accredits with an unsurpassable clearness and perspicuity of exposition expresses himself most copiously on the subject in the following passage which i shall cite here at full length welt aus villa und vorstellung book one page three hundred and nine according to all this we may regard the phenomenal world of nature and music as two different expressions of the same thing which is therefore itself the only medium of the analogy between these two expressions so that a knowledge of this medium is required in order to understand that analogy music therefore if regarded as an expression of the world is in the highest degree a universal language which is related indeed to the universality of concepts much as these are related to the particular things its universality however is by no means the empty universality of abstraction but of quite a different kind and is united with thorough and distinct definiteness in this respect it resembles geometrical figures and numbers which are the universal forms of all possible objects of experience and applicable to them all a priori and yet are not abstract but perceptible and thoroughly determinate all possible efforts excitements and manifestations of will all that goes on in the heart of man and that reason includes in the wide negative concept of feeling may be expressed by the infinite number of possible melodies but always in the universality of mere form without the material always according to the thing in itself not the phenomenon of which they reproduce the very soul and essence as it were without the body this deep relation which music bears to the true nature of all things also explains the fact that suitable music played to any scene action event or surrounding seems to disclose to us its most secret meaning and appears as the most accurate and distinct commentary upon it as also the fact that whoever gives himself up entirely to the impression of a symphony seems to see all the possible events of life in the world take place in himself nevertheless upon reflection he can find no likeness between the music and the things that pass before his mind for as we have said music is distinguished from all the other arts by the fact that it is not a copy of the phenomenon or more accurately the adequate objectivity of the will but the direct copy of the will itself and therefore represents the metaphysical of everything physical in the world 
and the thing in itself of every phenomenon we might therefore just as well call the world embodied music as embodied will and this is the reason why music makes every picture and indeed every scene of real life and of the world at once appear with higher significance all the more so to be sure in proportion as its melody is analogous to the inner spirit of the given phenomenon it rests upon this that we are able to set a poem to music as a song or a perceptible representation as a pantomime or both as an opera such particular pictures of human life set to the universal language of music are never bound to it or correspond to it with stringent necessity but stand to it only in the relation of an example chosen at will to a general concept in the determinateness of the real they represent that which music expresses in the universality of mere form for melodies are to a certain extent like general concepts an abstraction from the actual this actual world then the world of particular things affords the object of perception the special and the individual the particular case both to the universality of concepts and to the universality of the melodies but these two universalities are in a certain respect opposed to each other for the concepts contain only the forms which are first of all abstracted from perception the separated outward shell of things as it were and hence they are in the strictest sense of the term abstracta music on the other hand gives the inmost kernel which precedes all forms or the heart of things this relation may be very well expressed in the language of the schoolmen by saying the concepts are the universalia post rem but music gives the universalia anti rem and the real world in the universalia in re but that in general a relation is possible between a composition and a perceptible representation rests as we have said upon the fact that both are simply different expressions of the same inner being of the world when now in the particular case such a relation is actually given that is to say when the composer has been able to express in the universal language of music the emotions of will which constitute the heart of an event then the melody of the song the music of the opera is expressive but the analogy discovered by the composer between the two must have proceeded from the direct knowledge of the nature of the world unknown to his reason and must not be an imitation produced with conscious intention by means of conceptions otherwise the music does not express the inner nature of the will itself but merely gives an inadequate imitation of its phenomenon all specially imitative music does this we have therefore according to the doctrine of schopenhauer an immediate understanding of music as the language of the will and feel our imagination stimulated to give form to this invisible and yet so actively stirred spirit world which speaks to us and prompted to embody it in an analogous example on the other hand image and concept under the influence of a truly conformable music acquire a higher significance dionysian art therefore is wont to exercise two kinds of influences on the apollonian art faculty music firstly incites to the symbolic intuition of dionysian universality and secondly it causes the symbolic image to stand forth in its fullest significance from these facts intelligible in themselves and not inaccessible to profounder observation i infer the capacity of music to give birth to myth that is to say the most significant exemplar and precisely tragic myth the myth which speaks of dionysian knowledge and symbols in the phenomenon of the lyrist i have set forth that in him music strives to express itself with regard to its nature in apollonian images if now we reflect that music in its highest potency must seek to attain also to its highest symbolization we must deem it possible that it also knows how to find the symbolic expression of its inherent dionysian wisdom and where shall we have to seek for this expression if not in tragedy and in general in the conception of the tragic for the nature of art as it is ordinarily conceived according to the single category of appearance and beauty the tragic cannot be honestly deduced at all it is only through the spirit of music that we understand the joy in the annihilation of the individual for in the particular examples of such annihilation only is the eternal phenomenon of dionysian art made clear to us which gives expression to the will in its omnipotence as it were behind the principium individuationis the eternal life beyond all phenomena and in spite of all annihilation the metaphysical delight in the tragic is a translation of the instinctively unconscious dionysian wisdom into the language of the scene the hero the highest manifestation of the will is disavowed for our pleasure because he is only phenomenon and because the eternal life of the will is not affected by his annihilation we believe in eternal life tragedy exclaims while music is the proximate idea of this life plastic art has an altogether different object 
here apollo vanquishes the suffering of the individual by the radiant glorification of the eternity of the phenomenon here beauty triumphs over the suffering inherent in life pain is in a manner surreptitiously obliterated from the features of nature in dionysian art and its tragic symbolism the same nature speaks to us with its true undissembled voice be as i am amidst the ceaseless change of phenomena the eternally creative primordial mother eternally impelling to existence self-satisfying eternally with this change of phenomena end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen dionysian art too seeks to convince us of the eternal joy of existence only we are to seek this joy not in phenomena but behind phenomena we are to perceive how all that comes into being must be ready for a sorrowful end we are compelled to look into the terrors of individual existence yet we are not to become torpid a metaphysical comfort tears us momentarily from the bustle of the transforming figures we are really for brief moments primordial being itself and feel its indomitable desire for being and joy in existence the struggle the pain the destruction of phenomena now appear to us as something necessary considering the surplus of innumerable forms of existence which throng and push one another into life considering the exuberant fertility of the universal will we are pierced by the maddening sting of these pains at the very moment when we have become as it were one with the immeasurable primordial joy in existence and when we anticipate in dionysian ecstasy the indestructibility and eternity of this joy in spite of fear and pity we are the happy living beings not as individuals but as the one living being with whose procreative joy we are blended the history of the rise of greek tragedy now tells us with luminous precision that the tragic art of the greeks was really born of the spirit of music with which conception we believe we have done justice for the first time to the original and most astonishing significance of the chorus at the same time however we must admit that the import of tragic myth as set forth above never became transparent with sufficient lucidity to the greek poets let alone the greek philosophers their heroes speak as it were more superficially than they act the myth does not at all find its adequate objectification in the spoken word the structure of the scenes and the conspicuous images reveal a deeper wisdom than the poet himself can put into words and concepts the same being also observed in shakespeare whose hamlet for instance in an analogous manner talks more superficially than he acts so that the previously mentioned lesson of hamlet is to be gathered not from his words but from a more profound contemplation and survey of the whole with respect to greek tragedy which of course presents itself to us only as word drama i have even intimated that the incongruence between myth and expression might easily tempt us to regard it as shallower and less significant than it really is and accordingly to postulate for it a more superficial effect than it must have had according to the testimony of the ancients for how easily one forgets that what the word poet did not succeed in doing namely realizing the highest spiritualization and ideality of myth he might succeed in doing every moment as creative musician we require to be sure almost by philological method to reconstruct ourselves the ascendancy of musical influence in order to receive something of the incomparable comfort which must be characteristic of true tragedy even this 
musical ascendancy however would only have been felt by us as such had we been greeks well in the entire development of greek music as compared with the infinitely richer music known and familiar to us we imagine we hear only the youthful song of the musical genius intoned with a feeling of diffidence the greeks are as the egyptian priests say eternal children and in tragic art also they are only children who do not know what a sublime plaything has originated under their hands and is being demolished that striving of the spirit of music for symbolic and mythical manifestation which increases from the beginnings of lyric poetry to attic tragedy breaks off all of a sudden immediately after attaining luxuriant development and disappears as it were from the surface of hellenic art while the dionysian view of things born of this striving lives on in mysteries and in its strangest metamorphoses and debasements does not cease to attract earnest natures will it not one day rise again as art out of its mystic depth here the question occupies us whether the power by the counteracting influence of which tragedy perished has for all time strength enough to prevent the artistic reawaking of tragedy and of the tragic view of things if ancient tragedy was driven from its course by the dialectical desire for knowledge and the optimism of science it might be inferred that there is an eternal conflict between the theoretic and the tragic view of things and only after the spirit of science has been led to its boundaries and its claim to universal validity has been destroyed by the evidence of these boundaries can we hope for a rebirth of tragedy for which form of culture we should have to use the symbol of the music practising socrates in the sense spoken of above in this contrast i understand by the spirit of science the belief which first came to light in the person of socrates the belief in the fathomableness of nature and in knowledge as a panacea he who recalls the immediate consequences of this restlessly onward pressing spirit of science will realize at once that myth was annihilated by it and that in consequence of this annihilation poetry was driven as a homeless being from her natural ideal soil if we have rightly assigned to music the capacity to reproduce myth from itself we may in turn expect to find the spirit of science on the path where it inimically opposes this mythopoeic power of music this takes place in the development of the new attic dithyram the music of which no longer expressed the inner essence the will itself but only rendered the phenomenon insufficiently in an imitation by means of concepts from which intrinsically degenerate music the truly musical natures turned away with the same repugnance that they felt for the art-destroying tendency of socrates the unerring instinct of aristophanes surely did the proper thing when it comprised socrates himself the tragedy of euripides and the music of the new dithyrambic poets in the same feeling of hatred and perceived in all three phenomena the symptoms of a degenerate culture by this new dithyram music has in an outrageous manner been made the imitative portrait of phenomena for instance of a battle or a storm at sea and has thus of course been entirely deprived of its mythopoeic power for if it endeavours to excite our delight only by compelling us to seek external analogies between a vital or natural process and certain rhythmical figures and characteristic sounds of music if our understanding is expected to satisfy itself with the perception of these analogies we are reduced to a frame of mind in which the reception of the mythical is impossible for the myth as a unique exemplar of generality and truth towering into the infinite desires to be conspicuously perceived the truly dionysian music presents itself to us as in such a general mirror of the universal will the conspicuous event which is refracted in this mirror expands at once for our consciousness to the copy of an eternal truth 
conversely such a conspicuous event is at once divested of every mythical character by the tone painting of the new dithyram music has here become a wretched copy of the phenomenon and therefore infinitely poorer than the phenomenon itself through which poverty it still further reduces even the phenomenon for our consciousness so that now for instance a musically imitated battle of this sort exhausts itself in marches signal sounds etc and our imagination is arrested precisely by these superficialities tone painting is therefore in every respect the counterpart of true music with its mythopoeic power through it the phenomenon poor in itself is made still poorer while through an isolated dionysian music the phenomenon is evolved and expanded into a picture of the world it was an immense triumph of the non-dionysian spirit when in the development of the new dithyram it had estranged music from itself and reduced it to be the slave of phenomena euripides who albeit in a higher sense must be designated as a thoroughly unmusical nature is for this very reason a passionate adherent of the new dithyrambic music and with the liberality of a freebooter employs all its effective turns and mannerisms in another direction also we see at work the power of this undionysian myth opposing spirit when we turn our eyes to the prevalence of character representation and psychological refinement from sophocles onwards the character must no longer be expanded into an eternal type but on the contrary must operate individually through artistic bitrates and shadings through the nicest precision of all lines in such a manner that the spectator is in general no longer conscious of the myth but of the mighty nature myth and the imitative power of the artist here also we observe the victory of the phenomenon over the universal and the delight in the particular quasi anatomical preparation we actually breathe the air of a theoretical world in which scientific knowledge is valued more highly than the artistic reflection of a universal law the movement along the line of the representation of character proceeds rapidly while sophocles still delineates complete characters and employs myth for the refined development euripides already delineates only prominent individual traits of character which can express themselves in violent bursts of passion in the new attic comedy however there are only masks with one expression frivolous old men duped panders and cunning slaves in untiring repetition where now is the mythopoeic spirit of music what is still left now of music is either excitatory music or souvenir music that is either a stimulant for dull and used-up nerves or a tone painting as regards the former it hardly matters about the text set to it the heroes and choruses of euripides are already dissolute enough when once they begin to sing to what pass must things have come with his brazen successors the new undionysian spirit however manifests itself most clearly in the denouement of the new dramas in the old tragedy one could feel at the close the metaphysical comfort without which the delight in tragedy cannot be explained at all the conciliating tones from another world sound purest perhaps in the oedipus at colonus now that the genius of music has fled from tragedy tragedy is strictly speaking dead for from whence could one now draw the metaphysical comfort one sought therefore for an earthly unravelment of the tragic dissonance the hero after he had been sufficiently tortured by fate reaped a well-deserved reward through a superb marriage or divine tokens of favour the hero had turned gladiator on whom after being liberally battered about and covered with wounds freedom was occasionally bestowed the deus ex machina took the place of metaphysical comfort i will not say that the tragic view of things was everywhere completely destroyed by the intruding spirit of the undionysian we only know that it was compelled to flee from art into the underworld as it were in the degenerate form of a secret cult over the widest extent of the hellenic character however there raged the consuming blast of this spirit which manifests itself in the form of greek cheerfulness which we have already spoken of as a senile unproductive love of existence this cheerfulness 
is the counterpart of the splendid naivete of the earlier greeks which according to the characteristic indicated above must be conceived as the blossom of the apollonian culture growing out of a dark abyss as the victory which the hellenic will through its mirroring of beauty obtains over suffering and the wisdom of suffering the noblest manifestation of that other form of greek cheerfulness the alexandrine is the cheerfulness of the theoretical man it exhibits the same symptomatic characteristics as i have just inferred concerning the spirit of the undionysian it combats dionysian wisdom and art it seeks to dissolve myth it substitutes for metaphysical comfort and earthly consonance in fact a deus ex machina of its own namely the god of machines and crucibles that is the powers of the genii of nature recognized and employed in the service of higher egoism it believes in amending the world by knowledge in guiding life by science and that it can really confine the individual within a narrow sphere of solvable problems where he cheerfully says to life i desire thee it is worth while to know thee End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen it is an eternal phenomenon the avidious well can always by means of an illusion spread over things detain its creatures in life and compel them to live on one is chained by the socratic love of knowledge and the vain hope of being able thereby to heal the eternal wound of existence another is ensnared by art's seductive veil of beauty fluttering before his eyes still another by the metaphysical comfort that eternal life flows on indestructibly beneath the whirl of phenomena to say nothing of the more ordinary and almost more powerful illusions which the will has always at hand these three specimens of illusion are on the whole designed only for the more nobly endowed natures who in general feel profoundly the weight and burden of existence and must be deluded into forgetfulness of their displeasure by exquisite stimulants all that we call culture is made up of these stimulants and according to the proportion of the ingredients we have either a specially socratic or artistic or tragic culture or if historical exemplifications are wanted there is either an alexandrine or a hellenic or a buddhistic culture our whole modern world is entangled in the meshes of alexandrine culture and recognizes as its ideal the theorist equipped with the most potent means of knowledge and laboring in the service of science of whom the archetype and progenitor is socrates all our educational methods have originally this ideal in view every other form of existence must struggle onwards wearisomely beside it as something tolerated but not intended in an almost alarming manner the cultured man was here found for a long time only in the form of the scholar even our poetical arts have been forced to evolve from learned imitations and in the main effect of the rhyme we still recognize the origin of our poetic form from artistic experiments with a non-native and thoroughly learned language how unintelligible must faust the modern cultured man who is in himself intelligible have appeared to a true greek faust storming discontentedly through all the faculties devoted to magic and the devil from a desire for knowledge whom we have only to place alongside of socrates for the purpose of comparison in order to see that modern man begins to divine the boundaries of this socratic love of perception and longs for a coast in the wide waste of the ocean of knowledge when goethe on one occasion said to eckermann with reference to napoleon yes my good friend there is also a productiveness of deeds he reminded us in a charmingly naive manner that the non-theorist is something incredible and astounding to modern man so that the wisdom of goethe is needed once more in order to discover that such a surprising form of existence is comprehensible nay even pardonable 
now we must not hide from ourselves what is concealed in the heart of this socratic culture optimism deeming itself absolute well we must not be alarmed if the fruits of this optimism ripen if society leavened to the very lowest strata by this kind of culture gradually begins to tremble through wanton agitations and desires if the belief in the earthly happiness of all if the belief in the possibility of such a general intellectual culture is gradually transformed into a, the threatening demand for such an alexandrine earthly happiness into the conjuring of a euripidean deus ex machina let us mark this well the alexandrine culture requires a slave class to be able to exist permanently but in its optimistic view of life it denies the necessity of such a class and consequently when the effect of its beautifully seductive and tranquillizing utterances about the dignity of man and the dignity of labor is spent it gradually drifts towards a dreadful destination there is nothing more terrible than a barbaric slave class who have learned to regard their existence as an injustice and now prepare to take vengeance not only for themselves but for all generations in the face of such threatening storms who dares to appeal with confident spirit to our pale and exhausted religions which even in their foundations have degenerated into scholastic religions so that myth the necessary prerequisite of every religion is already paralyzed everywhere and even in this domain the optimistic spirit which we have just designated as the annihilating germ of society has attained the mastery while the evil slumbering in the heart of theoretical culture gradually begins to disquiet modern man and makes him anxiously ransack the stores of his experience for means to avert the danger though not believing very much in these means while he therefore begins to divine the consequences his position involves great universally gifted natures have contrived with an incredible amount of thought to make use of the apparatus of science itself in order to point out the limits and the relativity of knowledge generally and thus definitely to deny the claim of science to universal validity and universal ends with which demonstration the illusory notion was for the first time recognized as such which pretends with the aid of causality to be able to fathom the innermost essence of things the extraordinary courage and wisdom of kant and schopenhauer have succeeded in gaining the most difficult victory the victory over the optimism hidden in the essence of logic which optimism in turn is the basis of our culture while this optimism resting on apparently unobjectionable eterni veritatis believed in the intelligibility and solvability of all the riddles of the world and treated space-time and causality as totally unconditioned laws of the most universal validity kant on the other hand showed that these served in reality only to elevate the mere phenomenon the work of maya to the sole and highest reality putting it in place of the innermost and true essence of things thus making the actual knowledge of this essence impossible that is according to the expression of schopenhauer to lull the dreamer still more soundly asleep welt aus villa und verstellung one four ninety eight with this knowledge a culture is inaugurated which i venture to designate as a tragic culture the most important characteristic of which is that wisdom takes the place of science as the highest end wisdom which uninfluenced by the seductive distractions of the sciences turns with unmoved eye to the comprehensive view of the world and seeks to apprehend therein the eternal suffering as its own with sympathetic feelings of love let us imagine a rising generation with this undauntedness of vision with this heroic desire for the prodigious let us imagine the bold step of these dragon slayers the proud and daring spirit with which they turn their backs on all the effeminate doctrines of optimism in order to live resolutely in the whole and in the full would it not be necessary for the tragic man of this culture with his self-discipline to earnestness and terror to desire a new art the art of metaphysical comfort namely tragedy as the helena belonging to him and that he should exclaim with faust und sollt ich nicht sein zug gewalt ins leben sein dir einzigste gestalt but now that the socratic culture has been shaken from two directions and is only able to hold the sceptre of its infallibility with trembling hands 
once by the fear of its own conclusions which it at length begins to surmise and again because it is no longer convinced with its former naive trust of the eternal validity of its foundation it is a sad spectacle to behold how the dance of its thought always rushes longingly on new forms to embrace them and then shuddering lets them go of a sudden as mephistopheles does the seductive lamiae it is certainly the symptom of the breach which all are wont to speak of as the primordial suffering of modern culture that the theoretical man alarmed and dissatisfied at his own conclusions no longer dares to entrust himself to the terrible ice stream of existence he runs timidly up and down the bank he no longer wants to have anything entire with all the natural cruelty of things so thoroughly has he been spoiled by his optimistic contemplation besides he feels that a culture built up on the principles of science must perish when it begins to grow illogical that is to avoid its own conclusions our art reveals this universal trouble in vain does one seek help by imitating all the great productive periods in natures in vain does one accumulate the entire world literature around modern man for his comfort in vain does one place oneself in the midst of the art styles and artists of all ages so that one may give names to them as adam did to the beasts one still continues the eternal hungerer the critic without joy and energy the alexandrine man who is in the main a librarian and corrector of proofs and who pitiable wretch goes blind from the dust of books and printers errors End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen we cannot designate the intrinsic substance of socratic culture more distinctly than by calling it the culture of the opera for it is in this department that culture has expressed itself with special naivete concerning its aims and perceptions which is sufficiently surprising when we compare the genesis of the opera and the facts of operatic development with the eternal truths of the apollonian and dionysian i call to mind first of all the origin of the stillo rappresentativo and the recitative is it credible that this thoroughly externalized operatic music incapable of devotion could be received and cherished with enthusiastic favour as a rebirth as it were of all true music by the very age in which the ineffably sublime and sacred music of palestrina had originated and who on the other hand would think of making only the diversion craving luxuriousness of those florentine circles and the vanity of their dramatic singers responsible for the love of the opera which spread with such rapidity that in the same age even among the same people this passion for a half musical mode of speech should awaken alongside of the vaulted structure of palestrine harmonies which the entire christian middle age had been building up i can explain to myself only by a cooperating extra artistic tendency in the essence of the recitative the listener who insists on distinctly hearing the words under the music has his wishes met by the singer in that he speaks rather than sings and intensifies the pathetic expression of the words in this half song by this intensification of the pathos he facilitates the understanding of the words and surmounts the remaining half of the music the specific danger which now threatens him is that in some unguarded moment he may give undue importance to music which would forthwith result in the destruction of the pathos of the speech and the distinctness of the words while on the other hand he always feels himself impelled to musical delivery and to virtuosi exhibition of vocal talent here the poet comes to his aid who knows how to provide him with abundant opportunities for lyrical interjections repetitions of words and sentences etc at which places the singer now in the purely musical element can rest himself without minding the words 
this alternation of emotionally impressive yet only half sung speech and wholly sung interjections which is characteristic of the stila representativo this rapidly changing endeavour to operate now on the conceptual and representative faculty of the hearer now on his musical sense is something so thoroughly unnatural and withal so intrinsically contradictory both to the apollonian and dionysian artistic impulses that one has to infer an origin of the recitative foreign to all artistic instincts the recitative must be defined according to this description as the combination of epic and lyric delivery not indeed as an intrinsically stable combination which could not be attained in the case of such totally disparate elements but an entirely superficial mosaic conglutination such as is totally unprecedented in the domain of nature and experience but this was not the opinion of the inventors of the recitative they themselves in their age with them believed rather that the mystery of antique music had been solved by the stillo representativo in which as they thought the only explanation of the enormous influence of an orpheus an amphion and even of greek tragedy was to be found the new style was regarded by them as the reawakening of the most effective music the old greek music indeed with the universal and popular conception of the homeric world as the primitive world they could abandon themselves to the dream of having descended once more into the paradisiac beginnings of mankind wherein music also must needs have had the unsurpassed purity power and innocence of which the poets could give such touching accounts in their pastoral plays here we see into the internal process of development of this thoroughly modern variety of art the opera a powerful need here acquires an art but it is a need of an unesthetic kind the yearning for the idol the belief in the prehistoric existence of the artistic good man the recitative was regarded as the rediscovered language of this primitive man the opera as the recovered land of this idyllically or heroically good creature who in every action follows at the same time a natural artistic impulse who sings a little along with all he has to say in order to sing immediately with full voice on the slightest emotional excitement it is now a matter of indifference to us that the humanists of those days combated the old ecclesiastical representation of man as naturally corrupt and lost with this new created picture of the paradisaic artist so that opera may be understood as the oppositional dogma of the good man whereby however a solace was at the same time found for the pessimism to which precisely the seriously disposed men of that time were most strongly incited owing to the frightful uncertainty of all conditions of life it is enough to have perceived that the intrinsic charm and therefore the genesis of this new form of art lies in the gratification of an altogether unesthetic need in the optimistic glorification of man as such in the conception of the primitive man as the man naturally good and artistic a principle of the opera which has gradually changed into a threatening and terrible demand which in face of the socialistic movements of the present time we can no longer ignore the good primitive man wants his rights what paradisaic prospects i here place by way of parallel still another equally obvious confirmation of my view that opera is built up on the same principles as our alexandrine culture opera is the birth of the theoretical man of the critical layman not of the artist one of the most surprising facts in the whole history of art it was the demand of thoroughly unmusical hearers that the words must above all be understood so that according to them a rebirth of music is only to be expected when some mode of singing has been discovered in which the text word lords over the counterpoint as the master over the servant for the words it is argued are as much nobler than the accompanying harmonic system as the soul is nobler than the body it was in accordance with the laically unmusical crudeness of these views that the combination of music picture and expression was effected in the beginnings of the opera in the spirit of this aesthetics the first experiments were also made in the leading laic circles of florence by the poets and singers patronized there the man incapable of art creates for himself a species of art precisely because he is the inartistic man as such because he does not divine the dionysian depth of music he changes his musical taste into appreciation of the understandable word and toned rhetoric of the passions in the stillo representativo 
and into the voluptuousness of the arts of song because he is unable to behold a vision he forces the machinist and the decorative artist into his service because he cannot apprehend the true nature of the artist he conjures up the artistic primitive man to suit his taste that is the man who sings and recites verses under the influence of passion he dreams himself into a time when passion suffices to generate songs and poems as if emotion had ever been able to create anything artistic the postulate of the opera is a false belief concerning the artistic process in fact the idyllic belief that every sentient man is an artist in the sense of this belief opera is the expression of the taste of the laity in art who dictate their laws with the cheerful optimism of the theorist should we desire to unite in one the two conceptions just set forth as influential in the origin of opera it would only remain for us to speak of an idyllic tendency of the opera in which connection we may avail ourselves exclusively of the phraseology and illustration of schiller nature and the ideal he says are either objects of grief when the former is represented as lost the latter unattained or both are objects of joy and that they are represented as real the first case furnishes the elegy in its narrower signification the second the idol in its widest sense here we must at once call attention to the common characteristic of these two conceptions in operatic genesis namely that in them the ideal is not regarded as unattained or nature is lost agreeably to this sentiment there was a primitive age of man when he lay close to the heart of nature and owing to this naturalness had attained the ideal of mankind in a paradisaic goodness and artist organization from which perfect primitive man all of us were supposed to be descended whose faithful copy we were in fact still said to be only we had to cast off some few things in order to recognize ourselves once more as this primitive man on the strength of a voluntary renunciation of superfluous learnedness of superabundant culture it was to such a concord of nature and the ideal to an idyllic reality that the cultured man of the renaissance suffered himself to be led back by his operatic imitation of greek tragedy he made use of this tragedy as dante made use of virgil in order to be led up to the gates of paradise while from this point he went on without assistance and passed over from an imitation of the highest form of greek art to a restoration of all things to an imitation of man's original art world what delightfully naive hopefulness of these daring endeavours in the very heart of theoretical culture solely to be explained by the comforting belief that man in himself is the eternally virtuous hero of the opera the eternally fluting or singing shepherd who must always in the end rediscover himself as such if he has at any time really lost himself solely the fruit of the optimism which here rises like a swedishly seductive column of vapour out of the depth of the socratic conception of the world the features of the opera therefore do not by any means exhibit the elegiac sorrow of an eternal loss but rather the cheerfulness of eternal rediscovery the indolent delight in an idyllic reality which one can at least represent to oneself each moment as real and in so doing one will perhaps surmise some day that this supposed reality is nothing but a fantastically silly dawdling concerning which every one who could judge it by the terrible earnestness of true nature and compare it with the actual primitive scenes of the beginnings of mankind would have to call out with loathing away with the phantom nevertheless one would err if one thought it possible to frighten away merely by a vigorous shout such a dawdling thing as the opera as if it were a spectre he who would destroy the opera must join issue with alexandrine cheerfulness which expresses itself so naively therein concerning its favourite representation of which in fact it is the specific form of art but what is to be expected for art itself from the operation of a form of art the beginnings of which do not at all lie in the aesthetic province which has rather stolen over from a half moral sphere into the artistic domain and has been able only now and then to delude us concerning this hybrid origin but what sap is this parasitic opera concern nourished if not by that of true art must we not suppose that the highest and indeed the truly serious task of art to free the eye from its glance into the horrors of night and to deliver the subject by the healing balm of appearance from the spasms of volitional agitations will degenerate under the influence of its idyllic seductions and 
alexandrine adulation to an empty dissipating tendency to pastime what will become of the eternal truths of the dionysian and apollonian in such an amalgamation of styles as i have exhibited in the character of the stilo rapresentativo where music is regarded as the servant the text as the master where music is compared with the body the text with the soul where at best the highest aim will be the realization of a periphrastic tone painting just as formerly in the new attic dithyram where music is completely alienated from its true dignity of being the dionysian mirror of the world so that the only thing left to it is as a slave of phenomenon to imitate the formal character thereof and to excite an external pleasure in the play of lines and proportions on close observation this fatal influence of the opera on music is seen to coincide absolutely with the universal development of modern music the optimism lurking in the genesis of the opera and in the essence of culture represented thereby has with alarming rapidity succeeded in divesting music of its dioniso cosmic mission and in impressing on it a playfully formal and pleasurable character a change with which perhaps only the metamorphosis of the aeschylean man into the cheerful alexandrine man could be compared if however in the exemplification herewith indicated we have rightly associated the evanescence of the dionysian spirit with a most striking but hitherto unexplained transformation and degeneration of the hellene what hopes must revive in us when the most trustworthy auspices guarantee the reverse process the gradual awakening of the dionysian spirit in our modern world it is impossible for the divine strength of heracles to languish for ever in voluptuous bondage to omphali out of the dionysian root of the german spirit a power has arisen which has nothing in common with the primitive conditions of socratic culture and can neither be explained nor excused thereby but is rather regarded by this culture as something terribly inexplicable and overwhelmingly hostile im dash namely german music as we have to understand it especially in its vast solar orbit from bach to beethoven from beethoven to wagner what even under the most favourable circumstances can be knowledge craving socratism of our days do with this demon rising from unfathomable depths neither by means of the zigzag and arabesque work of operatic melody nor with the aid of the arithmetical counting-board of fugue and contrapuntal dialectics is the formula to be found in the trebly powerful light of which one can subdue this demon and compel it to speak what a spectacle when our aesthetes with a net of beauty peculiar to themselves now pursue and clutch at the genius of music romping about before them with incomprehensible life and in so doing display activities which are not to be judged by the standard of eternal beauty any more than by the standard of the sublime let us but observe these patrons of music as they are at close range when they call out so indefatigably beauty beauty to discover whether they have the marks of nature's darling children who are fostered and fondled in the lap of the beautiful or whether they do not rather seek a disguise for their own rudeness an aesthetical pretext for their own unemotional insipidity i am thinking here for instance of otto Jan. but let the liar and the hypocrite beware of our german music for in the midst of all our culture it is really the only genuine pure and purifying fire spirit from which and towards which as in the teaching of the great heraclitus of ephesus all things move in a double orbit all that we now call culture education civilization must appear some day before the unerring judge dionysus let us recollect furthermore how kant and schopenhauer made it possible for the spirit of german philosophy streaming from the same sources to annihilate the satisfied delight in existence of scientific socratism by the delimitation of the boundaries thereof how through this delimitation an infinitely profounder and more serious view of ethical problems and of art was inaugurated which we may unhesitatingly designate as dionysian wisdom comprised in concepts to what then does the mystery of this oneness of german music and philosophy point if not to a new form of existence concerning the substance of which we can only inform ourselves presentiently from hellenic analogies for to us who stand on the boundary line between two different forms of existence 
the hellenic prototype retains the immeasurable value that therein all these transitions and struggles are imprinted in a classically instructive form except that we as it were experience analogically in reverse order the chief epochs of the hellenic genius and seem now for instance to pass backwards from the alexandrine age to the period of tragedy at the same time we have the feeling that the birth of a tragic age betokens only a return to itself of the german spirit a blessed self-rediscovering after excessive and urgent external influences have for a long time compelled it living as it did in helpless barbaric formlessness to servitude under their form it may at last after returning to the primitive source of its being venture to stalk along boldly and freely before all nations without hugging the leading strings of a romantic civilization if only it can learn implicitly of one people the greeks of whom to learn at all is itself a high honour and a rare distinction and when did we require these highest of all teachers more than at present when we experience a rebirth of tragedy and are in danger alike of not knowing whence it comes and of being unable to make clear to ourselves whither it tends End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty it may be weighed some day before an impartial judge in what time and in what men the german spirit has thus far striven most resolutely to learn of the greeks and if we confidently assume that this unique praise must be accorded to the noblest intellectual efforts of goethe schiller and winckelmann it will certainly have to be added that since their time and subsequently to the more immediate influences of these efforts the endeavour to attain to culture and to the greeks by this path has in an incomprehensible manner grown feebler and feebler in order not to despair altogether of the german spirit must we not infer therefrom that possibly in some essential matter even these champions could not penetrate into the core of the hellenic nature and were unable to establish a permanent friendly alliance between german and greek culture so that perhaps an unconscious perception of this shortcoming might raise also in more serious minds the disheartening doubt as to whether after such predecessors they could advance still farther on this path of culture or could reach the goal at all accordingly we see the opinions concerning the value of greek contribution to culture degenerate since that time in the most alarming manner the expression of compassionate superiority may be heard in the most heterogeneous intellectual and non-intellectual camps and elsewhere a totally ineffective declamation dallies with greek harmony greek beauty greek cheerfulness and in the very circles whose dignity it might be to draw indefatigably from the greek channel for the good of german culture in the circles of the teachers in the higher educational institutions they have learned best to compromise with the greeks in good time and on easy terms to the extent often of a sceptical abandonment of the hellenic ideal and a total perversion of the true purpose of antiquarian studies if there be any one at all in these circles who has not completely exhausted himself in the endeavour to be a trustworthy corrector of old texts or a natural history microscopist of language he perhaps seeks also to appropriate grecian antiquity historically along with other antiquities and in any case according to the method and with the supercilious air of our present cultured historiography when therefore the intrinsic efficiency of the higher educational institutions has never perhaps been lower or feebler than at present when the journalist the paper slave of the day has triumphed over the academic teacher in all matters pertaining to culture and there only remains to the latter the often previously experienced metamorphosis of now fluttering also as a cheerful cultured butterfly in the idiom of the journalist with the light elegance peculiar thereto with what painful confusion must the cultured persons of a period like the present gaze at the phenomenon which can perhaps be comprehended analogically 
only by means of the profoundest principle of the hitherto unintelligible hellenic genius of the reawakening of the dionysian spirit and the rebirth of tragedy never has there been another art period in which so-called culture and true art have been so estranged and opposed as is so obviously the case at present we understand why so feeble a culture hates true art it fears destruction thereby but must not an entire domain of culture namely the socratic alexandrine have exhausted its powers after contriving to culminate in such a daintily tapering point as our present culture when it was not permitted to heroes like goethe and schiller to break open the enchanted gate which leads into the hellenic magic mountain when with their most dauntless striving they did not get beyond the longing gaze which the Girthian iphigenia cast from barbaric taurus to her home across the ocean what could the epigenes of such heroes hope for if the gate should not open to them suddenly of its own accord in an entirely different position quite overlooked in all endeavours of culture hitherto amidst the mystic tones of reawakened tragic music let no one attempt to weaken our faith in an impending rebirth of hellenic antiquity for in it alone we find our hope of a renovation and purification of the german spirit through the fire magic of music what else do we know of amidst the present desolation and languor of culture which could awaken any comforting expectation for the future we look in vain for one single vigorously branching root for a speck of fertile and healthy soil there is dust sand torpidness and languishing everywhere under such circumstances a cheerless solitary wanderer could choose for himself no better symbol than the night with death and the devil as durer has sketched him for us the mail-clad knight grim and stern of visage who is able and perturbed by his gruesome companions and yet hopelessly to pursue his terrible path with horse and hound alone our schopenhauer was such a durian knight he was destitute of all hope but he sought the truth there is not his equal but how suddenly this gloomily depicted wilderness of our exhausted culture changes when the dionysian magic touches it a hurricane seizes everything decrepit decaying collapsed and stunted wraps it whirlingly into a red cloud of dust and carries it like a vulture into the air confused thereby our glances seek for what has vanished for what they see is something risen to the golden light as from a depression so full and green so luxuriantly alive so ardently infinite tragedy sits in the midst of this exuberance of life sorrow and joy in sublime ecstasy she listens to a distant doleful song it tells of the mothers of being whose names are von villa veha madness will woe yes my friends believe with me in dionysian life and in the rebirth of tragedy the time of the socratic man is past crown yourselves with ivy take in your hands the thyrsus and do not marvel if tigers and panthers lie down fawning at your feet dare now to be tragic men for ye are to be redeemed ye are to accompany the dionysian festive procession from india to greece equip yourselves for severe conflict but believe in the wonders of your god end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one gliding back from these hortative tones into the mood which befits the contemplative man i repeat that it can only be learnt from the greeks what such a sudden and miraculous awakening of tragedy must signify for the essential basis of a people's life it is the people of the tragic mysteries who fight the battles with the persians and again the people who wage such, such wars required tragedy as a necessary healing potion who would have imagined that there was still such a uniformly powerful effusion of the simplest political sentiments the most natural domestic instincts and the primitive manly delight in strife in this very people after it had been shaken to its foundations for several generations by the most violent convulsions of the dionysian demon 
if at every considerable spreading of the dionysian commotion one always perceives that the dionysian loosing from the shackles of the individual makes itself felt first of all in an increased encroachment on the political instincts to the extent of indifference yea even hostility it is certain on the other hand that the state forming apollo is also the genius of the principium individuationis and that the state and domestic sentiment cannot live without an assertion of individual personality there is only one way from orgasm for a people the way to indian buddhism which in order to be at all endured with its longing for nothingness requires the rare ecstatic states with their elevation above space time and the individual just as these in turn demand a philosophy which teaches how to overcome the indescribable depression of the intermediate states by means of a fancy with the same necessity owing to the unconditional dominance of political impulses a people drifts into a path of extremist secularization the most magnificent but also the most terrible expression of which is the roman imperium placed between india and rome and constrained to a seductive choice the greeks succeeded in devising a classical purity still a third form of life not indeed for long private use but just on that account of immortality for it holds true in all things that those whom the gods love die young but on the other hand it holds equally true that they then live eternally with the gods one must not demand of what is most noble that it should possess the durable toughness of leather the staunch durability which for instance was inherent in the national character of the romans does not probably belong to the indispensable predicates of perfection but if we ask by what physic it was possible for the greeks in their best period notwithstanding the extraordinary strength of their dionysian and political impulses neither to exhaust themselves by ecstatic brooding nor by a consuming scramble for empire and worldly honour but to attain the splendid mixture which we find in a noble inflaming and contemplatively disposing wine we must remember the enormous power of tragedy exciting purifying and disburdening the entire life of a people the highest value of which we shall divine only when as in the case of the greeks it appears to us as the essence of all the prophylactic healing forces as the mediator arbitrating between the strongest and most inherently fateful characteristics of a people tragedy absorbs the highest musical orgasm into itself so that it absolutely brings music to perfection among the greeks as among ourselves but it then places alongside thereof tragic myth and the tragic hero who like a mighty titan takes the entire dionysian world on his shoulders and disburdens us thereof while on the other hand it is able by means of this same tragic myth in the person of the tragic hero to deliver us from the intense longing for this existence and remind us with warning hand of another existence and a higher joy for which the struggling hero prepares himself presentiently by his destruction not by his victories tragedy sets a sublime symbol namely the myth between the universal authority of its music and the receptive dionysian hearer and produces in him the illusion that music is only the most effective means for the animation of the plastic world of myth relying upon this noble illusion she can now move her limbs for the dithyrambic dance and abandon herself unhesitatingly to an orgiastic feeling of freedom in which she could not venture to indulge as music itself without this illusion the myth protects us from the music while on the other hand it alone gives the highest freedom thereto by way of return for this service music imparts to tragic myth such an impressive and convincing metaphysical significance as could never be attained by word and image without this unique aid and the tragic spectator in particular experiences thereby the sure presentiment of supreme joy to which the path through destruction and negation leads so that he thinks he hears as it were the innermost abyss of things speaking audibly to him if in these last propositions 
i have succeeded in giving perhaps only a preliminary expression intelligible to few at first to this difficult representation i must not here desist from stimulating my friends to a further attempt or cease from beseeching them to prepare themselves by a detached example of our common experience for the perception of the universal proposition in this example i must not appeal to those who make use of the pictures of the scenic processes the words and the emotions of the performers in order to approximate thereby to musical perception for none of these speak music as their mother tongue and in spite of the aids in question do not get farther than the precincts of musical perception without ever being allowed to touch its innermost shrines some of them like gervinus do not even reach the precincts by this path i have only to address myself to those who being immediately allied to music have it as it were for their mother's lap and are connected with things almost exclusively by unconscious musical relations i ask the question of these genuine musicians whether they can imagine a man capable of hearing the third act of tristan und isolde without any aid of word or scenery purely as a vast symphonic period without expiring by a spasmodic distension of all the wings of the soul a man who has thus so to speak put his ear to the heart-chamber of the cosmic will who feels the furious desire for existence issuing therefrom as a thundering stream or most gently dispersed brook into all the veins of the world would he not collapse all at once could he endure in the wretched fragile tenement of the human individual to hear the re-echo of countless cries of joy and sorrow from the vast void of cosmic night without flying irresistibly towards his primitive home at the sound of this pastoral dance song of metaphysics but if nevertheless such a work can be heard as a whole without a renunciation of individual existence if such a creation could be created without demolishing its creator where are we to get the solution of this contradiction here there interposed between our highest musical excitement and the music in question the tragic myth and the tragic hero in reality only as symbols of the most universal facts of which music alone can speak directly if however we felt as purely dionysian beings myth as a symbol would stand by us absolutely ineffective and unnoticed and would never for a moment prevent us from giving ear to the re-echo of the universalia ante rem here however the apollonian power with a view to the restoration of the well-nigh shattered individual bursts forth with the healing balm of a blissful illusion all of a sudden we imagine we see only tristan motionless with hushed voice saying to himself the old tune why does it wake me and what formerly interested us like a hollow sigh from the heart of being seems now only to tell us how waste and void is the sea and when breathless we thought to expire by a convulsive distension of all our feelings and only a slender tie bound us to our present existence we now hear and see only the hero wounded to death and still not dying with his despairing cry longing longing in dying still longing for longing not dying and if formerly after such a surplus and superabundance of consuming agonies the jubilation of the born rent our hearts almost like the very acme of agony the rejoicing curvenal now stands between us and the jubilation as such with face turned toward the ship which carries isolde however powerfully fellow-suffering encroaches upon us it nevertheless delivers us in a manner from the primordial suffering of the world just as the symbol image of the myth delivers us from the immediate perception of the highest cosmic idea just as the thought and word deliver us from the unchecked diffusion of the unconscious will the glorious apollonian illusion makes it appear as if the very realm of tones presented itself to us as a plastic cosmos as if even the fate of tristan and isolde had been merely formed and moulded therein as out of some most delicate and impressible material thus does the apollonian wrest us from dionysian universality and fills us with rapture for individuals to these it rivets our sympathetic emotion through these it satisfies the sense of beauty which longs for great and sublime forms it brings before us biographical portraits and incites us to a thoughtful apprehension of the essence of life contained therein with the immense potency of the image the concept 
the ethical teaching and the sympathetic emotion the apollonian influence uplifts man from his orgiastic self-annihilation and beguiles him concerning the universality of the dionysian process into the belief that he is seeing a detached picture of the world for instance tristan and isolde and that through music he will be enabled to see it still more clearly and intrinsically what can the healing magic of apollo not accomplish when it can even excite in us the illusion that the dionysian is actually in the service of the apollonian the effects of which it is capable of enhancing yea that music is essentially the representative art for an apollonian substance with the pre-established harmony which obtains between perfect drama and its music the drama attains the highest degree of conspicuousness such as is usually unattainable in mere spoken drama as all the animated figures of the scene in the independently evolved lines of melody simplify themselves before us to the distinctness of the catenary curve the coexistence of these lines is also audible in the harmonic change which sympathizes in a most delicate manner with the evolved process through which change the relations of things become immediately perceptible to us in a sensible and not at all abstract manner as we likewise perceive thereby that it is only in these relations that the essence of a character and of a line of melody manifests itself clearly and while music thus compels us to see more extensively and more intrinsically than usual and makes us spread out the curtain of the scene before ourselves like some delicate texture the world of the stage is as infinitely expanded for our spiritualized introspective eye as it is illumined outwardly from within how can the word poet furnish anything analogous who strives to attain this internal expansion and illumination of the visible stage world by a much more imperfect mechanism and an indirect path proceeding as he does from word and concept albeit musical tragedy likewise avails itself of the word it is at the same time able to place alongside thereof its basis and source and can make the unfolding of the word from within outwards obvious to us of the process just set forth however it could still be said as decidedly that it is only a glorious appearance namely the aforementioned apollonian illusion through the influence of which we are to be delivered from the dionysian obtrusion and excess in point of fact the relation of music to drama is precisely the reverse the music is the adequate idea of the world drama is but the reflex of this idea a detached umbrage thereof the identity between the line of melody and the lining form between the harmony and the character relations of this form is true in a sense antithetical to what one would suppose on the contemplation of musical tragedy we may agitate and enliven the form in the most conspicuous manner and enlighten it from within but it still continues merely phenomenon from which there is no bridge to lead us into the true reality into the heart of the world music however speaks out of this heart and though countless phenomena of the kind might be passing manifestations of this music they could never exhaust its essence but would always be merely its externalized copies of course as regards this intricate relation of music and drama nothing can be explained while all may be confused by the popular and thoroughly false antithesis of soul and body but the unphilosophical crudeness of this antithesis seems to have become who knows for what reasons a readily accepted article of faith with our aestheticians while they have learned nothing concerning an antithesis of phenomenon and thing in itself or perhaps for reasons equally known have not cared to learn anything thereof should it have been established by our analysis that the apollonian element in tragedy has by means of its illusion gained a complete victory over the dionysian primordial element of music and has made music itself subservient to its end namely the highest and clearest elucidation of the drama it would certainly be necessary to add the very important restriction that at the most essential point this apollonian illusion is dissolved and annihilated the drama which by the aid of music spreads out before us with such inwardly illumined distinctness in all its movements and figures that we imagine we see the texture unfolding on the loom as the shuttle flies to and fro attains as a whole an effect which transcends all apollonian artistic effects 
in the collective effect of tragedy the dionysian gets the upper hand once more tragedy ends with a sound which could never emanate from the realm of apollonian art and the apollonian illusion is thereby found to be what it is the assiduous veiling during the performance of tragedy of the intrinsically dionysian effect which however is so powerful that it finally forces the apollonian drama itself into a sphere where it begins to talk with dionysian wisdom and even denies itself and its apollonian conspicuousness thus then the intricate relation of the apollonian and the dionysian in tragedy must really be symbolized by a fraternal union of the two deities dionysus speaks the language of apollo apollo however finally speaks the language of dionysus and so the highest goal of tragedy and of art in general is attained End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two let the attentive friend picture to himself purely and simply according to his experiences the effect of a true musical tragedy i think i have so portrayed the phenomenon of this effect in both its phases that he will now be able to interpret his own experiences for he will recollect that with regard to the myth which passed before him he felt himself exalted to a kind of omniscience as if his visual faculty were no longer merely a surface faculty but capable of penetrating into the interior and as if he now saw before him with the aid of music the ebullitions of the will the conflict of motives and the swelling stream of the passions almost sensibly visible like a plenitude of actively moving lines and figures and could thereby dip into the most tender secrets of unconscious emotions while he thus becomes conscious of the highest exaltation of his instincts for conspicuousness and transfiguration he nevertheless feels with equal definiteness that this long series of apollonian artistic effects still does not generate the blissful continuance in willless contemplation which the plasticist and the epic poet that is to say the strictly apollonian artists produce in him by their artistic productions to wit the justification of the world of the individuatio attained in this contemplation which is the object and essence of apollonian art he beholds the transfigured world of the stage and nevertheless denies it he sees before him the tragic hero in epic clearness and beauty and nevertheless delights in his annihilation he comprehends the incidents of the scene in all their details and yet loves to flee into the incomprehensible he feels the actions of the hero to be justified and is nevertheless still more elated when these actions annihilate their originator he shudders at the sufferings which will befall the hero and yet anticipates therein a higher and much more overpowering joy he sees more extensively and profoundly than ever and yet wishes to be blind whence must we derive this curious internal dissension this collapse of the apollonian apex if not from the dionysian spell which though apparently stimulating the apollonian emotions to their highest pitch can nevertheless force this superabundance of apollonian power into its service tragic myth is to be understood only as a symbolization of dionysian wisdom by means of the expedients of apollonian art the mythus conducts the world of phenomena to its boundaries where it denies itself and seeks to flee back again into the bosom of the true and only reality where it then like 
isolde seems to strike up its metaphysical swan song indes vana meris avogendem schwal in der duft vellen turnenden schal indes indes veltatems vehendem all er trinken versinken un bewust herk lust in the sea of pleasures billowing roll in the ether waves knelling and toll in the world breaths wavering whole to drown in go down in lost in swoon greatest boon we thus realize to ourselves and the experiences of the truly aesthetic hearer the tragic artist himself when he proceeds like a luxuriously fertile divinity of individuation to create his figures in which sense his work can hardly be understood as an imitation of nature and when on the other hand his vast dionysian impulse then absorbs the entire world of phenomena in order to anticipate beyond it and through its annihilation the highest artistic primal joy in the bosom of the primordial unity of course our aesthetes have nothing to say about this return in fraternal union of the two art deities to the original home nor of either the apollonian or dionysian excitement of the hearer while they are indefatigable in characterizing the struggle of the hero with fate the triumph of the moral order of the world or the disburdenment of the emotions through tragedy as the properly tragic an indefatigableness which makes me think that they are perhaps not aesthetically excitable men at all but only to be regarded as moral beings when hearing tragedy never since aristotle has an explanation of the tragic effect been proposed by which an aesthetic activity of the hearer could be inferred from artistic circumstances at one time fear and pity are supposed to be forced to an alleviating discharge through the serious procedure at another time we are expected to feel elevated and inspired at the triumph of good and noble principles at the sacrifice of the hero in the interest of a moral conception of things and however certainly i believe that for countless men precisely this and only this is the effect of tragedy it as obviously follows therefrom that all these together with their interpreting aesthetes have had no experience of tragedy as the highest art the pathological discharge the catharsis of aristotle which philologists are at a loss whether to include under medicinal or moral phenomena recalls a remarkable anticipation of goethe without a lively pathological interest he says i too have never yet succeeded in elaborating a tragic situation of any kind and hence i have rather avoided than sought it can it perhaps have been still another of the merits of the ancients that the deepest pathos was with them merely aesthetic play whereas with us the truth of nature must cooperate in order to produce such a work we can now answer in the affirmative this latter profound question after our glorious experiences in which we have found to our astonishment in the case of musical tragedy itself that the deepest pathos can in reality be merely aesthetic play and therefore we are justified in believing that now for the first time the proto-phenomenon of the tragic can be portrayed with some degree of success he who now will still persist in talking only of those vicarious effects proceeding from ultra-aesthetic spheres and does not feel himself raised above the pathologically moral process may be left to despair of his aesthetic nature for which we recommend to him by way of innocent equivalent the interpretation of shakespeare after the fashion of gervinus and the diligent search for poetic justice thus with the rebirth of tragedy the aesthetic hero is also born anew in whose place in the theatre a curious quid pro quo was wont to sit with half moral and half learned pretensions the critic in his sphere hitherto everything has been artificial and merely glossed over with a semblance of life the performing artist was in fact at a loss what to do with such a critically comporting hearer and hence he as well as the dramatist or operatic composer who inspired him searched anxiously for the last remains of life in a being so pretentiously barren and incapable of enjoyment such critics however have hitherto constituted the public 
the student the schoolboy yea even the most harmless womanly creature were already unwittingly prepared by education and by journals for a similar perception of works of art the nobler natures among the artists counted upon exciting the moral religious forces in such a public and the appeal to a moral order of the world operated vicariously when in reality some powerful artistic spell should have enraptured the true hearer or again some imposing or at all events exciting tendency of the contemporary political and social world was presented by the dramatist with such vividness that the hearer could forget his critical exhaustion and abandon himself to similar emotions as in patriotic or warlike moments before the tribune of parliament or at the condemnation of crime and vice an estrangement of the true aims of art which could not but lead directly now and then to a cult of tendency but here there took place what has always taken place in the case of factitious arts an extraordinary rapid deprivation of these tendencies so that for instance the tendency to employ the theatre as a means for the moral education of the people which in schiller's time was taken seriously is already reckoned among the incredible antiquities of a surmounted culture while the critic got the upper hand in the theatre and concert hall the journalist in the school and the press in society art degenerated into a topic of conversation of the most trivial kind and aesthetic criticism was used as the cement of a vain distracted selfish and moreover piteously unoriginal sociality the significance of which is suggested by the schopenhauerian parable of the porcupine so that there has never been so much gossip about art and so little esteem for it but is it still possible to have intercourse with a man capable of conversing on beethoven or shakespeare let each answer this question according to his sentiments he will at any rate show by his answer his conception of culture provided he tries at least to answer the question and has not already grown mute with astonishment on the other hand many a one more nobly and delicately endowed by nature though he may have gradually become a critical barbarian in the manner described could tell of the unexpected as well as totally unintelligible effect which a successful performance of lohengrin for example exerted on him except that perhaps every warning and interpreting hand was lacking to guide him so that the incomprehensibly heterogeneous and altogether incomparable sensation which then affected him also remained isolated and became extinct like a mysterious star after a brief brilliancy he then divined what the aesthetic here is End of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty three he who wishes to test himself rigorously as to how he is related to the true aesthetic hearer or whether he belongs rather to the community of the socrato critical man has only to inquire sincerely concerning the sentiment with which he accepts the wonder represented on the stage whether he feels his historical sense which insists on strict psychological causality insulted by it whether with benevolent concession he as it were admits the wonder as a phenomenon intelligible to childhood but relinquished by him or whether he experiences anything else thereby for he will thus be enabled to determine how far he is on the whole capable of understanding myth that is to say the concentrated picture of the world which as a reviature of phenomena cannot dispense with wonder it is probable however that nearly every one upon close examination feels so disintegrated by the critico-historical spirit of our culture that he can only perhaps make the former existence of myth credible to himself by learned means through intermediary abstractions without myth however every culture loses its healthy creative natural power it is only a horizon encompassed with myths which rounds off to unity a social movement it is only by myth that all the powers of the imagination and of the apollonian dream are freed from their random rovings the mythical figures have to be the invisibly omnipresent genii under the care of which the young soul grows to maturity by the signs of which the man gives a meaning to his life and struggles and the state itself knows no more powerful unwritten law 
than the mythical foundation which vouches for its connection with religion and its growth from mythical ideas let us now place alongside thereof the abstract man proceeding independently of myth the abstract education the abstract usage the abstract right the abstract state let us picture to ourselves the lawless roving of the artistic imagination not bridled by any native myth let us imagine a culture which has no fixed and sacred primitive seat but is doomed to exhaust all its possibilities and has to nourish itself wretchedly from the other cultures such is the present as the result of socratism which is bent on the destruction of myth and now the mythless man remains eternally hungering among all the bygones and digs and grubs for roots though he have to dig for them even among the remotest antiquities the stupendous historical exigency of the unsatisfied modern culture the gathering around one of countless other cultures the consuming desire for knowledge what does all this point to if not to the loss of myth the loss of the mythical home the mythical source let us ask ourselves whether the feverish and so uncanny stirring of this culture is aught but the eager seizing and snatching at food of the hungerer and who would care to contribute anything more to a culture which cannot be appeased by all it devours and in contact with which the most vigorous and wholesome nourishment is wont to change into history and criticism we should also have to regard our german character with despair and sorrow if it had already become inextricably entangled in or even identical with this culture in a similar manner as we can observe it to our horror to be the case in civilized france and that which for a long time was the great advantage of france and the cause of her vast preponderance to wit this very identity of people and culture might compel us at the sight thereof to congratulate ourselves that this culture of ours which is so questionable has hitherto had nothing in common with the noble kernel of the character of our people all our hopes on the contrary stretch out longingly towards the perception that beneath this restlessly palpitating civilized life and educational convulsion there is concealed a glorious intrinsically healthy primeval power which to be sure stirs vigorously only at intervals in stupendous moments and then dreams on again in view of a future awakening it is from this abyss that the german reformation came forth in the choral hymn of which the future melody of german music first resounded so deep courageous and soul breathing so exuberantly good and tender did this chorale of luther sound as the first dionysian luring call which breaks forth from dense thickets at the approach of spring to it responded with emulative echo the solemnly wanton procession of dionysian revellers to whom we are indebted for german music and to whom we shall be indebted for the rebirth of german myth i know that i must now lead the sympathizing and attentive friend to an elevated position of lonesome contemplation where he will have but few companions and i call out encouragingly to him that we must hold fast to our shining guides the greeks for the rectification of our aesthetic knowledge we previously borrowed from them the two divine figures each of which sways a separate realm of art and concerning whose mutual contact and exaltation we have acquired a notion through greek tragedy through a remarkable disruption of both these primitive artistic impulses the ruin of greek tragedy seemed to be necessarily brought about with which process a degeneration and a transmutation of the greek national character was strictly in keeping summoning us to earnest reflection as to how closely and necessarily art and the people myth and custom tragedy and the state have coalesced in their bases the ruin of tragedy was at the same time the ruin of myth until then the greeks had been involuntarily compelled immediately to associate all experiences with their myths indeed had to comprehend them only through this association whereby even the most immediate present necessarily appeared to them sub specie eterni and in a certain sense as timeless into this current of the timeless however the state as well as art plunged in order to find repose from the burden and eagerness of the moment 
and a people for the rest also a man is worth just as much only as its ability to impress on its experiences the seal of eternity for it is thus as it were desecularized and reveals its unconscious inner conviction of the relativity of time and of the true that is the metaphysical significance of life the contrary happens when a people begins to comprehend itself historically and to demolish the mythical bulwarks around it with which there is usually connected a marked secularization a breach with the unconscious metaphysics of its earlier existence in all ethical consequences greek art and especially greek tragedy delayed above all the annihilation of myth it was necessary to annihilate these also to be able to live detached from the native soil unbridled in the wilderness of thought custom and action even in such circumstances this metaphysical impulse still endeavours to create for itself a form of apotheosis weakened no doubt in the socratism of science urging to life but on its lower stage this same impulse led only to a feverish search which gradually merged into a pandemonium of myths and superstitions accumulated from all quarters in the midst of which nevertheless the hellene sat with a yearning heart till he contrived as gricolus to mask his fever with greek cheerfulness and greek levity or to narcotize himself completely with some gloomy oriental superstition we have approached this condition in the most striking manner since the reawakening of the alexandro roman antiquity in the fifteenth century after a long not easily describable interlude on the heights there is the same exuberant love of knowledge the same insatiate happiness of the discoverer the same stupendous secularization and together with these a homeless roving about an eager intrusion at foreign tables a frivolous deification of the present or a dull senseless estrangement all subspecies psychuli of the present time which same symptoms lead one to infer the same defect at the heart of this culture the annihilation of myth it seems hardly possible to transplant a foreign myth with permanent success without dreadfully injuring the tree through this transplantation which is perhaps occasionally strong enough and sound enough to eliminate the foreign element after a terrible struggle but must ordinarily consume itself in a languishing and stunted condition or in sickly luxuriance our opinion of the pure and vigorous kernel of the german being is such that we venture to expect of it and only of it this elimination of forcibly engrafted foreign elements and we deem it possible that the german spirit will reflect anew on itself perhaps many a one will be of opinion that this spirit must begin its struggle with the elimination of the romantic element for which it might recognize an external preparation and encouragement in the victorious bravery and bloody glory of the late war but must seek the inner constraint in the emulative zeal to be for ever worthy of the sublime protagonists on this path of luther as well as our great artists and poets but let him never think he can fight such battles without his household gods without his mythical home without a restoration of all german things and if the german should look timidly around for a guide to lead him back to his long-lost home the ways and paths of which he knows no longer let him but listen to the delightfully luring call of the dionysian bird which hovers above him and would fain point out to him the way thither End of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty four among the peculiar artistic effects of musical tragedy we had to emphasize an apollonian illusion through which we are to be saved from immediate oneness with the dionysian music while our musical excitement is able to discharge itself on an apollonian domain and in an interposed visible middle world it thereby seemed to us that precisely through this discharge the middle world of theatrical procedure 
the drama generally became visible and intelligible from within in a degree unattainable in the other forms of apollonian art so that here where this art was as it were winged and borne aloft by the spirit of music we had to recognize the highest exaltation of its powers and consequently in the fraternal union of apollo and dionysus the climax of the apollonian as well as of the dionysian artistic aims of course the apollonian light picture did not precisely with this inner illumination through music attain the peculiar effect of the weaker grades of apollonian art what the epos and the animated stone can do constrain the contemplating eye to calm delight in the world of the individuatio could not be realized here notwithstanding the greater animation and distinctness we contemplated the drama and penetrated with piercing glance into its inner agitated world of motives and yet it seemed as if only a symbolic picture passed before us the profoundest significance of which we almost believed we had divined and which we desired to put aside like a curtain in order to behold the original behind it the greatest distinctness of the picture did not suffice us for it seemed to reveal as well as veil something and while it seemed with its symbolic revelation to invite the rending of the veil for the disclosure of the mysterious background this illumined all conspicuousness itself enthralled the eye and prevented it from penetrating more deeply he who has not experienced this to have to view and at the same time to have a longing beyond the viewing will hardly be able to conceive how clearly and definitely these two processes coexist in the contemplation of tragic myth and are felt to be conjoined while the truly aesthetic spectators will confirm my assertion that among the peculiar effects of tragedy this conjunction is the most noteworthy now let this phenomenon of the aesthetic spectator be transferred to an analogous process in the tragic artist and the genesis of tragic myth will have been understood it shares with the apollonian sphere of art the full delight in appearance and contemplation and at the same time it denies this delight and finds a still higher satisfaction in the annihilation of the visible world of appearance the substance of tragic myth is first of all an epic event involving the glorification of the fighting hero but whence originates the essentially enigmatical trait that the suffering and the fate of the hero the most painful victories the most agonizing contrasts of motives in short the exemplification of the wisdom of silenus or aesthetically expressed the ugly and discordant is always represented anew in such countless forms with such predilection and precisely in the most youthful and exuberant age of a people unless there is really a higher delight experienced in all this for the fact that things actually take such a tragic course would least of all explain the origin of a form of art provided that art is not merely an imitation of the reality of nature but in truth a metaphysical supplement to the reality of nature placed alongside thereof for its conquest tragic myth in so far as it really belongs to art also fully participates in this transfiguring metaphysical purpose of art in general what does it transfigure however when it presents the phenomenal world in the guise of the suffering hero least of all the reality of this phenomenal world for it says to us look at this look carefully it is your life it is the hour hand of your clock of existence and myth has displayed this life in order thereby to transfigure it to us if not how shall we account for the aesthetic pleasure with which we make even these representations pass before us i am inquiring concerning the aesthetic pleasure and am well aware that many of these representations may moreover occasionally create even a moral delectation say under the form of pity or of a moral triumph but he who would derive the effect of the tragic exclusively from these moral sources 
as was usually the case far too long in aesthetics let him not think that he has done anything for art thereby for art must above all insist on purity in her domain for the explanation of tragic myth the very first requirement is that the pleasure which characterizes it must be sought in the purely aesthetic sphere without encroaching on the domain of pity fear or the morally sublime how can the ugly and the discordant the substance of tragic myth excite an aesthetic pleasure here it is necessary to raise ourselves with a daring bound into a metaphysics of art i repeat therefore my former proposition that it is only as an aesthetic phenomenon that existence and the world appear justified and in this sense it is precisely the function of tragic myth to convince us that even the ugly and discordant is an artistic game which the will in the eternal fullness of its joy plays with itself but this not easily comprehensible proto-phenomenon of dionysian art becomes in a direct way singularly intelligible and is immediately apprehended in the wonderful significance of musical dissonance just as in general it is music alone placed in contrast to the world which can give us an idea as to what is meant by the justification of the world as an aesthetic phenomenon the joy that the tragic myth excites has the same origin as the joyful sensation of dissonance in music the dionysian with its primitive joy experienced in pain itself is the common source of music and tragic myth is it not possible that by calling to our aid the musical relation of dissonance the difficult problem of tragic effect may have meanwhile been materially facilitated for we now understand what it means to wish to view tragedy and at the same time to have a longing beyond the viewing a frame of mind which as regards the artistically employed dissonance we should simply have to characterize by saying that we desire to hear at the same time have a longing beyond the hearing that striving for the infinite the pinion flapping of longing accompanying the highest delight in the clearly perceived reality remind one that in both states we have to recognize a dionysian phenomenon which again and again reveals to us anew the playful upbuilding and demolishing of the world of individuals as the efflux of a primitive delight in like manner as when heraclitus the obscure compares the world building power to a playing child which places stones here and there and builds sandhills only to overthrow them again hence in order to form a true estimate of the dionysian capacity of a people it would seem that we must think not only of their music but just as much of their tragic myth the second witness of this capacity considering this most intimate relationship between music and myth we may now in like manner suppose that a degeneration and deprivation of the one involves a deterioration of the other if it be true at all that the weakening of the myth is generally expressive of a debilitation of the dionysian capacity concerning both however a glance at the development of the german genius should not leave us in any doubt in the opera just as in the abstract character of our mythless existence in an art sunk to pastime just as in a life guided by concepts the inartistic as well as life-consuming nature of socratic optimism had revealed itself to us yet there have been indications to console us that nevertheless in some inaccessible abyss the german spirit still rests in dreams undestroyed in glorious health profundity and dionysian strength like a knight sunk in slumber from which abyss the dionysian song rises to us to let us know that this german knight even still dreams of primitive dionysian myth in blissfully earnest visions let no one believe that the german spirit has for ever lost its mythical home when it still understands so obviously the voices of the birds which tell of that home some day it will find itself awake in all the morning freshness of a deep sleep then it will slay the dragons destroy the malignant dwarfs and waken brunhilde and wotan's spear itself will be unable to obstruct its course my friends ye who believe in dionysian music ye know also what tragedy means to us there we have tragic myth born anew from music and in this latest birth ye can hope for everything and forget what is most afflicting what is most afflicting to all of us however is the prolonged degradation in which the german genius has lived estranged from house and home in the service of malignant dwarfs 
ye understand my allusion as ye will also in conclusion understand my hopes End of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty five music and tragic myth are equally the expression of the dionysian capacity of a people and are inseparable from each other both originate in an ultra apollonian sphere of art both transfigure a region in the delightful accords of which all dissonance just like the terrible picture of the world dies charmingly away both play with the sting of displeasure trusting to their most potent magic both justify thereby the existence even of the worst world here the dionysian as compared with the apollonian exhibits itself as the eternal and original artistic force which in general calls into existence the entire world of phenomena in the midst of which a new transfiguring appearance becomes necessary in order to keep alive the animated world of individuation if we could conceive an incarnation of dissonance and what is man but that then to be able to live this dissonance would require a glorious illusion which would spread a veil of beauty over its peculiar nature this is the true function of apollo as deity of art in whose name we comprise all the countless manifestations of the fair realm of illusion which each moment render life in general worth living and make one impatient for the experience of the next moment at the same time just as much of this basis of all existence the dionysian substratum of the world is allowed to enter into the consciousness of human beings as can be surmounted again by the apollonian transfiguring power so that these two art impulses are constrained to develop their powers in strictly mutual proportion according to the law of eternal justice when the dionysian powers rise with such vehemence as we experience at present there can be no doubt that veiled in a cloud apollo has already descended to us whose grandest beautifying influences a coming generation will perhaps behold that this effect is necessary however each one would most surely perceive by intuition if once he found himself carried back even in a dream into an old hellenic existence in walking under high ionic colonnades looking upwards to a horizon defined by clear and noble lines with reflections of his transfigured form by his side in shining marble and around him solemnly marching or quietly moving men with harmoniously sounding voices and rhythmical pantomime would he not in the presence of this perpetual influx of beauty have to raise his hand to apollo and exclaim blessed race of hellenes how great dionysus must be among you when the delian god deems such charms necessary to cure you of your dithyrambic madness to one in this frame of mind however an aged athenian looking up to him with the sublime eye of aeschylus might answer say also this thou curious stranger what sufferings this people must have undergone in order to be able to become thus beautiful but now follow me to a tragic play and sacrifice with me in the temple of both the deities end of chapter twenty five end of the birth of tragedy by friedrich nietzsche translated by w a
hausmann 